Chapter 151 Terrified Rivera landed between the guards and the Alliance member party. As he silently drew his sword, his intention known with this single move, he was here to kill, and they were his prey. Fear spread through the Alliance members. Even 30 to 1 they were scared of Augustus one night. His performance on the dungeon camp was witnessed by many, as they knew his prowess was no joke. However, a bold guy from the group said, He, he is just one guy. We are 30. He is strong. However, the odds are in our favor. Another one pitched in. His real power is his NPC army. Without it, he is just a normal player. The group gained a bit of confidence. Their eyes now shifted from hunter to hunter. As they thought about facing Ridra head on. Ridra smiled slyly. Since the guys wished to fight, he would make them pay. Pay a miserable price. Ridra could have attacked the group. But being the schemer he was, he just casually strolled towards the party in slow steps. Waiting for them to make the first move. He just wanted to bait them into attacking him first. As that would make them the enemies of the church. Even if the city was currently lawless, the church retained its power and its paladins. Players still gained infamy upon attacking players and would need to get rid of the red mark before city order was restored three days later or else they would be hunted by the royal guards. And it happened they took the bait. One of the party members took the first offensive strike. He casted a basic spell. Fireball. Ridra with his insanely high stats. Dodged the attack no issue at all. However the faces of the party members turned pale following the attack. They received a system notification. System notification. You have attacked a bishop of the Church of Life. You are now enemies with the Church of Life. You will be unable to use any of its services and blessings for 60 days. You will be blacklisted by all paladins of the Church of Life. They may hunt you down and bring you to the church to repent. Should you be killed in the next 30 days, you will respawn in the dungeon of the church, where you will spend three days repenting for your crime. A panicked party member shrieked. He, 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 is a BBBB bishop in the church. How will we get rid of our red marks? If we can't use the church's services? Another member said. I died twice a day in the riots. I don't want to be imprisoned for three days. A third person said. Everyone's eyes turned fearful at the masked man. Noon could see his expression. But his cold eyes told the entire story. They felt a chill run down their spine. They were doomed. However, the initial shock turned to rage soon as they looked venomously towards Rudra. Ready to kill him. A big meathead guy shouted. You be a asterisk 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 asterisk. Dot. And charged into attack. The entire party of 30 sprung into action. If they were doomed anyways then might as well kill the schemer behind their miseries. However, to their despair, they could not even land a single scratch on Rudra. The big guy. The barbarian. With his berserk mode on was sent flying when their fists collided showing that the guy had far superior strength than even barbarians. However, not only was his strength better than the strongest in their group by a mile. Even the dives and assassins could not even hold a candle to his speed. Insane speeds that slit the necks of the assassins before they could even use their moves was a major blow to their confidence as players. With their damaged dealers being pushed around like children the support players became desperate. They tried their best to distract Ridra to create openings. However they could not. Ridra wasn't an amateur new to fighting. He knew how to focus and how to fight PD. Most attacks in his way were damaging their own members rather than landing on him. Such was his battle prowess as within three short minutes all 30 members had been sent to the dungeons in the church. Effectively rendering them out of action for three days. Unbeknownst to Ridra a certain streamer had been recording his fight. A certain streamer, who had came to light just recently with, the fall of Demolition Boys. Yes, Duty Pie was at the scene. Everything from his entrance from the rooftop, to him killing an entire party without uttering a single word. Everything was streamed and watched by millions. As the legend of the Mass True Elite began to spread, his insane skill and cold attitude got him the name the Mass Devil. Pink Lotus received a report that 15 party members patrolling Sector 7 were now held captive in a dungeon. As she was shocked to see that an elite was the reason behind all this. She felt that an unspoken understanding had been broken between her and Ridra as his guild member acted so hostile towards her guild members. She did not realize the reason behind his actions, as the stream only started after he jumped down from the terrace, not capturing the part where the members talk about raiding the elite lifestyle store. Hence she felt that it was murder in cold blood. She was currently very busy with the riots, hence took no action. However this incident had been etched inside her mind, and revenge would come in time. The other guilds fared even worse as over the next two days, the masked devil kept appearing at riot locations and kept targeting alliance members. Close to 7,000 alliance members had been slaughtered under his blade. Close to 5,000 of them were currently imprisoned. 
although the number was not huge considering the huge size of the alliance. However, it had a huge effect on morale. Nobody was willing to go out to control the riots, when a crazy masked man kept dropping out of nowhere to reap their lives. The alliance members had already lost over three levels average per player in the last three days, with many losing over five? Hence the overall mood was quite depressing. But hell was about to break loose, soon. Forward slash forward slash forward slash, if you are reading this novel on any site other than web novel you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. Read from the original platform. Where you can find even more chapters. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 152 Situation Getting Out of Hand. Hazel Roof Kingdom. Purple Haze City. The city was in chaos. If viewed from a high point. Or a tower. One could see various fires burning over the cityscape. Smoke rise from burnt government buildings as the streets were stained with blood. It was a cruel sight to watch that could wrench the heart of those who were weak-willed. The inner district had regained order as the royal guards had slaughtered their way to the inner city walls. Order was restored inside the inner city as a martial law was announced for the residents of inner district. Naturally, the law did not apply to Rudra, who was a duke of the kingdom and a bishop of the church. He waltzed in and out of the inner district as if it was his backyard. As the guards bowed in respect, a major event had occurred as a result of his actions in killing Alliance members. There was a rebellion inside the guild as members refused to go on patrol duty. The Alliance was losing 100k gold an hour on compensations. Over the last 72 hours, the guild had expended over 72 million gold just in compensations alone. And they were tight on cash now. The Alliance declared a shortage of funds and reduced the compensation from 5 greater than 2 gold per death in duty. This was the last straw that made the common members pull out of the missions. Why should they lose levels, time, and equipment in controlling riots? What for? Two gold? Hell no! The already low morale made the rebellion gain momentum, as more and more members abandoned their posts and patrol duties. A rebellion party was formed that demanded that if the guild wanted them to work again, that needed to accede to three conditions. One, six gold compensations per death. Two, the alliance deals with the masked devil. 3. The guild pays for repairing equipment. A sudden pullout of nearly 70,000 guild members caused the others to be overwhelmed and slaughtered, as 11 out of the 18 sectors being monitored by the Alliance spiraled out of control. The Alliance faced a major crisis at hand. As an emergency meeting was called up to discuss the issue. Alliance meeting. Azure Lotus Guild Headquarters. The six Alliance leaders had grim faces sitting in the meeting. Emperor Amon was furious at their incompetency, as he gave them an ultimatum of 24 hours to regain control as after that he would rowl out the royal guards to regain control of the capital. The emperor clearly stated that unless they regain control of the 11 sectors, they could absolutely forget about the rewards. They will even make an enemy they could not afford. The emperor's cold verdict scared them, as the revised quest was brutal. They had to make tough choices here and now. Stupid. Stupid rebels. How dare they disobey our commands. They are pawns in our hands. How dare they show resistance. If we tell them to die, they die. What's this nonsense about compensations? Scorpio seethed. You aside as she said. That's not how it works. Guild leader Scorpio and you know it. We have each invested close to 12 million gold into this project. Should we fail now then the gold and the sacrifices of the guild members will all go down the drain. Every guild leader cursed under their breath. The situation was truly bad. They had burned a hole through their finances to hold the fort for three days. But with the rebellion their efforts went down the drain as regaining control over the 11 sectors. Now was a Herculean task. Real Manchester Guild leader spoke. Even if we for a moment decide to accede to their demand number one and three about the monetary compensations and the equipment repairs, how are we going to deal with the mass devil? Everyone cursed. Scorpio was very vocal about the issue as he said. The foo asterisk 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 true elites. Always being a thorn by our side. I swear I will crush the guild into obliteration soon. The members see that but the reality of the situation was, Rudra was too strong for them, and they were not his match. He randomly came, he slaughtered and he left. There was no tracking his moments. There was just praying that he didn't show up. They had no way of dealing with the masked devil. Pink Lotus said, him being a bishop of the church, makes him a difficult target to take on. Honestly, I don't even know how he became a bishop. Well, the paladins won't even give me a second glance at the church, much less a quest to get inside their good books. Becoming a bishop is not something I can even imagine. The curses in the guild hall became even louder. The guild leader of true Manchester said, It's not that he is just the bishop. He is also a very high-ranking nobility according to our research. Having a huge NPC army to call upon. 
He is the most troublesome elite I have seen yet. Even more than their monstrous leader Shikumi. Everyone sighed as they brainstormed ideas to deal with the troublesome man. Finally, they came up with a childish provocation tactic to tackle the issue. The Alliance issued a statement that they accept the rebellion's requests. This cheered many rebels up. Their rebellion was a success. They were ready to keep their words and spring back into action for the guild. To the issue of the masked devil, the Alliance issued an official statement saying, to the coward who hides behind a mask and attacks distracted patrollers. If you are a man, the Alliance challenges you to fight one versus one with their finest experts. Six fights. One champion from each guild. In the outer district in an empty open ground. Coordinates. 1 2.3 in six hours time. Come if you dare. This open challenge was posted on the forums and instantly became viral. It was the most shared post and became the top post within 10 minutes. Every adventurer inside the Purple Haze City felt exited at the prospect of this fight. As the forums went ballistic on speculation. Will he be there? Does he dare accept? What shall the masked devil do? Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching the power stone target. Keep up the good work. Two chapters back to back within one hour. You guys in for a treat today, or what? Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 153 challenge accepted. Rudra naturally saw the open challenge as messages from guild members flooded his inbox. Although nobody in the guild knew his dual identity as Augustus one night. He was the only person in contact with the man. Hence, he was messaged about the situation. The messages varied from Guild Leader The Alliance just challenged one of our own to Karna's message of Guild Master The clowns are provoking our patience. Please give permission to put them in their place. Rudra was shocked when he read Karna's message and secretly very very glad as this was exactly the attitude he wanted in the Vice Guild Master of the Elites. Cole Arrogant and a shield for the Guild. Rudra was conflicted for the first time on whether or not he should actually let Karna take lead on this one. Rudra was naturally confident in his skills as he thought nothing of the six alliance experts. He would V naturally settle the matter himself. However, after seeing Karna's attitude, he wondered if it was okay to let him take the lead on this incident. After much deliberation, he decided that instead of going to the challenge arena alone, he would bring Karna alongside himself. Taking both of them there, Rudra from Augustus one night's account posted the reply. He'll be there on the forums, and from his original account Shikuni, replied to Karna, accompany Augustus to the arena, meet him outside the guild headquarters in 30 minutes. With this the challenge was set in stone, only a matter of time before the clash occurred. Real world, the Grey International Tower, the upside, Ethan Grey had finally formulated the ultimate opportunistic plan to deal a heavy blow to the Ambani Corporation. After days of careful planning, he saw a big opening that he could exploit to drive the Embani Corporation out of business. After the series of firings that took place using the twins, there were many top performing workers who knew company secrets that were left jobless. Ethan Gray swooped in as a vulture as he recruited a few special ones and learned a lot of insider information regarding the Embani Corporation. The Embani Corporation's backbone was its oil company Embani Oil. That was the soul of the company. The millions of liters of oil pumped daily from their oil extraction sites inside the ocean off the coast of Country X was the most important source of capital for the company. The liquid gold that the Ambani sold at a sky-high price was the highest revenue generator for the corporation for the last 40 years. In 2091 when the world exhausted its resources, the Ambani Corporation declared them celebs to have enough petroleum to supply for next 20 years. This was the major turning point of the company, as in the company's history, as the next five years changed everything. Having the only oil monopoly in the world the Ambani's charged and increased the rates of petrol however they wished to. Facing no competition. They flourished in the market making Ambani a trillionaire in the first five years. Five years later now however all was not as it seemed. On paper it seemed like the Ambani Corporation had enough petroleum to last another 10 years. However the internal situation was such that the oil would run out within a year. The Ambani Corporation miscalculated the consumption. As the demand far exceeded their calculations having them run out in half the estimated time. And Bonnie had tried to renew his insurance of the plant in 2100. After it expired, however the insurance company needed to verify the oil quantities and look at the inside books to grant the insurance. And Bonnie could not let it happen, as it would lead to his biggest secret being revealed. Hence his insurance had expired just recently, and soon the oil reserve would end out. Ethan licked his lips at the opportunity. He did not wish to wait for a year knowing for sure from the poached talent that there was no insurance in place. He would now directly blow up the entire plant. 
and after Ambani's lose their central revenue stream. And there is market panic as their shares lose value. He would continue an even bigger string of firings using the twins and sell a few key company properties. Finally, to deliver the nail on the coffin, he would dumb the 20% market share that the twins held over a single day, pushing the investor panic to the maximum and sending the company's stock crashing into freefall. To stop such an event from happening, and Bonnie would surely try and buy the 20% shares that the twins dumped at market price, which would lead to him sending trillions of dollars of liquid money to stabilize the company without the main revenue stream and deprive the trillions in cash and key employees. The company would face an all-time high calamity. Then Ethan would take his time to piece BTP suppress and Bonnie into selling little chunks of his business. Until he was left a beggar, Ethan made his mind clear. It was time to blow up the petroleum mine in the ocean. In an open plot in the outer district. The challenge location. A crowd of nearly 80. 000 players had gathered at the coordinates of the open challenge. As Augustus one night, and Carnell Waltz passed the group in their majestic black true elites robes and THR signature gray wolf mounts. The crowd parted to make way for them. Everyone looked in awe and respect at the passing duo. As chants of the masked devil rained from the crowd. With the occasional chant of Karna I love you. From some female adventurer who supposedly had a crush on Karna. However otherwise the atmosphere was serious and energetic. As at the center were the six guild leaders of the alliance. Standing with about 500 guild members and the six champions from their guilds. Seeing the masked devil, many alliance members' eyes turned bloodshot, and many's cowered in fear. Scorpio was the former, as he glared at Rudra saying, You actually dared to come! Indeed a madman! Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus for reaching 1,100 golden tickets. Thank you for the overwhelming support. Third for the day. Hope you guys enjoy it. Also a big thank you. We have reached 5,000 privilege unlocks this month so far. And it has been a gratifying experience for me. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 154 Fake Experts. There were noises everywhere. It was after all an uncontrolled environment. Scorpio's declaration made everyone talk in murmurs. While Rudra just remained there without making a single sound. Karna however frowned at the situation. There were way too many alliance members on the location. For the fight to be carried on without outside interference. The alliance could cheat in virtually any match without qualms having 500 members to cover for it. However, Rudra was unfazed. The six experts in front of him were all level 45 and tier 1. From their attitude and posture, Rudra knew they were raised in a sheltered environment as they showed no fear facing him. But when it came to real skill, Rudra did not know the faces of a single one of them in his past life. Hence he knew none of them were one of the true experts in the game, not reaching the level to threaten him at all. Rudra said coldly, Let's get this over with. It's boring to have one-on-one -on -one with the six of you. It's better that you all come at once and be done with it. I have much more productive use of my time than fighting newbies like you. Rudra's provocation caused. Oh. In the crowd as people got even more hyped at the challenge. What arrogance from the masked devil. As he stepped forward, Rudra was quite confident in his skills as he had twice the elite player stats. Coupled with his equipment and newfound skills, fighting these kids would be a piece of cake. Player name. Shakuni slash Augustus one night. Title, Viscount of Hazel Groove Kingdom. Reputable knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered medicine master. Honorary bishop of the Church of Life. World renowned. Hero of Augustus one night. Limit breaker. Class knight. Subclass, explosion artist. LVL, 46. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 286 plus 143 vit. 286 plus 143. Int. 286 plus 143 STA. 286 plus 143. PHY. 286 plus 143 HP. 35,000 slash 35,000. Unassigned stat points shot. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy. Invalid. Status. Healthy. Equipment. Pirate armor set. LV40. Lich's ring. Concealer mask, not equipped. Retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword. Common bow. Quiver of arrows. Excalibur, sword, replica. Elven, sword, semi-legendary. Skills, darkness bind. Summon knight Durahel. Wind slash. Critical absorb. Berserk. Darkness blast. Death slash. Eyes of truth. Earthquake. Critical block. Blink. Stormbringer. Class-specific skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, 
Golden Ratio. Mount, Gray Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 53-200. With his recent outgoings and the Tear of Life. Increasing his already massive stats advantage even further. The Alliance leaders all looked at each other. It was true that they had more chances to beat the guy 6 on 1 than 1 on 1. However, should they still lose? Won't they lose even more face than losing 1 on 1 fights? However, after much discussion, they decided to agree to Ridra's challenge. Real Manchester Guild leader said, You want to fight us all 6 on 1? Fine. You will be dead before you can even beg for mercy. The 6 champions stepped forward, all having confident and vicious looks in their eyes. 5 of the 6 were assaulters while 1 was an assassin. Ridra chuckled at the choice of the champions. The clear lack of ranged classes could be seen. It was a good decision for a one-on-one -on -one fight. However, in a six-on-one -on -one fight, a balanced party wolf caused him more troubles. Not that it really mattered, however. As as soon as the signal to start the match was given, Ridra sprung into action. Before the assassin could even properly react to Ridra's blinding speed and raise his dagger to meet the incoming sword strike, Ridra feigned the attack as he rolled through and slashed a nearby assaulter's neck. 17. 000 critical hit. The adventurer was dead. Within 30 seconds of the match starting a member of the alliance, was dead. And it only got worse. The assassin who was bypassed suddenly regained his senses after the initial shock as he activated his movement skills and attacked Ridra's exposed back. However, at the last possible second Ridra sidestepped and circled behind him. His sword piercing his lungs clean as it went through him. Splat. 15. 000 critical hit. Blood fell as another alliance champion died. One minute into the challenge, and two-sixths of the champions were dead. It was absolutely shocking. Even the remaining four adventures became on guard. They were absolutely in shock by the display of skills by the masked man. They started getting self-doubts as to whether or not they could face this titan. As they had been undefeated in training up to this point, and were rightfully a part of one of the strongest, if not the strongest members inside the guild, the four made a diamond defensive formation, as the four covered 90 degrees of angle to form an impregnable circle. Ridra laughed at the foolish attempt to defend. As he leisurely swung his sword in the air before using Blink, disappearing from sight Ridra reappeared to the center of their little formation. As he patted one adventurer on the back, for him to frenzily turn back and swing his sword, Ridra ducked the incoming strike and countered with one of his own. As his sword went straight through the other man's lower jaw out through his skull. 19. 000 critical hit. A third champion died. The initial party of six was reduced to three as panicked expressions could be seen on the faces of both the alliance champions and their respective guild masters. The alliance leaders knew at this point that dragging the match any longer was pointless as they signaled their members to cause mayhem to dispel the challenge. The 500 alliance members suddenly made a ruckus as they shouted insults at Rudra and then suddenly about a group of 20 members charged at him, disregarding his ongoing duel. Karna swiftly took action, meeting the party head on. However, the floodgates had been opened, and all hell broke loose, as the remaining Alliance members also joined the fray to fight. Rudra and Karna suddenly felt a tremendous increase in fighting difficulty, after being outnumbered by hundreds. The challenge was over. There was never a winner per se. However, the thousands in attendance were witness, that the Alliance champions were nothing but toys in front of the elites. However, the crowd was even more interested in seeing how the elites struggled before eventually dying in front of the hundreds of Alliance members pressing on them. However, many solo adventurers, who had qualms with the Alliance also joined the fry. And all hell broke loose a little while later, as the playground turned into a battleground of thousands of people, where everyone you did not know was an enemy. A certain streamer had been streaming the entire event, and the world got an impression that the Hazelroof Kingdom was simply insane. And from insane, they meant insanely entertaining. Where else would you see such madness of thousands of people fighting with no apparent signs or cause? Forward slash forward slash forward slash sorry for the late chapter. Hope you all enjoy. War bells are ringing with full force. War arc soon. We are close to the next PS target. Hopefully we reach it before the week resets today. For one bonus chapter. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 155 start of the end. The forums were ablaze following the events inside the open challenge that the Alliance set up. The Alliance had became a global joke as their champions were not even dirt compared to the masked devil. Who slaughtered three of them despite being outnumbered six colon one. And would have killed the other three too had the shameless guild members not interfered. Their actions on interfering in the challenge had them labeled as cowards and despicable cheaters, who could not hold a candle to the elites, who were now deemed as the number one guild in Purple Haze City. Omega had become such a hot game in the world currently, that brought great viewership numbers even in real life. 
as major news stations now had dedicated segments featuring latest Omega news on their broadcast. The incidents in Hazel Groove was a hot topic currently. Hence the news channels hopped in on the action, going with public emotion and condemning the alliance as a worthless excuse for a power group. The matter blew up so much that the real-life backers of the alliance members, the parent corporations had to face the backlash. The corporations lost face inside investor meetings and billionaire gatherings, as they were mocked for their lack of talents. Billionaires had an especially inflated sense of ego. And should anyone disrupt their perfect image of themselves or hurt their pride even slightly, it would rattle them to their core, as they would try everything in their might to prove them wrong. Backlash came from the higher-ups, as the elders and guild leaders had a nightmare of a scolding. The only way the guild leaders avoided their firings was because they made sure to exaggerate the point that they could smoke the elites soon in a war. 350. 000, 000, 000 members against what 350? There was no way that the elites win that thing. Even with an NPC army of a 10. 000, 000, 000 troops or 50. 000, 000, 000 troops or whatever amounts of bombs they had. They cannot win that battle. Only because of this guarantee. Did they barely keep their jobs by the skin of their teeth? However should they lose? It will all be over then. And even though the guarantees, things were even worse than they were laid back at the command station, as they were unable to regain control of the 11 sectors in the given time, only being able to take back 8. Failing the quest given by Emperor Amon, the Emperor gained back control over the military after beheading those who resisted his power, regaining military supremacy. After regaining military supremacy, the military swooped through the kingdom restoring order through force. Millions of innocents died. However, the riots ended with Amon being accepted as the emperor. The church fulfilled its obligations as it crowned the 17th emperor of Hazelgrove. And with that began a new reign and a new era. With them failing the quest came a heavy penalty for the alliance as the emperor forced military service upon the alliance or faced banishment from the kingdom. The punishment required the alliance to provide 100. 000, 000 members for one year to compulsory military service to the state. Having no other options. The Alliance had to force its newly recruited basic members into one year of forced military service contract while being underpaid from the Guild. The Alliance truly felt the pinch of finances the last few days. The Red Jewel Quest line had been a disaster that completely blew a hole in their finances. Firstly, it was the compensation for deaths that they had to roll out. Then it was the money spent on repairs and replacement of damaged equipment. Then it was the forced military service for a year while being underpaid by the Alliance. The three major events destroyed their guild's cash flow. Their only hope now was to win the war against the true elites and raid 70% of their lucrative warehouse as war compensation to ease their financial pressure. The time for talking trash was over. As just when the cooldown for war was over, the impending war request came to the true elites. True elites headquarters, inner district, Purple Haze City. Rudra was calmly looking at the new system notification that just came. It was a notice of war. He had been mentally prepared for this since a long time. He sighed as he opened the war notice. War notification? Your guild, the true elites, has been challenged to a guild war by six other guilds, namely Azure Lotus signed by Pink Lotus, Sea of Poison signed by Scorpio, Surfer United signed by Beach Boy, Real Manchester signed by De Bruyne, Original Manchester signed by Fernandez, Musicians Inc. signed by True Rhythm, with a group named The Alliance. Should you choose to accept the war invitation as the defending party you shall have the right to. 1. Choose the battlefield. 2. Choose the war reparations to be paid in case of a victory. 3. Choose the exact date of the war in the next 14 days. In case of losing the war the penalty will be. 1. Losing 70% of guild assets. In case of choosing to forfeit slash surrender the challenge. 1. Pay 20% of all guild assets. 2. Get a 60 days protection period. In case of winning the war. 1 you will gain 90% of all opposing guild's assets. 2. One request made in accordance to winning the defender's right. Do you wish to? 1. Accept the war invitation. 2. Surrender. Rudra chose to accept the war invitation. With choosing the date of battle as 4 days from now on Saturday. As for the war indemnity, he put forth the condition that 100. 000, 000 alliance members shall sign a slavery contract for 3 years to be subservient to the true elites guild as a manual labor. He would have filled in for more if the system allowed it. Ending the alliance problem for once and for all. However, the system only allowed him an indemnity for 100. 000, 000 members for three years. And that was only because he accepted a war challenge against six other guilds. The system calculated the indemnity to be in proportion to the odds and approved it. The war deed was signed. The inevitable was here. The clash between the alliance and the elites. 
forward slash forward slash forward slash new week new targets. 800 PS equals one bonus chapter. 1600 PS equals two bonus chapters. 2400 PS equals three bonus chapters. 3200 PS equals four bonus chapters. 4000 PS equals five bonus chapters. 100 golden tickets equals one bonus chapter. Guys, the golden ticket department has slowed down the last five days or so. A great war arc upcoming. Let's pick up the pace for an amazing war arc. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 156 War Preparations. The elites were at a massive disadvantage in the war. Period. Everything had a role in wars. Terrain. Strategy. Weapons. Tactical superiority and coordination. However, the biggest thing needed in a war was numbers. Against an army of 100. 000 strong. 100 men cannot last long against them in any sort of open confrontation. The only example in history when 300 men toppled an army being outnumbered by thousands was the Spartan War of 300 against the Persians. However, that was because they held a small passage where the numerical superiority of the enemy had no advantage. Except that it was draining on stamina. However, history was man's best teacher and Rudra had learned a lot from the Battle of 300. He thoroughly understood that he needed a great equalizer to negate the enemy's overwhelming numerical superiority. And that equalizer came in the form of Fort Knox. Fort Knox was the battlefield that was geographically in a beautiful location. It was built on a small hill beside the ocean. On its south side was a small beach, and connecting the beach was the ocean. On its west side was a river, which met the ocean forming an estuary. On its north and east was a wide lush green plain stretching for kilometers. Rudra knew the Fort Knox battlefield inside out. It essentially had three openings. The first was the North Gate entrance. The North Gate entrance was the largest entrance and was the easiest to breach. The wood used to make the entrance door was quite weak. And it was the reason why whoever used Fort Knox in wars up to now was defeated thoroughly. The east side had a smaller entrance about the size of one horseman. It had an iron door to fortify the castle. But it could also be breached making the assault a two-pronged assault. If the assault ever becomes a two-pronged one, when the defending party is highly outnumbered, then know that you have lost the war there and then. And there was a third hidden passage inside the sandy beach. That opened inside a cellar inside the fort. This passage had not been discovered yet. In any wars. However, Rudra with his reincarnation knowledge already knew about it, and the passage was a key part of his plan. To win the war, there were three phases of action that needed to be taken. In every phase, there was little to no room for mistakes, and only, and only when all three phases are executed perfectly. Can one win the war? Even before the first phase of the war began, one needed pre-planning to do. And that pre-planning was to misguide the enemies. How can one achieve that? Of course through the snake inside the guild or a Chimaru. Rudra needed to have a fake war meeting inside the guild hall. Explaining a fake plan and terrain and throwing off the opposition off their game plan. While actually preparing for the war secretly in an entirely different direction. The actual plan of war was already formulated in his mind as he had calculated everything to utmost precision thinking about every possible scenarios and how to counter them. The first phase of the war would see the guild fortifying the entrances of Fort Knox in the east and the north gate using the lifestyle members and the reinforced bricks obtained in the auction. Within 10 minutes of preparation time, using fire spells and lots of practice in the days leading to the war, the guild members will learn how to make a cement wall of reinforced concrete as they seal both entrances, making the fort impregnable. Once the entrances are sealed completely, then the arrow shooting ballistas would be open to the world. As thousands would fall every minute to the relentless assault of the arrows of the ballisti. At which point spells and alchemic potions and a few bombs will be let loose on the swarm of opposing players. Rudra estimated a death toll of 9110,000 alliance players in phase 1. Which was the mass slaughter phase. Then the most critical phase of the war plan would begin the phase 2. In phase 2. Rudra expects the alliance to find a way into the fort. Nearly after two hours that the war starts. The natural cement walls of the fort should show signs of wear and tear. As he expects the guild to punch a hole through the defenses at that point. That point is where the war effort will take a crucial turn. The guild's tankers would have to show their masterclass along with vice guild master Karna. As the rest of the guild members retreated through the secret passage. And out of the secret door through to the beach. The role of the tankers is not only to hold the lines for long enough for the other members to retreat. But also to lure thousands of alliance members into the fort as they storm the area. It is at this point that bombs placed at strategic locations would blow up and crumple the entire Fort Knox, sacrificing thousands of alliance members along with the tankers. Rudra expected a death toll of 50-70,000 in this phase, which he deemed as the sacrifical phase. At this point the enemy forces should be thinned by a large amount 
when the final phase of the war starts, which would be the wild card phase of the war. The third phase would start when the fort entrance is breached and the elites are retreating. It is then that SMG who had sneaked through the secret passage at the start of the war and sneakily went up river behind the alliance members would ride the massive pirate ship that Karna obtained as treasure down river towards the ocean. When the hole is breached and the alliance members try to enter the fort, the pirate ship moving from the side would shower them with cannonballs and arrows from the ballisti. They would force the alliance to hasten their attack on the fort and divert some forces to handle the ship to dilute their attention. After the fort blows up the ship will also pick up the escaped elite members at the interjection of the ocean and the river. This was the final phase of the war effort as it would wipe the alliance members to staggeringly low number and force them into retreat, hopefully bringing the surviving numbers down to 10 or 20,000 members. From there on there was no plan, as the assaulters kept fighting the alliance on the beach. The alliance members would be forced to fight near the ocean where the ship would provide a constant cover. It was either wiping out the opposition then or retreating. But even if they wished to they would not be able to attack the pirate ship without proper infrastructure. The biggest advantage that the elites had was the ability to stun their opponents time and time again. However that would only remove the unfair numbers advantage that the alliance had. Finally it would come down man to man. Sword to sword and fist to fist and only the superior party shall win the contest. However man to man everyone knew that there was no comparing the elites to the trash called alliance. Hence, this was the best plan Ridra could come up with. Hopefully it would work. Forward slash forward slash forward slash let me know how you guys feel about the war plan. It's a lot of effort on my part as I plotted the whole thing. Hopefully you all like it. This bonus chapter is for all the summoning pins I have received asking for more work. This one is for you all. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 157 The Meeting. True Elite's Headquarters. The Upside. Real World. Amelia had personally messaged everyone in the guild to be present inside the Elite Tower Real World Guild Meeting Hall at exactly 4 p.m. Well, everyone expect Orochimaru of course. And everyone had indeed gathered in the hall. At first it seemed like a cool idea to make the decor of the 60th floor the same as the guild hall. However now, that the members were meeting here for the second time. Honestly it was a bit awkward. Because while getting the same game-like feeling, the world was actually reality. This caused an unnecessary deja vu for all members present which blurred the lines between virtual and real world. However, one thing was absolute. That within the virtual world or in the real world, Rudra was the leader of the group. Rudra took the stage and everyone instantly became silent. The pressure of war was looming and while every member was a bit nervous, they were more exited to see what the leader came up with. They believed in Rudra and his capabilities. If the impossible could be achieved, then he was the man to achieve it. Rudra looked at the crowd and smiled. Not a single person in the room looked scared even though a massive war was coming. Now this is what Rudra wanted in, his members. No matter the odds, there should be a determination to win. And these lads had it. Rudra said, Well, there has been a shortage of manpower lately even with the addition of 300 superbly talented people into the guild. I have seen guild members having to do menial tasks. And as a guild leader, I cannot let this continue any longer. Everyone in the room was confused. Manpower problem? Um leader, there is a war problem currently if you forgot? Karna Aka Leo Crispy asked. Are we hiring new members guild leader? Rudra smiled and said. Not currently. We have a strict entrance policy that cannot be laxed. Vice guild master. Everyone was even more confused. How are they going to solve the manpower problem without hiring new members? Poison Toad Gamakichi asked. Then are we hiring NPCs? Rudra said. Yes. We have indeed hired a lot of NPCs. But that is a topic for another day. Right now what I am talking about is different. Not wanting to create any more suspense, Rudra said. See, the things is like this. Although the modern world looks down on slavery, they perfectly enjoy exploiting employees into low-paying service contracts. The only difference between working as a slave and an employee is the name tag that we attach to it. Many people nodded. It resonated with people in a deeper level. Those who worked in an abusive corporate contract knew that they were no different than slaves. However, how does it apply here? Rudra continued. Naturally to solve the manpower problem of our guild without relying on NPCs and without lowering our recruitment standards, we need talented service people, slaves. Rudra paused and looked around the room. Then he said, 100. 000, 000, 000 alliance members should be enough? No. Three years of service debt for losing the war? The entire hall erupted in clamor. Insane. The leader is insane. What confidence. What arrogance. The leader how much confidence does he have in the guild's victory? Rudra laughed loudly seeing the clamor. His eyes shone with determination as he said. 
The Alliance weaklings dare challenge the mighty true elites. Now they need to be taught the law of the jungle. After we trample on them in war. Yes, of course, we will plunder their resources. But we will also force them into submission. You dare challenge us? Then you shall pay. Let me make it very clear, ladies and gentlemen. There are good guys and there are bad guys. And Rudraraj put Akka guild leader Shikuni. Is a bad, bad guy. If you are not an elite, you are not worthy of my mercy. The true elites is made for the best of the best players. And the alliance is privileged to serve us. After the war, we will rule Purple Haze City, ladies and gentlemen. Mark my words. Rudra was out of breath, but he continued. The elders have been informed about the three phases of the war. And they will brief you individually about your roles in the war. I won't lie to you guys. The war will be tough, and there is no margin for error. But follow the plan, and we will crush the alliance. Everyone nodded. They looked determined. Rudra said, This meeting is mainly about telling you guys that tomorrow inside the game, there will be another war meeting. But it is only a show for luring out the spy Orochimaru. Heed nothing that is discussed tomorrow. But act as if it is the most important meeting of your life. Your acting tomorrow will be important. I expect no slip-ups. Everyone became a little nervous. But they nodded in understanding. They had to be at their sharpest tomorrow if the bait for Orochimaru was to succeed. The meeting was dismissed after that. And the elders took over their respective group briefings. Explaining the real war plan and individual roles. The elite's members showed shocked expressions after shocked expressions after learning the trump cards the guild held. They became even more exited for the war after that. Rudra, who was overseeing the entire situation, was deep in thought. He had a deep worry that he had not expressed to the guild members. If you are reading this book on any site except web novel, you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform web novel. If you are looking for more latest chapters, please read the book on web novel. Rudra's deepest worry was that even after chipping away the massive numbers of the opposition, there would be more than 20,000 alliance members left standing against 250 or so elites. Should the alliance then reveal hidden cards, it would get really difficult for the elites to win. Rudra would be a fool to think that numbers was the only strength that the alliance had. Six first-rate guilds were bound to have one or two hidden cards. However, how much will those cards tip the scale of the war? As the leader, he could not show his worries to anyone. He had to remain strong and focused. His boundless confidence should inspire everyone else. However, the reality was that Noon feared losing the war more than Rudra did. Noon doubted every move he planned and was a bigger critique than he was for himself. As he sat in a corner engrossed in his thoughts, a woman sat beside him and tugged his arm and said, It's okay, guild leader. We believe in you. But you can also rely on us. We won't let you down. Rudra glanced to the side to find Naomi sitting beside him smiling. His heart warmed. This girl, she understood the burdens he carried. He gave her a bright smile. Forward slash forward slash forward slash shout out to Alicia Melchiat and Mystic Genius for the 500 coin gifts. Thank you very much for the patronage. We have hit the PS target. Bonus coming soon. Golden ticket department is very slow. We need only a few more for one more bonus. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 158 The Trap. True Elite's Headquarters. Inner District. Purple Haze City. Virtual World. Orochimaru had suddenly got an order informing him of an all-guild meeting today in the guild hall. He had long been walking on thin ice. And this war was kind of the last chance he had as a spy to work for the Mbani Corporation. To be fair, the Mbani Corporation long wanted to plant another spy inside the elites. However, the guild never opened their goddamn recruitment doors. They could not plant anyone else. Hence had to give Orochimaru the chance. Orochimaru had long since decided that he would much rather record the whole thing then writing a report and filing evidence. Hence, he had long started his record feature in the morning as he waltzed in the guild. He greeted players and made small talk about the upcoming war to learn their opinions. However, actually, it was to pry into information. However, his trick was long seen through as everyone knew he was a spy. Noon gave him relevant information and kept piling more and more bulls asterisk 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 thoughts and data to his plate. At the end, if one sits to organize all that was said and done, they would have nothing useful at all. The greatest actor of all, however, was Fatty Kalash. He kept sighing and walking around Orochimaru, baiting him to talk to him. And indeed, Orochimaru caught the bait as he approached Fatty Kalash and asked, You seem worried, my friend. Everything okay? Kalash looked at Orochimaru for two seconds. Then he sighed again, holding his head, looking absolutely devastated and depressed as he said in a heavy voice, The new bomb recipe we came up with has failed. I do not know how to face the guild leader with my failure. Orochimaru's ears perked up at the news. 
This was good stuff. This was exactly what the Alliance wanted to know. How many trump cards does the true elites have? How many bombs? Now that one of their new bomb lines have failed. Isn't that good news for the Alliance? Immediately he tried to talk to Kalashmore, comforting him and trying to get more information. At the end, he got the information that the elites had close to five. Zero, zero, zero bombs. And that they will use their entire stockpile to level the alliance. The number five. Zero, zero, zero really shocked Orochimaru. However, he sniggered inwardly. Even if the 5,000 bombs kill 50. Zero, zero, zero people. It will still not be enough to win the war. The elites were doomed. But outwardly, he didn't show it. He behaved like he was deeply concerned for the guild. Feeling all sly and cunning. However, he did not realize that he had long fallen for Fatty Kalash's deceitful acting. Finally, it was time for the meeting as everyone gathered in the guild hall. Rudra entered the room and started to speak. Guys, the truth is, we are very, very hard pushed to win this war. Against the Alliance, we have bitten off more than we can chew. And six first-rate guilds are not what we can fight against. However, as throwing the towel is not our style. We will try our best to win the war. The atmosphere in the room became gloomy. Orochimaru felt very very happy with Ridra's speech so far as he said inwardly yeah, you did you ba asterisk 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 asterisk. Nobody messes with the alliance. Ridra continued. The best plan that we have currently is to use our two best cards against the alliance. Card number one is our defender's advantage that we choose the terrain. And after much deliberation with the elders, we have decided to take the forest as our chosen terrain. Everyone nodded. They seemed to agree with the decision it seemed logical. Orochimaru bit his lip. If it was the forest then showing numeric superiority may be difficult. Rudra continued. I know it will be hard. And the war will be long. However using the forest as cover we can set up traps. And use guerrilla warfare tactics as we sneakily attack and retreat. This made sense as everyone nodded again. Even Orochimaru felt convinced this was a smart plan of action. Rudra continued. We have a stockpile of close to 5,000 bombs. Each member shall be given 10. Your job with these 10 bombs is to kill as many groups of Alliance members as you can. The damn bombs. Orochimaru cursed. The elites had the bombs that were the most coveted thing that every other guild wanted, but the elites won't sell. Lastly, Rudra said, Even after all this, I do not expect to win. Logically speaking, our chances of victory are one in a thousand. Even I as our guild leader has bet all my money on us losing this war. Not because I have no hope, but because after we pay 70% war indemnity, we still have money to run the guild. And I urge you all to do the same. The atmosphere in the room became the lowest. The leader had no confidence in winning. Why would they even try? Orochimaru was the happiest. He had gotten the biggest scoop of the century. This video would be recorded in history of the game as his name would spread throughout. He could not help but also admire Rudra's ingenuity. Betting on the alliance to win to make some money back was indeed a very smart idea. He quickly took his leave as he went to forward the recorded evidence to his superiors. He was hoping for endless praise, and a good promotion for this job well done. Even his superiors found the video compelling, as they showed it to the alliance leaders. Boosting their confidence in the war a thousandfold. You have felt a bit bad for Rudra. To see him in such a pitiful state, she swore that she would not take a dime from her share of the war loot, and give it all back to Rudra secretly. The other leaders started to think about conquering the forest terrain, as they brainstormed ideas. But unbeknownst to them, thinking they were the big fish stalking the little fish. The little fish was a deliberate bait set up by the fisherman. The trap was a hook. Line and sinker. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target. Keep it up you all. Also the golden ticket target has been hit. Sue I guess one more bonus coming your way. Shout out to Leo Crispi and Ivory Pope for the 500 coin gifts. Thank you so much for the patronage. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 159 War Preparations Everyone started to fervently prepare for war. There was an overall atmosphere of pushing past their limits and going above and beyond in the next three days to be at the peak condition possible for the war. Fatty Kalash lead his team of lifestyle players to ensure that the manufacturing of the ballistae and the rapid construction of reinforced brick wall was progressing well. The first phase of the plan revolved heavily around the contribution of the lifestyle guild. In the 10-minute preparation time before the war started, they had to completely reinforce the entraces to make the fort impregnable. A slightest weakness in assembly and the defense could crumble. And the war would be finished there and then. However, Fatty Kalash wasn't someone who would ever let that happen on his watch. Under his supervision, the wall team worked day and night to perfect their craft of making the wall. And the assembly of the ballistae and a sea of arrows were being produced in the smithies day and night. 
the alchemists and potion makers in the lifestyle division made many poisonous gas potions to throw into swarm of enemies to deter them, although they were not very lethal and could be easily countered with an antidote. To those who were not well equipped, they could still possess a challenge, especially the basic paralysis potion that reduced movement speed by 40%. The assaulters of the guild were busy leveling. That included Rudra, who was leveling like a maniac. He had already leveled up twice and showed no signs of slowing. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazel Groove Kingdom. Reputable Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life. World Renowned. Hero of Augustus One Knight. Limit Breaker. Class Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LDL, 48. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 290 plus 145 bit. 290 plus 145. Int, 290 plus 145 STA. 290 plus 145. PHY, 290 plus 145 HP. 37,000 slash 37,000. Unassigned stat points shot. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy. Invalid. Status. Healthy. Equipment. Pirate armor set. LV40. Lich's ring. Concealer mask. Not equipped. Retractable shield. Epic. Weapons. Wind cutter sword. Common bow. Quiver of arrows. Excalibur sword. Replica. Elven. Sword. Semi-legendary. Skills. Darkness bind. Summon knight Durahel. Wind slash. Critical absorb. Berserk, Darkness Blast, Death Slash, Eyes of Truth, Earthquake, Critical Block, Blink, Stormbringer, Class Specific Skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio, Mount, Gray Wolf, Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 65 Slash 200. The same went for Karna and Meatwit who were leveling up relentlessly. The three understood quite well that their independent strengths would play a huge role in the coming war. The guild also spared no expense in improving its member strengths. High quality weapons. Skill books. Equipment. Everything was purchased by the guild. The member had to only send an invoice requesting money, and they will be given the entire sum and also some more. It just so happened that every single member was covered in light gold equipment or higher. There were not a single piece of bronze or silver ranked equipment on their body. Only gold or dark gold grade. Not even guild leaders of third and second rate guild so well equipped much less common members. This just went to show how different the elites were from the other guilds. Rich beyond reason. Unafraid to splurge on members. And delivered more than what was promised. It was because of this attitude of the guild towards its members that the sincerity was returned as people wholeheartedly worked for the guild. The facade in front of Orochimaru was maintained perfectly as members kept talking about how to navigate the forest and how to set up traps and how they wished that the alliance would be merciful in victory. If you are reading this book on any site except web novel you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform Webnovel. If you are looking for more latest chapters please read the book on Webnovel. Orochimaru kept gaining confidence in the Alliance victory, and Su did the superiors behind him, who praised him for a job well done. The Alliance had already came up with ways to counter the forest problem. They had purchased flares in bulk and of different colors. Their plan was to infiltrate the entire forest, and then the group which encountered enemies would fire a flare in the air. Every nearby group would close in with a circle formation as they confronted the enemy from all sides. This way the enemy would have no chance to use guerrilla tactics, and it would be only a matter of time before the enemy was caught in small groups and hunted to oblivion. Their other plans included strategically burning portions of the forest to drive out the enemy, should they encounter an area that the enemy had made a stronghold out of. And naturally the equipment they carried was also suited for the exact task. Had they even a whiff of the elite's true strategy, they could have prepared ladders and siege equipment, have wall breakers, and have the wizards learn strong explosive spells. However, they were clueless about it because of the very person they planted to not be clueless. Rudra had played a masterstroke in manipulating Orochimaru, and the Alliance would find out about it real soon. The forums were ablaze with speculation as the odds of an elite victory were the worst odds ever predicted. With a payout of 32 1, an elite S victory was ruled out by every single expert. However, there were those who saw this as an opportunity to make big money, and hence invested $100 to $1,000 on Elite's victory, while betting $10,000 on their loss. Hence, either way, it won't be a big loss for them. Now they just hope for a miraculous Elite victory. 
The only exception to the scenario, and heaviest better towards the elites was naturally Ethan Gray, who had absolute confidence in Ridra, who bet a whopping $100 billion on an elite's win. He would either make the annual profit of the Gray Corporation in a single week, or lose a lot of money on a whim. To be fair, he was scared of losing his money, but the thrill of the gamble compelled him to do it anyway. Now, he just hoped Rudra would not let him down. The world's attention was on this fight as major news channels had already began programs about the war running almost 20 hours a day. Various experts were brought to the panel to discuss about the possible elite strategy and war outcome. While many interesting theories were exchanged, the end analysis of all experts was the same. There is no chance in hell that the elites win. The bald expert that just had his hair grown back after Ms. predicting that the elites can't defeat Orange Rock Guild was back on the panel as he again made a bold prediction when a journalist asked him about his precious mistake. The journalist asked, Sir, you had said the same thing when the elites fought Orange Rock Guild, that there was no chance in hell that they could win. Now you say it again. What happens if you are wrong yet again? The expert said, Last time was a fluke. Noon could have predicted the use of bombs by the guild. And there is a limit to how much cards one can hold. I can guarantee that the elites won't win this war. And if they do... I will not only shave my head again, I will also shave my eyebrows, mustache and wax every single hair on my body. The expert made a bold predicament. Rudra seeing the show on his sofa, eating popcorn smiled as he said, Get ready to lose your hair then baldy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching golden ticket target. Finally the next chapter will see the start of the war. Special shout out to Cervantes91 for the 1000 coin gift and to Sneaky Fox for the 500 coin gift. Thank you for the patronage you both. Motivates me a lot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 160 War 1. Finally the day of the war arrived. All that could be prepared had been prepared. And knowing the sheer scale of the event. Various media outlets had bribed players on both sides to stream live content. From the true elites' side. Ethan himself requested Rudra to live stream straight from his POV in the war. Rudra would have hesitated or even outright rejected the idea if there was a possibility that his plans may be leaked due to live streaming. However, inside the war arena, all incoming messages were disabled, even within party members. Information had to be relayed through runes or the old school way of shouting the commands. Structure and relay of commands was extremely important in wars, and only because he was sure that no information could be leaked to the enemy, he decided to accept the live stream request from Ethan Gray. One of Ethan's many companies was Gray Entertainment which had many channels and subscription services. And Rudra's exclusive stream on their channel was sure to drive sales through the roof. Five minutes before the war. The Elite's HQ. Rudra started the live stream within the Elite Guild Hall. Facing him were all the true Elite's guild members. The main guild and the lifestyle members alike. As everyone had a part to play in the war. There was nervousness and excitement in the air. Everyone was impatient for the war to start. The five minutes of waiting time felt like an eternity. Rudra looked at his guild pride filling his chest. Every single member. Even the non-combat ones were covered in gold-grade armor or above. Millions watching the scene were also in awe of the elite's wealth. The scene of 500 or so members covered in top-notch equipment awed all viewers. Rudra then raised his hand for silence as he began his war speech. He said, The war ahead is going to be a tough one. I want to insult you guys by asking you whether you are ready or not. Whether you can give your 100% for the guild or not. Whether you can execute your roles to the best of your abilities in the war or not. Because if even a single answer is a no, then we have already lost the war. Everyone had a determined look on their faces. They did not need a motivational talk from the leader. Their dedication to the guild needed no motivation. They looked fired up. They were ready for war. Karna looked at the members. As the countdown hit 15 seconds, he shouted loudly. One for all. All for one. And every single guild member shouted. Go elites Geo. The countdown hit zero and they were all transported to the chosen field of defense. The Fort Knox. The war battlefield of Fort Knox. Everyone was teleported to the battlefield. The defenders the elite spawned inside the fort. Whereas the attackers the alliance spawned inside the northern plains. The alliance leaders were instantly dumbfounded when they teleported inside the war map. This was not the forest. This was the Fort Knox map. The 10 minute war timer started. And the elite's lifestyle had already started its work in reinforcing the entrances through the reinforced brickwork, while everyone else took the designated positions within the fort. Everyone except Orochimaru, who looked lost. Orochimaru's mind blanked when he found himself inside a Fort Knox and not a forest. He looked around carefully, only to find that Noon else was surprised and even began to work. 
he couldn't process what was going on. However, everyone was giving him venomous looks in the guild. And Shikuni, Karna, Neatwit, and SMG were surrounding him. He was currently on a border wall. And retreating 5 meters more meant, he would have an ugly fall down the wall for 30 meters or so. Ridra walked with a smug smile on his face as he said, Orochimaru. Oh, Orochimaru. You think you are so smart. Huh? Trying to infiltrate the guild. Leaking information to Mithun and Bonnie about the elites. Well, 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 do you take us as fools who did not know your ploy? Orochimaru was stunned. Impossible. Impossible. He knew it all from the start. Was the only thoughts he had in his mind. But his mouth stuttered for words as the elder circled in on him. Pushing him towards the edge. Finally regaining some sense of speech he said. Impossible. You were supposed to choose the forest terrain. There was this huge guild meeting. I have proof I recorded everything. Was it all a setup from the start? Ridra just smiled a sinister laugh to confirm his thoughts. Orochimaru shrieked like a little boy terrified. If Ridra knew everything from the start. About his identity and his connection to the Ambani Corporation. And still gave him all the benefits of the guild and even footed massive amounts of money for his purchases. Only to lure him into a trap. Then he was a master manipulator and a terrifying player of mind games. You? You? You framed me! He shouted in anger. However, suddenly he found a dagger in his abdomen. SMG had sneaked up on him. He was shocked. He was stabbed when distracted. But when he looked up, he saw Rudra's sinister smile as he said, The elites have no space for snakes like you. Boom! Rudra kicked him square on the jaw and sent him flying down the wall. His thoughts as his HP rapidly drained from the dagger in his abdomen. Nearing death was only that his career was over. The Ambani Corporation would never forgive him, and how he was a fool to think that he was the smartest person in the elite guild hall. Whereas the reality was that compared to Shikuni, he was not even fit to lick his boots. The chapter of Orochimaru the traitor ended with this kick forever. He died from a fall down the wall, and was teleported out of the war arena. Forward slash forward slash forward slash war is finally on guys. Need full support in Power Stone and Golden Ticket departments from you all now. I am super pumped about this arc and would love maximum comment participation on all chapters. Also special shout out to Caleb Holland for the 500 coin, and Ivory Pope for the 1000 coin gifts. It really motivates me to work harder for you all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 161 War 2. The Real World. Ethan Gray was sitting in his private lounge. One of the finest whiskeys in the world in his hand. As he watched Ridra's live stream. Today was a crucial day for Ethan as today was not only the elites facing the alliance where he had a whopping $100 billion on the line. But also the day where his hired team of world-class mercenaries blew up in Bonnie's petroleum mine. It was safe to say that Ethan Gray was a confident man. He would never drink to relieve stress. Yet today his nerves were at the edge. It was a make-or-break day for him. As he would either come out the other side today as a tycoon who would expand his net worth by trillions, or someone who would have to lay low for a while, losing large sums of money. When Ridra kicked the snake Orochimaru after name dropping his connection with the Ambanis, Ethan felt a sense of satisfaction and relief. As he muttered under his breath, King Snakes! War Arena. The Alliance POV. Beach Boy of Surfers United was live streaming hence, the world was watching the Alliance leaders having an impromptu meeting regarding the change in the chosen terrain. Scorpio said, The spy's information turned out to be useless. There is no F asterisk 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 forest. Damn that idiot spy. Our whole strategy is ruined. We have no way to tackle a fort siege. We have no ladders or wall climbers, Pink Lotus said. Although what you are saying is true, not everything is as bad as it seems. I have seen previous battles in Fort Knox. It has two gates at east and north. The north gate is the biggest gate made of wood. Our assaulters should be able to hack through the gate after a bit of struggle. We will lose some numbers. However, that's not an issue, is it? Once the gate crumbles, so will the elites. True Rhythm agreed to Pink Lotus as he said. I agree. This is not necessarily a better choice than the forest. The fort is a smaller area to defend and run. We can rest assured about the guerrilla warfare tactics. Once the defenses of the fort are breached the war will end. The alliance leaders had a logical discussion about what to do next. But time was running out. As the 10 minute preparation time was about to run out. They were yet to relay important information to the two. 50. 000 strong army of theirs. And as for now, there was but one command. That was breach the gates and attack the fort. The war timer hit the final 30s. And everyone became laser focused. Victory or defeat. Everything would be decided now. 
unbeknownst to them. And deadly assassin party of 20 lead by SMG had sneaked through the hidden gate and started to make his way up river. Unnoticed by the Alliance Army. 5. 4321 War Starts. The True Elite's POV. The war had started and everyone had taken battle positions. The task of handling the Archballisti was left to the archers. Whereas every lifestyle member and non-wizards were given a bow and quiver of arrows. A few people like Rudra and Karna chose the javelin to strategically target enemies. Just as the countdown hit zero, a sea of people started to charge from the northern gate towards the fort. Rudra smiled at them as he said, Come! He gave Karna the nod and Karna gave the war command. Unveil the ballisti! Archers load your arrows! Dot! Karna shouted. The cloths covering the ballisti were removed. The weapons were already armed and loaded. Hold dot! Karna said, waiting for the perfect time to unleash the arrows. Making sure that maximum enemies were inside the range of arrows to maximize damage. Fire! Dot! Karna shouted. And for a second the sun got blocked out a sea of arrows fell on the charging alliance members. As thousands were hit with the incoming arrows. But to the sheer horror of the alliance members. Unlike the traditional arrows that hit in waves after waves. These arrows were continuous. Like a goddamn machine gun. The ballistic kept blasting arrows after arrows. With an insane rate of 200 arrows per minute. At least 150 alliance members died under its relentless assault every minute. While 20 more were injured. And there were eight such beasts mounted on the walls of Fort Knox. 1200 alliance members fell each minute to the ballisti, and about 300 more fell under the arrows and spells of the members. There was panic, disbelief, and sheer horror inside the alliance members' eyes. They could not even defend properly under the relentless arrow assault. Chaos reigned inside the charging party, as to defend the arrows the alliance members moved around and bumped into each other, falling tripping and breaking the attack lines. Scorpio looked at the ballisti and just went bat hit crazy. What the hell is that thing? Why do the elites have such a game-breaking thing? His mind went blank. And the same happened for the other five alliance leaders. They were speechless seeing the beast of a ballisti in actions. Thousands being slayed every minute under its unending assault. Meanwhile the world watching the unfolding of the ballisti went totally nuts. The elites had their own medieval machine gun. How cool. The common adventurers seeing the war for fun were very very happy seeing the entertaining ballisti in action. Whereas the various superpowers saw it, as a must-have tool in their arsenal. Win or lose. Many interested parties were going to contact the elites post-war. For this technology, the first phase of the war had started. And ten minutes into the war, the first alliance member finally reached the northern gate. After going through hell in the face of incoming fire, and started hacking at the wooden door with his axe. However, within these ten minutes close to sixteen, zero 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 alliance members had died. And there was no signs of slowing down forward slash forward slash forward slash three chapter day today as both the power stone and golden ticket targets have been hit congratulations guys your wish for a faster war arc will be granted today special shout out to caleb polling for the 1000 coin gift and mystic genius for the 500 coin gift thank you for the patronage guys it motivates me a lot forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 162 war 3 the appearance of the ballistic caused the alliance members to panic and hence the inexperienced soldiers broke the ranks, and the attack formation was ruined. However slowly, but surely a few members started to teach the north gate, hacking the wood with their weapons. The big and burly ones took a short run up, and tried to ram themselves onto the gate's shoulder first. However for some reason, the door would not budge, but not understanding the reason behind it. They kept attacking the door nonetheless. The alliance leaders quickly issued an order for all long-range classes to attack the ballisti. However to their nightmare their lower ground disadvantage and the ballisti's long range barrage made it impossible to get in a safe range to attack the ballisti. The few who did manage to get even a bit close had a javelin pierced through their body. Courtesy of Rudra and Karna who were only on the lookout for such people. Half an hour passed just like that and close to 40,000 alliance members had died under the constant assault of arrows and javelins. The alliance had absolutely no answers for the incoming assault of the ballisti. People watching worldwide were awed as many started to believe that if the elites could mint in the current situation for an hour longer, the entire war situation may change. Where many experts predicted the war to be over within the first 30 minutes. The actual reality was that after 30 minutes, not a single elite was dead. However, close to 40,000 alliance members were. Their numbers dwindling to 2. 10. 000 men. However, finally at that time, someone finally cut through the wooden gate. But what he saw through the small opening he made, made him despair. There was a goddamn wall behind the gate. This made no sense. 
Why is there a wall behind the gate? He shouted. There is a wall behind the gate. And naturally the message ran across the battlefield. That there was a wall behind the gate. Rudra smiled hearing the message. It was about time that they found out about it. Now he could turn things up a notch. The alliance leaders were dumbfounded. There was a wall behind the gate. Wasn't the fort supposed to be impregnated once the gate was breached? Then why was there a wall? Scorpio shouted in desperation. Half of the party members. Circle to the east gate. Circle to the east gate. Circle to the east gate. This was the issue in commanding such a large army. By the time the command manually reached the front line, the initial command of half members circle to the east gate became circle to the east gate. As droves and droves of players started to circle towards the east gate, the abrupt change in charging direction caused the army to form a congested group. That was easy pickings for the ballisti. In the five minutes following the command, close to 15, 000 alliance members lost their lives as they tried to reach the east gate. However, to their horror, the small metal east gate was actually covered by five arch ballisti, and it was suicidal to even come close. Rain of arrows poured over the alliance members, with the next five minutes having a deadly death count of 21. 000 alliance members, their original numbers of 2, 50, 000 now reduced to 1, 74, 000. The alliance leaders had a ghastly pale expression, as everything was falling apart their death tolls piling like crazy. However, there was a certain leader amongst their group who was having a sly smile on his face currently. Beach Boy said, I have a trump card that can help us breach the wall. But it is very expensive, and I cannot use it for free. If you guys want me to use it, then I will get 20% more from the end loot. The other five leaders glared at Beach Boy. He had a way of stopping this massacre. But he was holding them hostage for getting more benefits. Had the situation been not so desperate, they would have already kicked this greedy ba asterisk 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 in the head by now. However, considering the desperate situation that they were in, they hesitated. Every guild needed money. And giving up 20% was too much. It was then that a guild member came with a report. Reporting to the leaders, it is confirmed that the elites have somehow made a strong concrete brick wall behind both the gates. The fort is impregnable. Damn it! F asterisk 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 ing annoying pricks. Scorpio lost his mind his antics being watched by millions. However, seeing the desperate situation, he said, All right, I agree, you selfish pig. The other guild leaders also gave their confirmation through gritted teeth, as Beach Boy had a big smile plast on his face. Beach Boy said, All right, watch me, as he took out some scroll from within his inventory. The scroll was a tier 3 spell scroll fireblast. Fireblast, tier 3, a scroll that unleashes the power of a tier 3 spell. Fireblast, can only be used once before the paper burns out. Effects. Creates a powerful flame explosion. Everyone's eyes widened when Beach Boy pulled the scroll out. If it was a tier 3 scroll, then indeed, it had power to destroy the fort walls and blast a hole. They hated Beach Boy as greed. However, they praised his resourcefulness. With this, they could finally enter the fort and win the war. An entire unit, made of elite tankers, covered Beach Boy from every incoming assault. As they moved as a compact unit, with every defense spell and ability at the disposal of the tanks being activated. When they finally reached an acceptable range, Beach Boy finally infused mana into the spell, as he aimed for a spot on the wall. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the golden ticket target. Great job you all. One more coming up for hitting the power stone target later tonight. Also a big shout out to Ivory Pope for the 2000 coin gift. Woohoo. Feeling appreciated for my hard work. Thank you forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 163 war 4 beach boy unleashed the full power of the tier 3 spell boom it collided with the walls of fort knox the explosion rattling the entire fort one arch ballisti was destroyed as it was positioned right above the explosion that took down the wall however the explosion came at a cost as 200 or so alliance members near the wall area were also blown away with the brunt of the explosion there was a void created in that area but when the dust settled and huge hole appeared on the walls of Fort Knox, all hell broke loose as the Alliance members came swarming at that direction. The Alliance leaders rejoiced at the scene. The orders of charge could be heard all around the battlefield, as victory seemed certain following the fort's breach. Experts all around the world, who were giving live commentary on the war developments became very exited, as they started commenting, as if it was the start of the end for the true elites. Beach Boy personally lead the charge alongside his elite guard. As he tried to enter the fort, Rivera took in a deep breath. It was time for phase two. It all depended on the tanks now. 
except the archers who were still manning the arch Ballisti, and the tanks and Rudra. The rest of the elite started to retreat through the decided path. Rudra quickly threw two spike bombs and one thrust bomb at the area of Hole, where there was a dense population of players. The bombs as expected were super effective under the situation, as they claimed the lives of many alliance members, and also bought a few extra seconds of time for the elites to retreat. Mediv was the last one to retreat after ensuring that the entire wizard division had retreated. However, before retreating he needed to show a skill of his own. Facing the hole in the wall, Mediv took the special potion that Rudra acquired for him. That temporarily allowed him to temporarily raise his potential to cast a spell one tier above his current tier. This was the second time he would use the spell. The first time being against the trolls. Mediv closed his eyes and focused. He raised his hand and started the chant. Flames started to burst from under his feet and around him and started to grow in size and power. Circles of flame danced around his being. As he casted the spell Sea of Fire, boom, the entire hole, and 25 meters beyond the hole, was transformed into a blazing sea of fire. The tier 2 spell showing its full effect. Hundreds of alliance members, who had recovered from the bombs, and desperately tried to enter were scorched to death. As the spell took a toll of nearly 500 alliance members, and gave burns to many more. A perfect example, of the terrifying PV capability of a wizard class. Mediv displayed his class awing the world watching. Again a vacuum was created where the hole in the wall was. The remnant flames marking a scorched area. The alliance simply could not breach the entrance. Wizard players around the world were shocked to see Mediv's abnormal display of power. What was that spell? How can he cast such a powerful spell? Everyone had doubts in their minds. As a tier 1, not a single mage across the game could pull off what he did. The name and face of Mediv was etched into the memory of every wizard player at this point. As someone to watch out for, Rudra nodded at Mediv and signaled for him to leave. Rudra was pleasantly surprised by his performance as he over-delivered. The casting of this spell was not discussed in the initial plan. However, it brought a few extra seconds for the elites to retreat, being thwarted twice from entering the fort. The alliance members became more desperate than ever in their third try. The Archbalistes' relentless assault never stopped and the death toll was piling at an insane number by the minute. The fort needed to be breached, and it needed to be breached now. Rudra still had three bombs left in his inventory not counting those that were already set up in the fort for its collapse. If he chose so, he could have used them at this point again to get a death toll at the area of breach. However, he chose to save them for emergencies. The situation was under control as of now, and the bombs may come in handy later. Thinking so, Rudra finally let go of the javelins and summoned his dual swords. Excalibur in his left hand and Elven sword in his right. Rudra was ready for war. And so were the other nine tankers in the guild. The job of the tankers was very difficult. They had to hold up against hundreds of players in a strategic location until thousands of alliance members were inside the vicinity of the fort and to ensure that before they died, they activated the bombs planted on the fort's walls to let it crumble. Fort Knox had seven large vertical pillars supporting its base structure, all being fit with the elite special water bombs. Also a special stash of water bombs was inside basement of the fort. That would be activated by Fatty Kalash after the other seven go off. Destroying the entire Fort Knox area. Cola. Tank. Rhino. Armored Snake. Bulletproof. Damage Taker. Thousand Punchman. Shield Bearer. And Line Holder were the nine tankers in the true elites. And their time to shine was now. Hundreds of Alliance members poured in through the open hole. Cola swallowed his saliva seeing the sight. Determination in his eyes. He was ready for the fight of his life. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting Power Stone target. Great job you all for having a three chapter day. The second phase of the war arc is here. The story will only intensify going forward. Hence I hope you all will keep hitting the next targets as fast as possible for enjoying the war break free. We are close to hitting the next golden ticket target. So let's go guys. We can do this. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 160 for the greatest mercenary. Forward slash forward slash forward slash off the coast of country X. The Ambani Petroleum Mining Area forward slash forward slash forward slash. This is the Country X Air Force. You have entered restricted airspace. Please lower your altitude to 20. 000 feet and turn around to leave the airspace. You have two minutes to comply or we will shoot you down. Dot. The announcement could be heard in the mercenary plane. There were three people in the cockpit. One was a stunning woman that would make even the saints meditating in Himalayas arouse in excitement. She was wearing a tight leather outfit supposedly made of high tinsel bulletproof material. However, the tight outfit just highlighted her perfect figure and showed her curves beautifully. The girl was a sculpted beauty of the highest order, 
with natural assets that were neither too big nor too small, a goddess fitting tastes of all men. Here chocolate brown hair and smoky black eyes only enhancing her already perfect face. Her spy name was Skyla, and her real identity was unknown. She was the co-pilot today on this high-paying mission alongside the greatest mercenary of the dark market. Before introducing the greatest mercenary on the dark market, it is important to introduce his lackey. Six foot two, 220 pounds, Asian male, brown skin, and lean muscular body. His name was Bo, graduating top of the mercenary training class. He was a once-in-a-lifetime prodigy. Fast, smooth, charming and deadly. He was the perfect guy for every mission. Currently learning from the best mercenary to ever live. He was very vigilant on this high-paying mission. As he watched to absorb every single move the senior made, he was seriously infatuated with Miss Skyla. However, he could not show it. As moreover, his respect for the greatest mercenary was greater than his infatuation. He kept his focus on that man. The greatest mercenary of all time was the title this man had on the dark market. After he successfully assassinated the monarch of country F, his epics were legendary about how he learnt Kung Fu from a monastery in China and how he had the most unusual solutions to any given situation. His name was Johnny English. Boring country B. He was the idol of many aspiring young mercenaries like Bo. Now in his fifties, he was a little off his prime and this was his retirement mission. While the world thought him to be a super genius, the truth was that he was only incredibly lucky. The only thing he had going for himself was his confidence. The heavens helped him, as whatever he did ended up being an earth-shattering event. To be honest, he was clueless as to how to execute the monarch of Country F. When he took up the assassinating mission, it was his first ever mission. He was a complete rookie, whereas many trained international experts had been working on the mission for months now, but were unsuccessful as he was scouring the capital city. Thinking of ways to carry out the mission an annoying falcon took off with his hat. When he was shooting at the falcon that just took off with his hat, his bullet actually hit the monarch of country F right in the nearby building. It turned out that the bulletproof window had been left open through some coincidence. Unaware, English kept chasing the falcon for his hat, not knowing he had a ton of men pursuing him. As his attention was on the falcon flying above, he accidentally entered an open manhole and hit his head hard. He was knocked out for eight hours. And by the time he woke up, his name had already spread around the world for being the greatest mercenary alive. Since that day, he had earned great respect and standing inside the mercenary community and carried three mega missions after that, all being huge success. His legacy as the supreme mercenary had been solidified and today was his last mission. Offered big bucks by the tycoon Ethan Gray, he was specially brought out by the agency along with Bo and Skyla. English immediately had a huge crush on Skyla from the moment he saw her, and it helped that she had immense respect for him. Sitting in the captain's position on the cockpit, English was looking at Skyla sneakily. The radio message had scared her. Even after all the stealth devices installed in the plane, they were still discovered. This mission became infinitely more difficult now. She silently bit her lip. Bo said, Sir, we have been discovered, what do we do now? However, English was mesmerized by the sight of Skyla biting her lip. He unconsciously pushed the steering to make the plane dip. Zoom! A missile just missed them barely as it blasted 2,000 feet above them. Skyla and Bo were shocked as Bo said, Sir, the radar showed nothing. And even in the announcement, they said that we had two minutes to comply. How did you know that there will be a non-traceable missile on us? English was dumbfounded himself. His heart pounding in his chest. His mind screaming through asterisk, 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 hell mate that was so close. He looked at his de-asterisk, asterisk, asterisk, and said thank you for saving me, little fellow. But he couldn't show those thoughts to the other two as he said, Once we were discovered there was already no turning back, Bo. It's stupid to trust the enemy enough to let us turn back. Bo nodded in understanding. Indeed, Mr. English was the greatest spy alive. He was nothing compared to him. The mission had taken a turn for the worse, as the Ambani Petroleum Mining Area was still four kilometers out. They needed to survive one more minute to bomb it successfully, and then somehow get out of the area unnoticed. Skyla became serious as he took over weapons control, and Bo went to the back, ready to drop the bombs over the mining field when needed. They both were calm despite the ugly situation, as they had absolute faith in the man handling the aircraft's control. Johnny English. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a slight deviation from the intense war arc. Also a small spoiler, English will join the elite soon. Comment how you feel about the three new characters introduced. And don't worry the next chapters will see us going back to the war arc. Before we complete this storyline too. Also I know you guys are really interested in more chapters of the war arc soon.
and knowing that Reader Ivory Pope gifted me 2,500 coins, and Reader Josiah Templeton gifted me 500 coins. It'll release a bonus for them today. Also, we are only 25 golden tickets away from a bonus. So today can also be a three chapter day, if you guys hit it. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 165 War 5. The War Arena. Virtual World. Rhino and Cola were the leaders of the tankers division inside the game. And they were the only two who were not assigned to any pillars to blow up. Their jobs was to hold the enemy. As much as possible. And it was by no means an easy job at all as currently there were about 20,000 alliance members swarming the fort. With all 10 archers already killed and the archballistes destroyed. Although the numbers seemed massive. Realistically with their backs being covered against a wall. There were only about 5-6 enemies that could attack them at any given moment. Just that even after killing those 5 or 6 enemies. Other 5 would replace them at a second's notice. Meaning that they needed to face an endless swarm of enemies. And hold out for as long as they could. Rudra was also present as he danced his way through hordes and hordes of enemies. Elven sword slicing enemies left and right as if they were made of butter. He was not overwhelmed by the massive force as he slowly but surely retreated towards the southern side of the fort, drawing in as many enemies as he could. Three minutes in, all the tankers were still alive albeit many had already taken close to 50% damage in their HP bar. Cola and Rhino, faring a little better at 65% health. Even Rudra himself found his health chipped a little, as he sat on 94% HP. However it didn't bother him, as his goal was started to be realized. In the face of such overwhelming odds, the tanks did not budge a single inch as the elite tankers held their ground strong and proud. Defensive skills were used left and right, as their superior armor and shields helped them minimize the damage they took. Four minutes in, less than 20% of their HP was remaining, but close to 75,000 had entered the fort. Their job was close to completion. However, they had not heard the sounds of cannon firing yet. They could not self-explode yet. They needed to hold on a bit more. Beach Boy along with his elite guard finally made it through the wall as he tried to act heroic, as he lead his troops to victory. He looked at the fort, and found a pitifully low amount of elites struggling for their lives. He found nothing odd about it, as he thought the majority of them had been slayed. This was a good thing, as he would have smelled the trap otherwise. He looked around as he finally found Rudra, and that's where he redirected his guard, towards Rudra. Even Rudra was at the southernmost wall at this point, as he was desperately waiting for SMG's cannon fire before he could use Blink and get out of the fort. He saw Beach Boy enter the area and instantly he felt panicked. If Beach Boy noticed the lack of elites inside the fort, he would understand that something was amiss. However, to his delight, he seemed clueless. Thank God for stupid people Rudra thought, as he continued his grueling fight against the swarm of soldiers. Pink Lotus also entered the fort, soon after Beach Boy, and started to scan the area. She looked at the few elite tankers desperately struggling, but found it odd that the other assaulters were not visible. She instantly thought about how the elites had absolutely superior warriors, like Neatwit and Karna, and how they would not fall before the tankers. Something was amiss here. But before she could voice out her concerts a loud boom was heard. Boom. 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 The sound of 50 cannons firing could be heard. Giant cannonballs hit the swarm of players trying to enter the fort. And a few even hit the northern fort wall instantly collapsing the wall, burying many alliance members. SMG was finally here. The ship was here, and the cannons were fired. Rounds were reloaded and within 10 seconds, the second volley arrived. The Alliance members turned towards the river to see a massive ship floating downstream. Its cannons pointing towards them. The large gray wolf design as its mast. The true elite's flag rising high on the ship. The ship also had four arch ballisti fitted. As swarms of arrows also graced the Alliance members, who tried to approach the ship. Scorpio was dumbfounded seeing the size of the ship. As he cursed under his breath. WTF is that thing? Why do the elites have it? Was the question on the millions of viewers' minds worldwide. A new variable had suddenly been introduced in the war. Rudra smiled. The timing was perfect. 30 seconds later, and the plan would have gotten infinitely more difficult. The tank sighed in relief. They had less than 10% HP remaining. And would have failed to hold out long enough if SMG was any later. But to their joy they carried out their parts beautifully. The guild won't lose the war because the tank division failed its job. They were proud as a big smile plastered their face. For the guild! They shouted as the first bomb went off. Boom! Quickly followed by bomb 27, as the fort started to crumple. Cola and Rhino had a big smile on their faces, as the phase 2 had succeeded. Their tanks did them proud. Rudra instantly blinked, and teleported to the beach about 40 meters away from the southern wall, 
as Fatty Kalash blew up the entire water bomb stash in the basement. Boom! A massive explosion that shook the entire war arena occurred. The explosion reaching 30 meters in height. Debris flying into the sky. Along with burned bodies of Alliance members. Scorpio and the other three guild leaders watched in horror as half their army died inside that fort. In a shocking move that Noon saw coming, the elites blew up the fort, burying somewhere north of 85,000 Alliance members, along with guild leaders Beach Boy and Pink Lotus. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for all the gifts and love you guys have shown me the last two days. I sincerely hope to give a third chapter today shall we hit the power stone slash ticket target. As we are close in both of them, hope you enjoyed the bonus. Please comment if you did forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 166 War 6 There were only 50. 000 Alliance members left alive after the fort collapsed. This happened because close to 85. 000 Alliance members died with the explosion of the fort. The Archballistes had an kill rate of 150 and about 20 were injured per minute. They ran for close to an hour. And there were 10 such Archballistes. Making the total death count under the arrows to be close to 90. 000. Also an additional 12. 000 had been injured. Also under the assault of Mediv. The bombs. The Archballistes mounted on the pirate ship. The cannons fired. The arrows shot manually by elite guild members. And the members that died under the swords and shields of the tanks. The final death toll came around 25. 000, 000 troops. The massive army of 2. 50. 000, 000 had been reduced to 50. 000. 000. The collapse of the fort was a master stroke that Noon saw coming. Around the world, people were stunned by the massive fort blowing up, killing a third of the Alliance army with it. The viewership number of the war became the highest viewed event in the history of Grey Entertainment. As 457 million people were watching the stream live, the streaming service seeing a lifetime high single day subscription count of 120 million new subscribers, just throughout the duration of the war event. And boy oh boy did it deliver far beyond all expectations beyond what anyone predicted. The elites were countering all odds to absolutely outmaneuver the alliance, wiping more than two-thirds of their force. Only about 50,000 members left standing. And to everyone around the world, this was a feat worthy of being labeled as a stroke of brilliant genius, and Rudra as a master strategist never seen before. However, the creator of the plan, Rudra, had an ugly expression on his face. According to his calculations, only when the number of the alliance members was brought at under 10, 000 was he completely confident of victory. Him only expecting 25,000 alive after the fort collapsed. But the 50,000 standing was a bucket of cold water poured on him. About 15,000 of the 50,000 left alive were injured. However, many of them were quickly regaining HP under the healing of the priests and basic HP regeneration potions. Even the elites had losses on their sides. Close to 100 elites were dead. These included the 9 tanks, 10 archers, and about 80 lifestyle players. While it never came to it, but Rudra assigned the entire lifestyle division, after building the wall and mounting the Archballistes, to go to the basement where the bombs were located and protected with their lives, while rest of the combat troops escaped to the south beach using the secret passage. The lifestyle guild stayed. They built a wall after the last player Mediv crossed the passage to the beach and stayed in the basement to guard it at all costs. Should even a single player breach the area, they were given explicit orders by Rudra to blow the structure up. While many label the lifestyle professions weak and useless in combat, it was not the case in the true elites. In this guild where everyone matters, even the lifestyle members contribute to the guild's strength, ready to die before letting the enemy pass. Fatty Kalash had indeed raised a batch of loyal and guild-centric players just like himself. Hence the odds now shifted from being overwhelmingly outnumbered to being massively outnumbered. While the world watched the nail-biting war event, the Alliance camp had a devastatingly low morale. What was supposed to be an easy war became a nightmare for them. Time and time again, they found out that the elites were five steps ahead of them the whole time. Scorpio started to quake in his boots. Goosebumps all over his skin. He was scared. Scared to lose TH war. He lacked the spine of being a leader, as he could not give a single command to his remnant army because of the sheer fear of walking into another trap set up by the elites. What if he sent the troops charging only for the beach in front to actually be a minefield? What if suddenly aircraft started to appear and nuke his army? His mind ran crazy scenarios that were impossible to happen. However, the elites did the impossible time and time again. Nothing was certain dealing with him. Should he lose this war, he would lose everything. The fear of losing everything was so great in Scorpio's heart that he could not think of any good counterattack as a leader. Not only him. 
the other three guild leaders were not faring much better. The members kept asking the command center for the next command. But the command center was deathly silent. Unbeknownst to them, the situation was similarly grim even on the elite side. As the guild members understood that the enemy numbers were far more than what phase 3 could execute, they turned to their almighty guild leader for the next command. This is where Rudra showed his true class as a master strategist. As while not everything was going to plan, he still had his men. And he still had a chance to grasp victory. It was foolish to charge into the 50,000 strong army without any real plan to duke it out man to man. The pirate ship had already sailed downriver and into the ocean. And it was impossible to row it back upstream towards the battle arena. Unless the alliance members charged towards the ship. The archballistes and cannons were useless. A deadlock ensued as none of the parties made a move while regrouping. It was at this moment at the impromptu phase 4 started a result of the reincarnation knowledge. Rudra said, Forward slash forward slash forward slash alright guys. Not everything went as planned there is trouble in the war arc. No more hidden cards. How will the elites overcome the odds? Also I have a message to convey and it's long. So please do check the comments section. Shout out to Madison Hillbach, Memorial and Ian Crystal for the 500 coin gifts. To Mystic Genius for the 1000 coin gift. And to Ivory Pope for the 2000 coin gift. Thank you so much for the patronage guys. Means a lot to me. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 167 War 7. Rudra had a strategy to win the war. However it was a very risky strategy. In his previous life. This strategy was used by a group of 100 solo adventurers to fight against an horde of 3000 men. The strategy was later called the Bow and Trishal strategy. Which was infamous because of how often it failed horrendously. The entire Bow and Trishal strategy is based on the three Trishal heads. The three heads must have absolutely strongest players holding the position, as when any one of the three Trishal heads collapsed the formation would become worthless. The Bow in the Bow and Trishal formation refer to the long-range attackers, or in this case the pirate ship docked 25 meters off the coast loaded with 50 cannons and two arch ballistas. When the enemy was in range, they would find themselves with a barrage of aerial attacks that would leave them without an answer. Also the remaining wizards, who stood right at the edge of the beach, also made up part of the bow unit. The Aswalters made up the Trishal unit. Three single lines of soldiers made up the Trishal formation. Advancing and retreating as a single unit. The distance between two lines was two meters. And the distance between those standing back to back within the same line was one meter. The idea of using the formation was to force the opposition to break their ranks and attack in undefined files. Once an attacker slips past the Trishal's head, it can instantly be dealt by player two behind him. Or player three. Four. Five. Six. The formation only worked if the tips of the Trishal worked perfectly and in sync with each other. The entire idea of the Trishal formation was to attack strategically and make the enemy bleed, while gaining a steady retreat to recuperate from injuries. Should the enemy give chase, they would find themselves under a barrage from the bow formation. With the promise of safe retreat, all they needed to do was relentlessly push and retreat while dwindling enemy numbers. The creator of this formation was a god in Indian mythology who was deemed as the god of war because of his outstanding achievements in the battlefield. And now Rudra chose to use it, making me with the rightmost tip, himself being the most important central tip and Karna being the left tip. He explained his plan to the guild, as the members gave their complete support to the idea. While the general plan was to attack and retreat, there was an underlying scheme hidden within this battle strategy. And that was Rudra's masterstroke and his great equalizer. A trap within a trap, that if executed correctly would lead to the alliance's downfall. Meanwhile at the Alliance's side of the camp, Scorpio had regained a little bit of peace of mind after he calmly assessed the war situation. They still had 50,000 people left in their corner. Although losing 200, 000 men was a tough blow to take. They still outnumbered the elites by a huge margin. Agreed they had the weird pirate ship off the coast, mounted with the despicable arrow shooting machine. However there was a limit to what it could do with such a huge distance. Also the lack of the elites taking any actions made him believe that they too were maybe out of cards. And that they can still win the war easy. The world was watching the war develop. And the 5 minute break before the climax only hyped up the audience more than they were already. Both the elites and the alliance troops saw a restructuring in formation. And seemed like a clash was imminent. Victory or defeat. It all depended on how well could Rudra lay the trap. If you are reading this book on any site except web novel you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform Web Novel. If you are looking for more latest chapters, please read the book on Web Novel. Meanwhile, the Ambani Corporation, Real World, the Secretary, 
was quaking in his boots as he saw the seething Mithun and Bonnie. Mithun and Bonnie was in a horrible mood ever since the twins took board seats in the company. Profits and sales had already seen a steep decline after the series of firings of crucial employees. However, the alliance, where he pumped too much time, money, and effort into was also currently thoroughly underperforming. Mithun and Bonnie was absolutely furious. He knew about the massive amount that Ethan Gray bet on the elites. He was desperately hoping for his money to go down the drain. But seeing the elite's performance so far, he was scared that Ethan might just make it big. He was in a bad mood. However, the secretary had an even worse news for him. A recent urgent report came in, informing him that the restricted airspace near his petroleum mine field had been infiltrated by an unknown aircraft, and all efforts to bring it down up till now had been unsuccessful. Mithun and Bonnie froze. If something were to happen to his petroleum mine, no. The very thought made his soul quake in fear. He looked up towards the heavens as he said, So you finally decide to punish me, huh? He hurriedly left watching the live stream as the petroleum field was a much, much more pressing matter. Now hopefully the joint protection of country X military and hired mercenaries should be enough to thwart the trouble. Or else. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching the golden ticket target. Good job you all. Also we are really close to hitting the 3200 PS mark. So hopefully we can have a bonus number 2 today itself. Special shout out to the noon for the 1000 coin gift. Thank you for the patronage my friend. It gave the tired me an energy boost. Also I would take this opportunity to announce that on popular demand, I have decided to make a discord server for us all to communicate and share ideas. Details to be shared soon. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 168 War 8. The elites reorganized themselves into the Trishal Formation. And started a slow march towards the enemy camp. Even after having a huge numerical superiority. The Alliance was the one who adopted the cautious attitude of wait and see. As they adopted a tight defensive formation to meet the elites. The scene was worth seeing. When seen from an aerial view it appeared as if a huge Trishal, Trident, was piercing through a sea of men. But the peculiarity of the scene lied in the three leaders. Starting from the right tip of the Trident there was Karna who had currently equipped three swords, the third one being in his mouth. Him finally revealing the special skill he picked up from the endless ocean dungeon. He had a cool and calming attitude around him that calmed the anxious assaulters behind him. He was as steady as Mount Tai, ready for everything that the enemy could throw at him. In the center point of the trident was the unfathomable guild leader Shikuni. He was the guild's heart and soul through and through. The guild members had immense faith in him and his abilities, and would never hesitate to rally under his command. In the left point of the trident, leading the charge was the leveling freak, Neatwit, a fearsome sword in his hand, glowing with black runes. It caused anyone who saw it to cower in fear. And behind these three monster players were the equally talented assaulters and assassins of the true elites. Each elite was the cream of the crop in terms of talent, and easily rivaled five normal players under normal conditions. However, with having superior equipment and skill tomes, as well as the support of the best potions available on the market to quickly replenish lost health and stamina. The whole game changed. When only about 20 meters were left between the elites and the enemy lines, Rudra made his first move. He used the Lifestyle Guild's latest product that they produced quartzy of in collaboration between the potion makers and alchemists. The Mist Potion. Five bottles of haste potions were broken and within seconds in an entire two kilometer radius. Thick fog covered the area. Nobody could see more than a meter in front of them. This is why Rid replaced the soldiers in line back to back about one meter from each other. Because that was the visibility range. Panic shouts could be heard from the Alliance army. As they kept shouting to make sure that the army was okay. Curses could be heard everywhere as the Alliance troops complained. I can't see us asterisk 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 in this thing. F asterisk 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 the elites. Always sneaky. Between those screams. The screams of Scorpio could be heard. Is everyone okay? Rudra chuckled for a bit. Before he took out the spike bomb and roughly threw it between the enemy lines. Boom! A loud explosion was heard. As screams came out from the Alliance players. The screams made the other Alliance members even more anxious as they did not understand what was going on. I? 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 TF is going on here, huh? I heard screams. Is everyone okay? Scorpio shouted. But someone shouted back if everyone was okay. Why would they shout? Dumb B.A. asterisk 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 asterisk. Scorpio was dumbfounded by the remark. As the psychological game started to work on the Alliance members. The fear of unknown thoroughly gripping them. Rudra nodded for the assassins to break formation and go. This was their chance. As he and the rest of the assault squad. Also charged in towards the enemy lines. 
The clash was on. Due to low visibility the alliance members had clubbed closer together, which left large patches of no players in the overall formation, completely crumpling its defensive capabilities. The Trident made their way carefully through enemy lines as a tough fight presented itself before the elites. Rudra, Karna and Neetwit had to take on about 5-6 players simultaneously at the head of the attack, which reduced to 2-3 for those behind him. While after member 4 in the queue, there were only stragglers to deal with. Karna's triple wielding gave him an insane edge over handling the multiple opponents. His ability to block three simultaneous sword strikes made it difficult for the opponents to chip damage him, as his brute strength and epic rated sword dealt high damage to his enemies. Karna also had his biggest advantage in his mind's eyes. While everyone else saw blurry images of their opponents, he just closed his eyes to see their every move, every feint, every muscle movement. Thank God for the fog, making it difficult to make out that his eyes were closed or else his way of fighting would have caused unstoppable waves through the forums. However, even this did not mean he was invincible. Slowly, but surely, he was accumulating damage. Rudra was faring a little worse than Karna, as not being able to see clearly, while fighting multiple opponents reduced his efficiency by a little. He was still more than holding his ground. But the chip damage he was taking was a little more than what he usually would. If you are reading this book on any site, except web novel, you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform Web Novel. If you are looking for more latest chapters, please read the book on Web Novel. Neatly was faring the worst of the three trident points. While his sword was fearsome, his overall skill, though better than the average player, was not as refined as Karna or Rudra's. He was a player in his growth phase, as every battle was a learning experience that made him better. Even though he had lost 30% of his total HP, he was starting to adapt to the fighting style, as he was taking lesser and lesser damage. The ones who were faring the best however were the assassins from the elites. They ran wild in the battlefield. With already low overall vision their stealth stat made them almost invisible to naked eye. As suddenly an alliance member would drop dead after experiencing cutthroat. The assassins were the rulers of the battlefield currently advancing and retreating out of nowhere. Even the highly protected guild leader of true Manchester. De Bruyne found himself killed by an assassin. The assassin also died. Unable to escape the guards guarding De Bruyne once found out. However, he died with a smile knowing that the trade-off was worth it. The world watched in excitement as the enveloping of the fog and the occasional screams of the dying alliance members made them extremely curious as to what was going on. In about 20 minutes of intense battle in the fog, about 50 elites and 5,000 alliance members had died. The bait had been set. Now Rudra had to reel the big fish in for the kill. Forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 1 for today. The power stone target has been hit. Sue bonus chapter 2 will be released very very soon. Also, we are only 23 tickets away from hitting the next golden ticket target hence bonus chapter 3 is also a possibility. Finally, the Discord is here pasting the link here as well as the synopsis. Do join. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash kjtrdwcw94. Shout out to Marshall Brand for the 2000 coins gift and Josiah Templeton for the 1000 coin gift. Thank you so much guys. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 169 War 9. The mist potions were starting to lose effect as little by little, the haze was starting to clear out. The elites were slowly but surely starting to be pushed back. Or so they made it seem. The elites had a battered look on their faces. And with more than 45. 000, 000 alliance members still standing. They were in an overall disadvantage. Most of the standing elites were at 50% HP or less. With only some players and assassins being above 70%. But that was because they did not engage in grueling combat. When the fog started to clear, the assassins started to lose their edge as more and more of them were caught and killed. It seemed that the elites were out of tricks, and that the tides of war were turning. Scorpio saw a glimmer of hope, as he ordered the troops to start pressing on the elites. Being pushed at a greater speed, the elites had difficulty retreating safely. The veil of the fog? Now clear enough to see 20 meters. More and more elites fell, as the enemies started to attack the tripod formation from the sides. The two files under Karna and Neatwit suffered heavy causalities. Rudra's middle file was mostly intact, but they were under a lot of pressure. The tripod started to compress, as the initial distance of one meter between members was reduced to half. Scorpio was delighted to see the elites dying one after the other, his army's numeric superiority coming to full play. Scorpio became exited as he ordered a full charge from the army. The elites looked as if they had no option left as they broke formation to desperately retreat. It was at this moment that guild leader Fernandez of original Manchester had a bad premonition in his gut. It seemed too easy. They seemed to be forgetting something. 
and indeed forgetting they were. Suddenly a wave of spells hit their front line. Boom. 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 Fireballs rained from the air. The elite's wizard unit had started to take action. The fog cleared completely, and the Alliance army had a view of what they were missing. They did not understand how in the dense fog, they had little by little moved towards the ocean, as they now realized that they were far too close. In their last moments where they had charged at the elites desperate to crumple them completely, they had covered close to 50 meters in ground, and now, they were under the range of the ship's arch ballistas. When a rain of arrows started to pour on the army, it was at that moment that they realized their mistake. It was at that moment that Scorpio knew that he f asterisk 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 up. Rain of arrows started to pierce the enemy as they scrambled in retreat. But boy oh boy how could Rudra let that happen? He quickly took out the poison mist potions and threw them deep inside the enemy lines. There was a dense layer of potion mist that broke out in the enemy's retreat path as they were left with no safe path to retreat. For a moment there, the army was utterly confused in what to do. The moment they breathed the potion, they felt weak and nauseated. But the loss of HP wasn't too much. However, the arrows of the elites were deadly. It was at this moment that Rudra also threw the paralysis most potions into enemy lines, and coupled with the wide area covered by poison mist. The 40% movement debuff of the paralysis mist had a deadly effect. Not having the courage left to cross the area of poison plus paralysis mist, the alliance members were left like lambs to slaughter. Some tried to cross the area, some tried to turn around and attack the elites. However, most were undecided and under constant shower of arrows. The eyes of the elites changed from praise to hunters, as those who tried to turn to attack them were slaughtered mercilessly. It was a tactical nightmare for the alliance. The wizards kept downing advanced mana potions, and kept up the relentless assault of AoE spells. Most injured elites got a breather, and used advanced healing potions to regain lost HP. Mediv even forked out another sea of fire, his last one possible, to lay rest to a lot of alliance members. The assassins and the wizard division of the true elites had lived up to their name, as they shined bright in this section of the war. The might of a wizard under a constant stream of mana was terrifying. However, the elites were an exception for having such an endless stream of potions for each of their wizards. By the time the poison mist cleared and a few stragglers were able to retreat, the standing army of 45. 000 was cut down to 9,247 members. 3590 of them injured and under 50% HP. To the elites having 127 members 17 on the ship and 110 on the battlefield. Excluding the 10 wizards. There were 40 assaulters and 60 assassins on the battlefield. It was at this moment that Rudra finally shifted from being the strategist to being the absolute incarnation of God of War. This was the number he was confident in dealing with. It was time to duke it out man to man. In a scene that will be remained forever etched in the memories of everyone watching worldwide forever. 110 elites charged at the retreating alliance army of 9,247 to reap their lives. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter 2 for today. Congratulations to us all. This week has been the largest collection of power stones in the history of the book. I am humbled by the support. The power stone department has commanded fourth bonus from me in seven days this week. We are very close to the golden ticket target as well. The next chapter will see the conclusion of the war. So hopefully we hit it today itself. A big shout out to the noon for the 2000 coin gift. Thank you for the motivation brother. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 170 Rudra Unleashed, War 10. A wave of emotions were surging throughout the war in Rudra's mind. Although he is proud to say that every single elite played their role and delivered what he asked from them. It was finally him who was at the center of every single phase. Responsible for every single move. Whether the guild won or lost. He was the one it affected the most. To the others the elites may lose they lose money. Maybe some respect and some treasures. But for Rudra, once the lost he would lose his dream. His dream to make the strongest guild and himself becoming the strongest guild master. In his first life, he could not do it. However rebirth, he would not let the second chance go away. All this time he was the responsible guild master, who only took calculated risks and ensured that the guild survived first. However when the number of alliance members left alive dwindled under the 10. 000 mark. He finally saw his opportunity to run wild. Why only after the enemy odds became under 10? 000? Why did he wait so much? It was because that he was now confident that the 10. 000 members could never take down the behemoth called the pirate ship and the 17 members headed by SMG ever. Even if every single one of his guild members on land now died, the elites could not lose the war. Not everyone realizes it however once the alliance army of 45. 000 hit the ocean floor and started to swim towards the pirate ship. 
there was only so much damage the arrows and cannons could do to 45. 000, 000, 000 players underwater. Even if 70% of them are shot down, it would still be thousands of members boarding the pirate ship of 17 and attacking it. Victory was not certain. But with less than 9,247 men, that Rudra and the assaulters would definitely thin out to even lower numbers. He was sure that the ship could no longer be taken down and that victory was bagged. Every single member followed his charge. The 100 combat troops and even the 10 wizards charged towards the retreating alliance army. For anyone who was not familiar with the war scene and who switched on the television just now, this scene would look ridiculous. But to those who were watching this since a long time, their blood pumped at how the tables had turned. Rudra close to the enemy lines, leaped in the air, and landed in the middle of the enemy lines with a strong skill earthquake. Boom! The ground shook upon impact when the Elven Sword came in contact with the ground. The shockwaves knocking everyone around him down. Slash! 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 Before they even had chance to regain their posture. Six Alliance members were dead just like that. The surrounding Alliance members looked at Rudra in fear. And rightly so as at that moment when they looked in his eyes. They didn't see a human. They saw the goddamn demon of Death Valley, and he was unleashed. Up till this point Rudra had not used a single of his skill in combat. However it all changed now. Skill after skill was used as for the first time since getting the skill for a long time. Rudra used Berserk. Rudra's strength experienced an explosive increase as he became a one-man slaughter machine, running through opposition as if they were dirt. Every single one of the elites was doing well, as they fought the enemies through zeal and grit. Neatwit, and Karna standing out the most as even they were walking massacre machines. However Rudra was just on another level currently. As he was literally unparalleled in the battlefield. Nobody could even touch him. Rudra was weaving such powerful yet nimble moves. It was almost as if he was performing a dance. A dance of death. As countless enemies were teleported out of the battlefield under his sword. Unbeknownst to Rudra. Who had already entered the zone of absolute focus. The elven sword had started to buzz in his hands. It grew hot and there seemed to be a qualitative change in the blade. The original silver appearance of the blade began to change towards a faint white glow, as a system notification brought Rudra's attention to what was occurring. System notification. The elven sword has recognized your skill as a swordsman worthy of using its power. It has recognized you as its master. The sword's full features are now available to you. The elven sword had recognized Rudra. Elven sword, semi-legendary, a sword of the highest grade made by the elves. It is light, and contains an inbuilt power to fight creatures of darkness. Inscribed with the finest runes it contains a sword heart, and will only show its true potential when it chooses a master. Current chosen master, Shikuni One Knight. Effect 1. Can damage all darkness aligned monsters, including formless monsters, like ghosts and spirits. Effect 2. 10. 000, 000 cuts. Use the sword to unleash a terrifying 10. 000, 000 cuts on one enemy. Or a cut on 10,000 enemies. Effect 3. World Slash Skill One of the ultimate skills of the Elven Sword. Unleash one slash that contains 400% your max power. Effect 4. Upgrade to Legendary Grade to unlock. Restriction 1. Righteous Faction. Restriction 2. Knight Class. Rudra was pleasantly surprised to see the insanely overpowered skills that came with the sword acknowledging him as its master. As he tested the skill 10. 000, 000 cuts. The air suddenly changed around him as countless wind blades started to appear. 10. 5 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 blades appeared, looking like 10. 0 0 0 elven swords. And with a move of Rudra's arm, descended on the Alliance army. To the millions watching worldwide, this was an earth-shattering moment as Rudra showed a skill far beyond what any knight or swordsman in the game could do. It was a sword skill. That had a deadly AoE effect. Every single Alliance member alive felt the strike and many who had low HP were tipped over the death line as they were killed by the move. However to their worst nightmare Rudra did not stop even after the move, as like a grim reaper who did not rest. He kept running through enemy lines, and somehow he had become even more fierce. After Elven Sword recognized Rudra as its master, it was lighter and easier to maneuver. Also the damage had increased by more than two times. If previously using it was like cutting through butter, now it felt like swinging it in air. With the full capabilities of a semi-legendary weapon, he was a war god incarnation on the battlefield. Scorpio was deep in despair as he tried to somehow turn the tides around. The three elites, Rudra, Karna, and Nitwe were absolutely decimating his army. Scorpio shouted towards his army pointing at Rudra saying, Stop him! 
However, that was the worst mistake he could have made. His shout brought Ritter's attention to him. As the demon's gaze met with his, Scorpio felt goosebumps all over his body. And somehow his throat went dry and his legs went limp when Ridra looked at him. Ridra pointed his sword towards Scorpio and a small lightning sparked in his eyes as he used his skill Thunder Blast. Boom! A huge bolt of lightning hit Scorpio, who was immediately sent to the afterlife. The Alliance army leader was dead. Dead under a single attack from Rudra. Millions of viewers worldwide were shocked. First the 10. 000, zero, zero swords, and now the lightning blast. What was up with the insane skills of the true elite's guild master? The only standing Alliance guild leader left was the guild leader of musicians in true rhythm. However, his charisma was not enough to command the Alliance army as every soldier started to act according to their own wits. The elite side were not without its losses. The 10 wizards and 52 of the 60 assassins were dead, along with 22 assaulters. 88 of the 110 members on the land were dead, leaving only 22 members alive, except Karna, Ridra and Neatwit. The others were left with under 30% HP, as the battle against so many alliance members was taxing at their health. However, the three slaughter machines were unstoppable, as they left Carnage on the Alliance army wherever they went. Very soon, Karna killed the last standing Alliance guild leader True Rhythm. As the Alliance army was left without a leader, it was only a matter of time before the rest of the Alliance army crumpled after that. As 10 minutes later only 100 Alliance members were left standing against three true elites. Karna and Neetwit were panting heavily both having less than 10% HP. However there stood Rudra as calm as Mount Tai with them. His breathing easy and his HP over 60% as he looked coldly towards the remaining enemies. The three had a combined kill count of 6,200 Alliance members in the last charge with Rudra alone killing over 3,700 and the other two sharing the remaining kill count. Even though their kill counts were beyond monstrous, they were not in the same realm as Rudia. The two of them realized the beast that the guild master was in this phase of the exchange, as the difference in their skills was openly evident. They had immense fear and respect for him at the same time. When they looked into the cold eyes of the guild master, they realized that they would never want to be on the other side of these eyes. Victory was in sight. The impossible was almost made possible. Neatwit and Karna could feel the impending victory in their blood. As they were eager to rush into the remaining enemy lines, they were only waiting for Rudra to give the last command. It was at this moment that Rudra gave his real war speech that he didn't want to give at the start of the war. He said, To the millions watching worldwide, let this serve as the warning to you. The elites are the best guild out there. No matter what you throw at us. No matter how few we are. Go against us and you will be crushed. Each and every elite is worth a thousand of your troop. However like those who perish today. If you are foolish enough to cross paths with us. Then. Rudra used his ultimate move. He used the world slash. As a terrifyingly powerful slash. That could slash mountains in half was released. 100 men were slayed through critical hits all at once. Without even a single chance to counter as the outcome that Noon expected in their wildest dreams became a reality. System notification. The winners of this war. The true elites killed. Congratulations to the winners. Forward slash forward slash forward slash longest chapter in the history of the book. Hope you guys enjoyed it. This concludes the week-long war arc. It was the longest battle sequence I have written yet. And a lot of planning went into it. And the positive response has been gratifying. I thoroughly loved writing the arc and hope you guys did too. Cheers guys. Congratulations to everyone on the Elite's win. Come celebrate by joining the Discord. Link in synopsis. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 171 Aftermath. The Elites had won. Being outnumbered 500 to 1, they still managed to topple the Alliance. And this event had shook the entire population playing the game. It was the hottest and most wildly discussed topic worldwide and had taken everybody by storm. The first and the biggest ramification of losing the war for the Alliance was surrendering 90% of their guild's resources to the true elites, along with 100 000 members that would serve the guild for three years as war indemnity. Although the elites were rich, 90% of the wealth from six first-rate guilds was still a huge amount. The guild received close to 700 million gold in assets. Although a large part of it was in form of items and precious materials, it was still a huge amount. Rudra, after spending money like crazy acquiring lots of properties in the city, left the guild's finances in a little bit of cash flow crunch. However, with this new influx, they were again the titans of the city filled with overflowing wealth. Also, apparently Ethan Gray, happy with the performance of every single elite, gifted each guild member a sum of $10 million in performance bonus, spending $5.5 billion in bonuses. 
The guild members were naturally overjoyed by the income, as their impression of Ethan Gray improved immensely. However, Rudra knew that the man had earned a whopping $3.2 trillion this time from the war. Five billion was not even a drop in the bucket to him. Ethan Gray was naturally overjoyed by the outcome. As he showered Rudra's house with presents and expensive items. Knowing Rudra, he knew that his direct offer for money would be rejected. Hence, he sent gifts to Mr. and Mrs. Rajput and Little Max. Sue that Rudra had no choice but accept it. After the war, Rudra decided to just spend a good day away from the game and with family, as he hoped to recover from the mental fatigue. However, a lot happened in the game in the 15 hours he didn't log in. The forums had erupted. The clips of key scenes of the war had already gone viral, some getting even 1 billion views. Rudra was named as the master strategist and countless experts who analyzed the war showered him with praise in devising such ingenious strategy. There were naturally a lot of hate circulating regarding the alliance as the world deemed them as trash. 250. Zero, zero, zero men could not topple 600? What kind of a joke was that? Naturally, all those who bet money on them winning lost big time. And those who bet on the elite struck gold. However, those who lost their money had only two places to vent their frustration. One was the forums, where they absolutely slandered the hell out of the alliance, and the second was the news and media channels that predicted a confident alliance win. The expert who had just barely regained his hair, had watched the war with a pale expression on his face. When the fort blew up and half of the Alliance army was taken along with the explosion, he had a really bad feeling. He touched his precious hair. He realized he may not be able to touch it anymore. He was cowering in his boots when he had to go live. But as he was under the company's contract, he had no choice but to go live. He could not even speak a single word as just as his face popped up. The text channel was written with all sorts of profanities and insults. Why do you still have hair? Shave it now. I lost $2,000 because of you. I will never forgive you, Baldy. The live telecast went even more downhill for the expert when the news announcer decided to absolutely humiliate him live. The announcer asked, Sir, how does it feel to have made such a gross mistake in analyzing the true elite strength? The expert had a dark look on his face. He was furious inside, but he had no words left to refute. The elite's winning was nearly impossible. He was not giving false advices. What the elites pulled off was simply out of this world. However, such excuses won't work. He said, Noon could have predicted that the war would progress this way. The common people became furious. As the insults became even more profane. That's what they pay you for. Baldy, what's the point of you being an expert? If you can't predict it, die you hashtag and and. The announcer also did let him off as she asked. Then what's your credentials as a gaming expert if you can't predict it? Aren't you just a senile old man pretending to be wise? The insult destroyed the expert's morale. He wanted to weep but tears wouldn't come. He was not wrong in his prediction. However, Noon was patient enough to understand that. Also, it was his own fault for underestimating the elites. That guild wasn't the average, Joe. It lived up to its name. Then on live TV, he was shaved clean off his hair and even had his eyebrows waxed. The already slightly obese man looked like a big potato without any facial hair. Ugly potato. Ugly ball potato. Trash and stale ball potato. Idiot ball potato. It was safe to say that the expert had the worst day of his life today. Another event that happened worldwide was that the true elites were stopped being classified as a first-rate guild or small guild or whatever power level the people associated them with. They were simply an anomaly in everyone's books. When it came to the elites, no common sense applied and there were no rules. Their strength was placed at comparable to first-rate guilds. However, they were considered a wildcard group and many wanted to befriend this group, especially for their technologies. The elite's lifestyle had caught the eye of everyone worldwide. The presence of the reinforced wall technology to the deadly arch ballistas, the pirate ship, the cannons, the weird alchemic products. The world wanted those secrets. Everyone wanted to build a trading and working relationship with the elites. Presents were showered every day in their guild hall, from guilds even across the continents. Rudra ignored most of them. But the presents from the super guilds could not be ignored, each being unique and very valuable. The super guilds had taken notice of the elites. While it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, it wasn't good either. Rudra knew that it was still very premature for him to even think about the super guilds. However, one super guild had been affected greatly by this war. And that was the super guild backed by Mithunambani. The reveal of his name and affiliation to the alliance had brewed an unstoppable storm. The world was hungry for such gossip. And Bonnie had a huge frown on his face when the assured victory plan of the alliance to crush the elites failed so miserably. 
However, little did he know that his bad day was about to get a whole lot worse. Forward slash forward slash forward slash the chapter work count exceeded 2,400 words total. So I decided to break it into two parts. Hope you enjoy. The targets for this month are the same as the previous one. One bonus chapter for every 100 golden tickets and 800 PS. Special shout out to the top fan and number one golden ticket donator. The Emperor of Hazel Groove Cervantes 91 for the 2000 coin gift. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 172 Aftermath 2. The True Elite's Guild Hall was filled with energy and enthusiasm. They did it. They actually did it. The atmosphere was as lively as it could be as everyone complimented each other on a job well done. The departments all saw each other's heroic moments on replay and teased each other on their job well done. The most famous of them all was Mediv. His sea of fire earned him the title of Inferno Mage, as everyone would bow wherever he went as a joke. Neatwig was also, for the first time in a rare occasion, present for the festivities and not off leveling, as he and his sister Naomi enjoyed the lively atmosphere. To the duo who always led a secluded and hidden life, the guild's atmosphere was heartwarming, and somehow it felt like home. Naomi had no combat prowess being a priest. She was as weak as the lot came, as she and the other priests hardly had any role in the war as they were quickly evacuated to the ship with SMG. Even still, she was welcomed everywhere she went as the elites had absolutely no discrimination amongst members. Everyone being worthy of joining the guild was the best of the best and deserved respect. It was at this point that two men slowly entered the guild hall. Everyone turned their heads to see them, and immediately the crowd broke out in cheers. It was the guild master and vice guild master. Rudra and Karna walked in each having a shoulder draped over the other in a brotherly display of affection. Rivera took the stage as he looked across the room. Even through all the coursing excitement, the room instantly became quiet. The guild leader was about to speak. Rivera said, The world feels surprised that the elites won. However, let me be clear. It was not luck. It was not unexpected. I fuck asterisk 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 told you guys we will win. Defeat was never an option. We were always going to win. Cheers broke out in the room. Poison Toad Gamakichi shouted, That's right, boss. We crushed them. More cheers were heard in the room. Rivera raised his hand, and silence ensued. He said, As winners we have earned the right to celebrate. Today we have gained gold. Cheers. We have earned fame. More cheers. And we have got 100. 000, 000 Alliance members to work under US. Deafening cheers broke out in the room. Oh yes. Starting today, we have True Elite Service Guild established, where we have gained 100. 000, 000 subordinates. They will have no choice but to carry out our explicit orders for the duration of the contract. Those who pointed their swords at us yesterday will now clean our feet. Let me be clear here, ladies and gentlemen. We elites have a baseline. That we will not humiliate them. Demoralize them. Or abuse our power over them. However, except that. We shall work them to the bone. The true elites farming program will be initiated where every elite who is not farming EXP will have a team of alliance members doing it for them. You shall join the party and do your chores. While they shall do the farming. Want to hang out in the guild? While they farm EXP? Why not? Want to go shopping in the market while they farm EXP? Why not? They dared to mess with us. Now they shall pay. Ridra voiced his thoughts out loud. And although it was very unfair terms to the Alliance members. Beggars can't be choosers, can they? The Alliance was officially crumpled. 100. 000, 000 members went under Ridra. 100. 000, 000 members were under military service for the Empire. The remaining members either quit the guild or became rogue under the payroll. The once glorious accumulation of seven first-rate guilds in Hazelgrove Kingdom was reduced to such a pitiful state after messing with the elites. The elites' prestige was set in stone after the war as they were named the unofficial number one guild of the kingdom. Although there were other first-rate guilds in other cities left, the elites defeating six of them at once made them the number one overall. Purple Haze City became very chaotic after the downfall of the six first-rate guilds, as second-rate guilds seized the opportunity to promote themselves to first-rate guilds and grow. The areas dominated in the outer district by alliance players were now changed owners, as second- and third-rate guilds divided it amongst themselves. Another big event that became a hot topic recently was that the guild leader of Azure Lotus Guild dissolved the guild and joined the true elites following the fall of alliance. She along with core members Green Lotus, Blue Lotus, Yellow Lotus, Red Lotus and White Lotus. All became true elites, while Ridra gave them permission to join the guild. Their main role was to become a bridge between the service guild and the main guild. Ridra only brought them in in a management capacity, 
and would not take them on dungeon runs or leveling. It was only because of Yua that he let them join anyway. Daily visits from various guild masters and major corporations became a routine at the elite's guild hall. As everyone hoped for a cooperation, River though entertained them all. Accepted none of the offers. He had no intention of selling any of his technologies to anyone. However, what he did do was cleverly reaching agreements on selling potions at 50% the market price. This deal exited many guilds, which extended olive branches to Rudra and the elites. Should they know that the elites actually used the chalice of purity to just upgrade the basic potions to advanced ones of highest grade? They would vomit blood realizing the profit margin they made. However, they were unaware. Hence mistook Rudra's business move as a way to make friends with genuine intentions. The days started to pass quickly as the war slowly started to fade out from people's memories. And new events took up the forums. Though not as busy as before the war, Rudra already started laying the foundation for the next mission, which was to become the overlords of Purple Haze City. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the PS target. Congratulations you all. We are also very close in the golden ticket department so I hope we also reach that soon. Special shout out to my friend Madison Hillbach for the 500 coin gift. Thank you for the patronage forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 173 Johnny English Strikes Again There were seven homing missiles currently inbound for the aircraft that Johnny and crew were in. Skyla deployed the flares to redirect the heat seekers, and four of the seven heat seekers missed the mark. Johnny was terrified inside. The sound of missiles exploding made him want to wet his pants. However, in the Himalayas, he had learned about a technique to numb his senses. Also repeated kicks to his manhood had made his control over the bladder at superhuman levels. Johnny used the technique as he hit pressure points in his arms to numb himself. He lost 70 of his motor nerve coordination at that point, as only his brain functioned at full capacity. Johnny leaned back in his seat and relaxed, his arms pulling the steering causing the aircraft to move upwards towards space. The aircraft was quickly gaining altitude and alarms started to ring in the cockpit. Skyla and Bo were buckled up for impending impact however an unexpected event occurred. As the aircraft gained altitude it became frosted due to the drop in temperature. At very high altitudes where the oxygen levels were very low, the jet lost its fuel for combustion as the engine stopped. The acceleration of the jet stopped at that point, and its speed started to reduce. Both thought that's it we are done. However to their surprise, the missiles suddenly changed course and attacked each other rather than the jet. This was because the jet lost its heat signature with the freeze of the space. But the missiles were still hot. They averted danger and started a free fall. English was not as worried about going up. However, going down, he had a weird feeling in his stomach. He felt like kids fell on swings. A ticklish feeling in the stomach. That makes you laugh. While Bo and Skyla were worried for their lives, English was laughing through the crisis. He put both his arms on his stomach as he could not stop laughing. After a while his eyes became teary and he could not see anything. Trying desperately to get hold of the steering, he accidentally pressed the buttons on it. The aircraft's flaps opened and their speed of descent reduced. The ship turned from a block of ice to a ball of fire within two minutes. The flaps broke away under the intense heat and air resistance. However, the engine heated up again. When English pressed the ignition, the engine roared back to life and plunged the plane into an even faster descent. This was a blessing in disguise, as about 20 missiles were headed their way and only missed because English suddenly accelerated. However, they were hot on his tail now. English had been feeling ticklish in his stomach for a long time now. And because of it, he felt like he wanted to take a dump. However, he could not do it in this aircraft with Skyla and Bo watching. Neither could he let himself sh asterisk asterisk his pants. Hence clenching his stomach muscles, he pulled the steering towards himself with all might. The plane stabilized about 20 feet above shockingly the Ambani oil field and the heat seekers came crashing in towards the minefield. Boom! 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 The petroleum mine was bombarded with missiles. The petroleum mine catching fire and causing an even larger chain explosion. Boom! The petroleum mine exploded to smithereens as English's plane maneuvered through all the explosions. Bo and Skyla were sick and started to vomit because of the turbulent flight. However, they were shocked at how amazingly well English handled the mission. His insight, his strategy, his execution, everything was flawless. Bo was awestruck by English. He looked with shiny eyes towards English. This is what he aspired to be. Skyla wiped her mouth as she said, That was dangerous English. But Johnny English just laughed as he said, I laugh in the face of danger. Bo and Skyla were awestruck by the image of Johnny laughing as they recalled him laughing when they experienced freefall. In that dangerous situation where they feared their lives, English laughed as he completed the mission. 
Their mission was indeed completed, and by English alone at that. They were nothing more than useless bystanders as English did everything. However, not once did English mention that fact. He just looked calm and cool through it all. Skyla and Bo realized at that moment that this was English's retirement mission, and that he would leave the mercenary world after this. Although it was their first mission with him, they realized his worth, and the quality he brought to the table. He was the greatest mercenary there was, and having him on the team made any mission possible. Johnny himself was feeling overwhelmed, as while he looked serene and calm on the outside. Inside, he was just thanking God for saving his life. He had already said his last prayers when the flaps broke off. He remembered his guru in the Himalayas the senile old man who would kick his balls. The brothers with whom he would pull rocks tied to his manhood. The bald monks with whom he would spar with and get beat up every day. He bid them all farewell in his mind. But somehow he survived. His numbing method helped him maintain a calm expression that hid his overwhelmed expression. However, he was very overwhelmed in reality. The mission was completed and the crew safely flew away in stealth. However, the aftermath of their actions was earth-shattering. Ethan Gray and Mithun and Bonnie both received news of the incident. While one was on cloud nine, the other was shocked into depression. The aftermath of Johnny English's actions was sure to be widespread. The news that Johnny completed his final mission successfully spread, and his name as the greatest mercenary was solidified. The entire mercenary school held a party for its most successful alumni, completing his last mission, as they proudly presented him as a part of their school. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys sorry for the late chapter. I have been re-uploading edited chapters of my old work. Chapter 130 have been edited and re-uploaded without errors. For anyone willing to give the book a reread that will help. Also please feel free to point out any mistakes left in the draft. Have installed a new app for Grammar 2 hints, you will find improved story quality going forward. Big shout out to Ivory Pope for the 2000 coin gift. Patrons like you are why I strive to improve my craft. Thank you. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 174 Terrifying Ethan Gray. World News quickly covered the shocking explosion of the Ambani Petroleum Mine. As the stock market of Country X suffered a crash the following day. There was no question about it. Mithun Ambani single-handedly drove close to 30% of the country's economy. Directly or indirectly. The country was completely dependent on the Ambani Corporation to provide for petrol, diesel and other petroleum products and the explosion of the entire mine saw the prices of petrol skyrocket as there was a huge demand to a non-existent supply. Riots broke out on the country's streets as the military had to be involved to invoke martial law. Ambani Corporation was the core of various small and big businesses and as the Ivesters madly betoned to withdraw money, the stock market suffered a complete crash the next day. Country X went into recession as millions of people lost their jobs overnight. And food prices climbed to never-before-seen heights. The rich started to hoard supplies, and the poor began to steal for survival. The common people suffered the most between the fight amongst trillionaires. However, the winner of this bout was undoubtedly Ethan Gray, spending $200 billion in relief funds for whoever needed it in Country X. He became a kind-hearted philanthropist and hero in their hearts. The one who caused the incidents saw a surge of rising support. Whereas the one who suffered the incidents only faced more and more misery. The government who would always bow out to Methine and Bonnie and respect his decisions always carried out a number of raids after being bribed by Ethan seizing a lot of land from Methine and Bonnie, which was quickly bought by Ethan Gray at a dirt cheap price. Ethan spent close to $2 trillion in a time span of three days that Mbani needed to stabilize his company to gain deep roots in Country X. The hungry wolf Ethan Gray was back in the hunt as he bit a big piece off the Mbani Corporation. Mbani in a desperate situation to keep his company assets intact had to sell close to 13% of his shares, of which 11% were bought by Ethan Gray for about $1 trillion through various trusts and charities. He gained a seat on the board of directors for Ambani Corporation alongside Naomi and Neat Witt. The three of them now controlled 31% of the company, while Ambani had 47%, his other son having six, while his daughter and wife together having another six. And about 10% shares were held by outside investors and common people. Should Ethan get control of the 10% shares floating in the market, and then somehow get his son to his side, he would gain control over the company. Mithun and Bonnie diluting himself below 51% equity would turn out to be his doom. All this Ethan managed without taking out a single penny from the existing Gray International cycle. Only through the winning amount of $3.2 trillion of the bet did he achieve everything. Rudra had brought him a wave of good luck. Apart from incredible money and good marketing, he also brought Naomi and Neat Wit. Rudra was monumental in his advances over the Ambani Empire, and Ethan acknowledged that. 
Meeting Ridra was his biggest fortune. Except for his reincarnation. Ethan had no complaints with Ridra. The man delivered on his word and was not greedy. He was a genuine fellow who could be trusted. Undoubtedly smart and scheming. Yet had a gentle and innocent side to him shown to those he considered close. At first Ridra was just an employee. Then he became a partner. But recently even the ice-cold Ethan Gray melted. As he felt warm towards the guy. Genuinely considering him to be a brother. Then there was the man of the hour. Johnny English. The mercenary of the century and his two team members who successfully completed his impossible mission. Wanted by the world they were currently given shelter in the upside. While Johnny planned to permanently stay at the place. Skyla and Bo only wanted to lay low for a while. Naturally all three were given the best of the best villas and treatment inside Upside. Where not even a fly could harm them. The Upside was Ethan Gray's greatest creation. Undoubtedly his decision to make the place and have all of his company's best talents gathered here was a brilliant move. While giving them a great quality of life. He also made them feel at home and indebted to the company. Their natural sense of returning to the place they belong tripled his profits yearly and it was a voluntary service at that. The sense of security was the second biggest reason. No one could touch them in the upside. No one could approach them to poach and there was no chance of spying or defecting. It was a master stroke on his part. He spent an evening with a trio to show his gratitude and to be acquainted with Johnny English when he found out that all three of them played Omega. He asked if they wanted to join one of his two guilds jokingly. However seeing Johnny showing intention of joining true elites. He instantly contacted Ridra. Ridra was given a background about the three and especially a lengthy one about English. Ridra was genuinely shocked as he not only immediately agreed to recruit all three of them. He even instantly promised to make English an elder. Ridra drooled at the thought of having such an godly individual join his guild. As he hoped of making Johnny the guild elder who could train and guide the younger generation and to his joy Johnny agreed. However, the real reason behind Johnny choosing to join the elites was that he just found it convenient. Now that he was retired and living in the upside, the guild with a massive headquarters there would give him activity to do. Also since the guild was so small, it would mean he would have great influence in it, yet never be overwhelmed with people. Skyla and Bo following English also decided to join the elites. But the biggest surprise came when English chose to bring his friend along with him to the guild. His friend was a monk from the Himalayas, a fellow disciple with whom he trained. The first disciple of the sect he learned in and his senior brother. Rudra immediately recognized the player with Johnny, as he was one of the most legendary players in his past life. The ultimate support player. The player who even without any actual combat skills would be the most valued player in any guild he would walk into. His name was Yum. But he was well known as the monk across the game for his way of dressing and his attitude. He was a special player in the game who was bound to a special semi-legendary grade item called the Collector of Yin and Yang. The object gave him the ability to debuff the enemies by stealing stamina, HP, mana, and agility from the enemy and buff the allies on the same stats. It had a 2 kilometers effect range and was a one-of-a-kind object in the game. The only downside of having the object was that it made you lose all combat ability. You could only have one combat skill if you chose to bound with the item. The monk had chosen to bind with it. Only having hand-to-hand -hand combat as a chosen offensive skill. Even then his collector of yin and yang. Made him the most sought after member in any party and the ultimate support player. Rudra could not believe his luck when the guy joined his guild. If only he would have the same object and skill in this life too. He would be an invaluable addition to the guild. Hence it was on this day that four new players joined the true elites guild. All of them first rate experts. The guild strength had increased by a lot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash three important announcements guys. 1. Chapter 174 have been re-edited and are now free of grammatical errors. So for anyone wishing to give the book a re-read now is a good time. And chapter 75 150 would be done by tomorrow. 2. Starting from October 1st. New privilege tier settings would apply. First tier would be 1 coin. Sneak peek 2 chapters in advance. Second tier would be 99 coins. Third tier would be 199 coins. Fourth tier would be 299 coins. So save your coins accordingly. 3. New cover for novel is being worked on. Will be uploaded before October 1st. I am completely revamping the novel. And making it an actual top quality book which can do well in WSA. I have worked hard to overcome everything that's wrong with the novel. But it has taken time and effort. Also I am overwhelmed with re-editing chapters, so may not be able to give bonus chapters till the first. I beg your understanding regarding the matter. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 175 Yua meets Naomi. The Nakatomi Tower. Country J. 
Mr. Nakatomi lost a huge chunk of money with the alliance's defeat. The company saw a huge share price fall as the company was projected to have the worst quarter since its inception. What's more, was that the kid he considered to be interesting, yet not worth helping was now a giant whose net worth was more than the entire Nakatomi Corporation. Mr. Nakatomi knew that Yua harbored some feelings for Ridra, albeit friendly ones. The kid was not worthy of his daughter before. He was a nobody. Just a gamer with talents. However, now he has the backing of the titan Ethan Gray and is the guild master of the best guild in Hazel Groove Kingdom. Now he was worthy of his daughter. Or at least that's how he judged him to be. He called you over. She was very upset with her father. She had repeatedly shown intent to leave the alliance. However, her father had rejected the idea strongly. Now she along with her guild had sunken along with the alliance boat. She went from a guild master of a first-rate guild to an ordinary member in another guild. However, joining Ridra's guild was not the issue here. She was happy to join the true elites. It was because she had started to feel as if Ridra had became cold to her. They did not have the same warmth and friendship that they used to. Also, she noticed a new girl in the elite's roster, a girl named Naomi. She was like a flower in the guild adored by everyone, who was also very friendly with Ridra. She felt jealous when she saw her being all friendly with Ridra, and had a vivid memory of her appearance. She felt threatened by that girl. And it was the first time in her life that she felt such a feeling. She was a princess and boys flocked around her for her attention all her life. Yet Ridra was the first guy she was a bit attracted to. However, he was so friendly with another girl who was also very pretty. That made her insecure and jealous. When her father called her in to have a conversation, she was in a really bad mood. However, when he expressed his approval regarding her pursuing Ridra should she choose to do so, she became very happy. True Elite's Headquarters, Purple Haze City, Hazel Groove Kingdom. Yua actively looked for Rudra in the headquarters and found him chatting with Neatwit and Karna. She confidently approached him. The trio stopped their conversation and looked at her. She said, Now that I am part of the guild, I wish to contribute to the guild with the best of my abilities. Hence, I just wanted to let you elders know that I am ready for any tasks you give me. Karna and Neatwit looked towards Rudra, who chuckled. The true elites were not like most guilds. The guild members had complete freedom. It was rare for quests to be issued even once in two weeks. There was no plan. Everyone did whatever they wanted most of the time. The only time the guild came together was during the dungeon runs or war. Maybe smaller groups were made for leveling. The service guild had already been entrusted as the farming core of the guild and instructed to gather resources deemed important by Ridra. Ridra started to stockpile important resources that the guild would need on upcoming dungeons. Having 100, 000 members to farm resources and EXP for guild members helped a lot. As the main guild members gained levels like crazy, huge chunks of EXP would be added every day even when they were not out leveling themselves. Rudra said, Um, there is nothing to do. The guild doesn't have many stringent rules. You are free to do as you please. You would dislike that answer. She wanted to show her worth by completing tasks and getting Rudra to warm up to her again. It was at that point that Naomi came over and curiously looked towards Pink Lotus. Her woman instincts told her that the girl did not like her. However, she wondered why. Neatwit asked Naomi, Why are you here? Naomi smiled saying, Brother, I need help with a quest. Can one of you three strong assaulters help me? Yua frowned. The girl was Neatwit's sister. No wonder they both looked so similar, and the girl was so loved in the guild. Karna said, I'm sorry, but I need to log out of the game. I have been playing for 40 hours straight now and need some rest. Rudra did not mind helping Naomi however he had to stay in the guild to welcome the four new players who could be coming anytime now. Neathwit felt like helping with quests was a waste of time and he would much rather level up. However, he could not give that answer to his sister. Hence he said, You can go with Pink Lotus. She is a great player. Also you can become good friends. Yua thought it was a good chance to get to know her opponent and readily agreed. Naomi having no choice also agreed to the proposition. The two shook hands and introduced each other. Hey I am Naomi. You and Nakatomi. It looked amiable on the surface however. It was in fact a real life version of the famous anime scene where lasers would shoot out of girls eyes in a glaring contest. Both of them realized that the amiability shown on the surface was just a facade and they did not get along well at all. The two left. Maintaining the facade and chatting amiably. And the three boys were none the wiser. Little did they know that while they were gone fighting. The real beauty of the guild made her debut in all the male members' hearts. Skyla, Bo, Johnny English and Yum had just joined the guild. 
forward slash forward slash forward slash I did not intend to release a bonus today as I am working on it for the October 1st privileged tier upgrade. However, I did not have the heart to not do it. So here's a bonus. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 176 Johnny English Enyum Johnny English was a heavenly lucky figure in real life. Everything worked out for him in the end. Whatever he did wrong would become right. However, in Omega, there was nobody who was unluckier than English. He literally got the title of Carrier of Disasters upon joining the game. Player name, Johnny English. Title, Carrier of Disasters. Class, Thief. Subclass, Blacksmith. LDL, 45. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 270 VIT, 270. Int, 280 STA, 270. PHY, 250. HP, 29. 000 29. 000. Unassigned stat points, 16. Hidden stats. Luck, 95 out of 100. You bring disasters wherever you go. Charm, 20. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, common armor set, LV40. Strong shoulder guards, common. Strong shin guards, common. Strong helmet, common. True elite skilled rope. Weapons, cane sword, epic. Common bow. Quiver of arrows. Assassin's daggers, bronze. Small axe, bronze. Skills, hand to hand combat. Defense break. Energy slash. High knee. Ball breaker. Class specific skills, heightened battle sense. Stealth. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, none. Johnny played the thief class in game. He chose the class as he felt that it was a good fit for him. However, the moment he made his character, things started to go south. He got a notification telling him that he got a title upon joining the game. And that title was Carrier of Disasters. Carrier of Disasters title forced? You are the most unlucky player in the game. Your presence enough is enough to make all plans go wrong. Effect. You will bring disasters wherever you go. You shall have. 0.5x bad luck to allies. 2x bad luck to opponents. In a 2 kilometers radius. The multiplier works according to the value of your negative luck stat. Restrictions. Cannot be unequipped. Or swapped with another title. Johnny had a whopping 95 luck stat. Hence his presence was like a walking disaster. Normal players like Ridra having 30-50 luck stat. If open a treasure chest with Johnny around, they would get the worst possible loot. This is because 0.5 asterisk 95 would mean 47 in luck stat. However this curse was also a blessing in disguise. Johnny had a 2x bad luck multiplier on enemies. Hence his presence would be enough to cause all sorts of disasters to the enemies. 190 luck would mean that when enemies enter Johnny's 2 kilometers radius of effect they would experience all sorts of problems. Archers would miss majority of their shots. Wizards chants and spells would be unexpectedly be disrupted. Those who would be attacked would experience more critical hits. Nobody knew for sure how exactly the luck stat worked in game. Its obvious effects were seen while opening crates and monster drops. However there were sure to be other mysterious effects that nobody knew for sure. Johnny only had common and bronze ranked equipments for most part as he would always get the worst possible drops. However, he still managed to get an epic rated item. This was because he opened a guaranteed chest that dropped anywhere between an epic and legendary grade item. And his bad luck meant it was ensured that the drop that came out would be epic rated. And it was indeed epic rated and a sword at that. For a thief like him, it was safe to say that except for Karna, Johnny's presence would drown anyone in misfortune. Johnny also brought his senior brother to the guild. Him and Yum trained under the same master in the Himalayas, and had went through a lot together. Their bond was unshakable. And their taste in women was alike. Yum was a perverse man. But his monk-like personality made it hard to believe. Only Johnny knew this side of him. While the world treated him like a monk. Yum was a unique player like Johnny too. Player name, Yum. Title, The Equalizer. Class, Paladin. Subclass, Blacksmith. LVL, 45. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI. 250 VIT, 370, and 180 STA, 170, PHY, 350, HP, 35, 000 35, 000, 000, 000. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck, slash 100. Charm, infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, collector of Yin and Yang bracelet, legendary, bound. Yellow Monk's Robes, Semi-Legendary. Weapons, Not Applicable. Skills, Hand-to-Hand -hand Combat. 
Defense wall. Blink. Class specific skills. Last stand. Purify. Mount. Gray wolf. Pet. None. Yung was the only player in Omega currently to own a legendary item. And it was one of the strongest legendary items at that being a borderline cheat. The effects of the item were divine. However, the restrictions it placed on the user made it classify as legendary grade. Yung obtained the collector of Eam and Yang bracelet through a special quest where he helped a roaming hermit, who was one of the tier 6 legendary god in disguise. The details of his quest were not well known, however, the effects of the bracelet were. Collector of Yin and Yang, bracelet, legendary, bound to player Yum. Gifted by a mythic existence for his kindness. Effects. Steal 15% of the enemy's HP. Agility. Mana. Stamina, and give it to allies. Area of effect is 2 kilometers radius. Restrictions. Only one attack skill can be learned by the user once bound. Caution. If you bind with this item, you will never be able to learn any attack skills. You will forever be a weakling relying on others for support to level up. Choosing the item was a huge challenge. Having no attack skills meant his only way of leveling up would be through crafting. However, he took on the challenge and chose to bind with the item. The roaming hermit also gave him his robes, which were orange in color. The robes were an excellent defense item providing him with much more defense than any other equipment on the market. With his attack skills sealed, he only focused on increasing his non-attack stats. He invested heavily in increasing his vitality and physical stats, while moderately investing in agility. His intelligence and stamina stats were massively lagging. He decided to join True Elites with Johnny, because he was infatuated with Skyla, and wanted to be with her. He was a perverse man who would admire beauties maintaining a straight face. He was Asian by birth, hence having small eyes, making it hard to decipher whether he was checking out someone or just standing serenely. However, Rudra already knew of the legendary player in his last life. Also hearing about Johnny's credentials, he was pumped to have two such great players in his guild. What Rudra did not know was that Johnny was a unique player too, and that the two of them together on a battlefield would create myths that would live on forever. Years later they would be remembered as the two senile old men who made armies of thousands flee at sight. When the party of four walked through the gates, every one of them looked remarkable. The first one to catch the eye would definitely be Skyla. The way she carried herself, her walk, and her curvaceous body, would make any man pause for a second to look. Next would be Yum. The orange robes, bald head and amicable smile. Anyone would feel like seeing a Buddhist monk walking. Then would be Johnny English himself, carrying himself with suave and style. He has a confident look plastered on his face. His presence dominates the aura around him. He feels like a de facto leader of the group. The last to be noticed would be Bo. While being extremely lean and athletic, he also had a smart and sharp look plastered on his face. The way he carried himself was impeccable. However, he seemed dominated walking alongside English. However, he was not to be underestimated. He was also a thief. And a true elite elder standard one at that. Johnny then said, The name's Johnny. Johnny English. As he gave Rudra a firm handshake, Rudra smiled. It was good that he was not actually a youth in his twenties. Otherwise, he would have been intimidated by Johnny. However, he wasn't. He knew how to keep his cool and assert his authority. He said, Guild leader Shakuni, pleased to meet you. Bo and Skyla were pleasantly surprised. Rudra's calm in front of Johnny was not commonly seen. Their evaluation of the guild leader instantly went up by a level. They had already heard about his exploits and knew his reputation. Also, his battle videos were legendary. However, meeting him in person, they finally understood that Rudra, like Johnny, was an excellent man beneath all that. Yum said, Amit Ba. This Yum is pleased to join your sect. Rudra chuckled. Yum surely deserved his reputation as the orange monk. He said, Pleased to have you. When Skyla introduced herself and shook Rudra's hand, he had to try hard not to stare at her revealing cleavage to keep the demeanor of the guild leader. And Rudra quickly realized that it was a harder task than he imagined as he couldn't help but sneak glances. Skyla noticed this and smiled. It would have been abnormal if a youth in his 20s was not attracted by her. Well, she checked out Rudra too. He seemed cute enough to her. Finally, Bo introduced himself, and the exchange was over. Rudra let Amelia take over then, as he told her to introduce the four to the elite culture and give a tour of the grounds. Rudra wanted to immediately talk to Johnny about making him the guild's elder and becoming a trainer for young talents. However, he did not wish to burden him on the first day. However, Yum joining the guild came as a huge relief to him. While the conquest of becoming the overlords of Purple Haze City were still a month away, a lot of preparation needed to be done and his addition to the guild was very reassuring. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys, with this chapter, 
we successfully complete win-win for this month. We have over 10k unlocks meaning that all of you get a 12% rebate. Also I apologize again for not releasing bonus chapter today. Things will go back to normal tomorrow onwards, as I am still editing previous chapters, and working on stockpiling for the privileged tier ones coming October 1st. I am proud to announce that chapter 74, 125 have been re-edited and are free of grammatical errors. And that 126, 176 will be completed today. Reading the book of its major drawback. Also do join Discord for detailed updates. Link in description. It has been an exhaustive last 48 hours for me as I am working on the book continuously. And I have another 24 hour more to work. I request your understanding and patience. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 177 Update Notice 1. River Hand been anxious the last few days. He had been pouring out huge sums of money to pretty much stock up on every single item special to Hazel Groove Kingdom. He was anticipating the next update notice. According to his past life memory, when majority of the player base finally reached tier 1 in strength, that was the time when the next system update came. He had been anticipating the update notice for the last two weeks now. And noticing the trend and average player levels. It should be any day now. The dynamic of the game would shift once the update came. Each major update in the game would change the game dynamic significantly. However, the second system update was the most shocking one of them all. Perhaps because it shifted to a more global structure. Removing most of the disparities in the game. And his speculation was indeed right. As the update notice did come as expected. System notification? The second system update will be released in 72 hours at 10 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time Real World Time. The new update features include. 1. Massive map update. NPC kingdoms will now be unlocked. The NPC kingdoms will now be open for trade and interaction. The map will experience an overall massive update. Each NPC kingdom shall have its own set of rules and regulations. Some seemingly normal things may be a taboo in the particular kingdom and may result in heavy punishments. Note, if the NPC kingdom is not favorable to you, they may deny you entry at border. Illegal immigration if caught will lead to a 15-day imprisonment. The NPC kingdoms had opened up for trade and interaction. Most of the NPC kingdoms were in higher level grounds. Level 100 maps were above. Hence apart from the established safe routes into the kingdom. Infiltration from the wild would mostly lead to death. In case of illegal entry, if the player was caught then, it would lead to a 15-day compulsory imprisonment. And River's experience told him that one-third illegal immigrant were caught. Also just like real world the NPC kingdoms would also have an immigration system. Unless you are on friendly terms with the kingdom or the ruling race you may not be given entry into the kingdom. If your guild had notoriety in the kingdom, you may be black flagged or even hunted at the border. 2. Introducing guild cities. A short while after the update, a massive event will take place where guilds would compete to gain management rights over city. The guild successful in obtaining the management rights would become the overlord of the city paying a fixed annual income to the kingdom and the central government while collecting taxes from the citizens of the city. They will have their own army regiment depending on the size of the city and can develop the city as they please. The overall living environment. Public security. Health and hygiene. Culture. Cost of living. These factors would either drive away NPC population decreasing tax income, or increase the influx depending on how the city is managed. The rights of management may be revoked if the annual payment is not made or the public order falls below a certain level, causing riots. Note, a guild may gain management rights to only one city for now. Rudra had long been preparing for this event. He knew the importance of gaining management rights. He knew the importance of gaining a good city as his base. Even though it is only one city per guild in this expansion pack, it would not stay Sioux forever. Kingdom building would become a huge part of the game going forward. And to be successful and competitive, they needed to do a good job with it. Everything from the most basic village to the capital city would be up for the challenge sometime later. Probably a month or so after the second update. 3. Introducing teleportation arrays. Teleportation arrays can be built in your territories after gaining management rights to it. The teleportation array will let you travel throughout the continent to whichever city that also has a teleporting array for a fee. Many NPC kingdoms will also have teleporting facilities. It is the fastest and safest way to travel. But it may be expensive. Note, managing guilds can set the price of entry into their city through teleporting arrays. It can be a great source of income. For a global auction house. The global auction house will now replace kingdom-based ones. The world will walk into a global economy. Anything could be posted for sale on the global auction house. And the auction will charge a standard 10% proceed fee for all transactions plus shipping charges. 
The seller may choose to pay for the shipping charges or may make it the duty of the customers to pay. The longer the distance, the greater the shipping cost. The shipping cost for the same kingdom will be 10 silver. Within the same continent will be 1 gold and across continents will be 10 gold standard per item. The system auctions will now change from kingdom auctions to continental auctions. Guilds from all over the continent may participate in the next system auction. Rudra knew that this particular update was very tricky. It meant that there would be tons of competition in the market and being able to secure profits would be much harder. This is where the chalice of purity would show its real worth. The chalice would break the international price system of potions as elite lifestyle would become W household brand. Rudra had heavily invested in the kingdom specialties of Hazelgrove for the past few days. Because of this reason, as region-specific herbs and items would now fetch sky-high prices of the international market, he would easily make his money back threefold. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys the system update would change a lot of things and would make the game much more interesting. Please take your time to carefully understand all the updates. Also for any doubts regarding the whole thing, join the Discord channel to ask me one-on-one. -on -one. Link in bio forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 178 Update Notice 2. 5. Change to the mounts and pets fear your. Players may now have three mounts. Aerial mounts, land mounts and water mounts. The Beast Tamer subclass is now available. Combat pets can now be purchased through pet stores and may be obtained in the wild in the form of eggs. Note, combat pets cannot enter dungeons. Combat pets cannot enter restricted areas and towns. Combat pets cannot be brought to NPC kingdoms. Combat pets will have personalities and may not listen to their owner's commands always. They can die permanently if HP reaches zero. They can also gain EXP and level up to gain skills. Taming a higher EXP pet is difficult. Pets need food and sustenance. A weekly charge will be deducted from the adventurer's account for pet maintenance. Failure of payment for three days after the week-long deadline will result in pet's death. Pets can become tattoos on players' bodies and can be summoned using mana. Although it seemed like a huge update, Rudra knew it was all just for show and was actually useless. Pets were a dead end and not worth pouring resources into. Even the best pets had very limited combat capabilities and were weaker than the users. The cost of pet maintenance was huge and no real benefit was there to the process. They could not be brought to dungeons and NPC kingdoms. Also certain areas had pet restrictions. Although pets could help in the wild and in PvP, they would permanently die if their HP hits zero, making nurturing them a big waste of money. Most pets had very low HP count and defense, and players could kill them easily. Pets were a huge cheat of money, and Rudra would not fall for the scam. Pets were only used as cute tag-alongs. Just like real life. Although a dog could bite a human and be effective in some scenarios. In an actual full-blown war between humans. No one would ever bring their dogs. Expecting combat proficiency out of them was useless. Both Rudra and Karna had already obtained pet eggs that were yet to hatch. It may seem to majority player base that pets had only unlocked after the update. Which was not entirely wrong. However the reality was that the pet's eggs were already in the game. But only those who had found them knew about their existence. The incubation of all eggs was long when Rudra and Karna found them. This was because the AI had ensured that even if they found the eggs, they would not hatch before the second update was put in place. Hence while their eggs would hatch soon, the majority player base who directly bought pets or found eggs would also have pets in a comparable time duration. Rudra knew from experience that it was always best to hatch a pet yourself and help it grow. Only then will it stay loyal and listen to all commands. An adult pet would always have an attitude and behave according to its will and would be difficult to deal with. 6. EXP Boost Limited Time Offer For the period of the next 3 months, every new player joining the game will get a 3x EXP boost for 30 days. This boost was given so that the gap between new players and old ones could be bridged out, because the older players were already so far ahead. It was very difficult for new players, who started the game much later to reach the same level of progress. Rudra knew that. A huge influx of players were on their way to Omega. The appeal of the game was huge, and people wanted to experience this second world for themselves. Millions entered the game every day, and hence, this boost was a much-needed relief for them. 7. World Games Introducing the World Games, aka the VR Olympics. Participate in the World Games representing your guild's management city or town. Participate in 100 events amongst players from all over the world for the top 3 spots in each event. Huge gifts for individual winners and overall top performing cities. Not much information was available about the World Games. However, Rudra knew that this annual event would change the face of the VR game forever. Guilds would compete on the grandest stage for pride. 
prestige and benefits. The prize for winning a single category bronze would be equivalent to 15 dark gold treasure chests worth of loot. And sky was the limit from there. The World Games would become an event with far-fetched implications on even the real world. As the event would become the most watched sporting event worldwide. The R Olympics would become the newer superior version of the age-old Olympics. With the mix of both traditional and game-like events. And the overall top performers would become the biggest club slash guilds in the real world too. The real world merchandise of those guilds would sell like hotcakes, and the top performers would become international idols. The entire game's dynamic would change once that happens. As the focus of players would shift, many would spend their entire gaming time training to win a single medal in a category. In his past life, Ridra was a nobody. Someone who could not even gain the right to participate in the event. But not this time. This time not only would he participate, but also win. Determination filled his eyes. The road ahead was tough. And his ambitions were endless. This system update changed many things. However, it was not an immediate update. Only a few things would change at first. However, the major changes would occur after the guild management event would take place and the kingdom building aspect of the game would start. This will be the only system update for the next year or so. As the game as players knew it would change forever in that year. Forward slash forward slash forward slash lots of interesting things. Lots of great arcs upcoming. I will try adopt a very maintained pacing of story with lots of humor and satisfying moments. Just buckle on and support me on the ride with your tickets and stones. The content won't let you down. That's my promise to you all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 179 The World Reacts. The entire server was shook up. The update notice was massive. No one predicted this sort of update to come so suddenly. Usually games have small updates and a gradual shift in features. However Omega launched such a massive upgrade at once. It was hard for the player base to adapt. Actually a part of the update had been predicted by various experts that there must be a massive map upgrade. Because the leveling grounds only house monsters up to level 60. There were no higher dungeons available either. For the current player base, level 60 seemed to be the max limit. The maps around the cities had varying difficulty. So unless the monsters became stronger there, there was no future path of progression. However the monsters could not be upgraded in strength as there were still a huge player base that needed to farm for EXP in those grounds. Hence the only option available was map expansion. The game had hinted about the existence of the NPC kingdoms, but the regions were locked and inaccessible. Hence Noon really knows much about any NPC kingdom. From the common lore collected from NPC, there were three NPC kingdoms that were confirmed to exist. One was the elf kingdom Eurasania, which had the world tree in its center, and a dense forest as its domain. It was common knowledge that the elf kingdom was the hardest to build relations with, as they were reclusive in nature and did not trust humans. The entry requirements were very harsh and trade was non-existent. The second kingdom confirmed was the dwarf kingdom of Dwargan, built under a massive mountain. The entire kingdom was protected on all four sides by huge rocky mountains, having excellent defense capabilities. The only entrances were guarded with heavy armor-piercing machines and deadly weapons. No infiltrators could enter. The country was rich in trade as merchants frequented the place. Humans were allowed in the kingdom without much hassles. However, the dwarves considered human blacksmiths inferior and loathed human-made products. Trade permits could be obtained relatively easily with them. The third NPC kingdom was the Beast Kingdom of Animalia. Rivera's great sister Patricia was once also a part of this kingdom. The kingdom accepted humans and were friendly towards them. However, the country had a very high crime rate and was overall very lawless. The kingdom followed the law of the jungle, where the strong ruled the weak, and it was common for goods to be stolen by bandits or outright seized through power. Trade was possible, but good safety was non-existent. Other NPC kingdoms were rumored to exist, with a legendary kingdom of winged people in the air. However, no conclusive evidences were found. Ridra knew that this rumor was true. Floating City of Titan was a reality, and their inhabitants were all winged humans also commonly misunderstood as angels. Angels were also a race in Omega. However, the difference between winged humans and angels was like heaven and earth. Angels had divinity flowing through them, Angels were born at tier 4. Most reached tier 5 by adolescence, and tier 6 was not uncommon amongst angels. They also had wings as white as the snow, and could be said to be the de facto rulers of the continents. The only races comparable to the angel race was the fall angel race, devil, and the pure draconic race. These three made the three great races of the continent, while the fallen angels were of a dark faction alignment. The true angels were aligned with light faction. The two naturally were always at odds. The balance of power however was maintained 
because of the draconic race. They were neutrally aligned and judged everyone equally. To them only one's deeds mattered and not their alignment. They would go to war with both factions, depending on what they felt was right. In his previous life, there was a rumored legendary kingdom of Draconia, somewhere in the northern continent. However, that rumor was never confirmed. The server went berserk with speculation, as there was panic, excitement, and frenzy in the game. The notice also saw a huge influx of new players and already existing players that joined and were below level 5, also deleted their accounts. To restart with the 3 XEXP bonuses, the market was in chaos as products were being sold in crazy prices, both high and low. Everything was up for speculation. The general public reacted like, The new update is crazy! My guild will become the overlords of the capital city. Mark my words, people of the world. Teleporting arrays are so cool. I always wanted to visit my friend in the neighboring kingdom. Now I finally can. I am going to win at least one gold medal in the coming VR Olympics. Can we do LEWD stuff to NBCLs? This elder brother has a long time wish. Ag. Creep alert. Report. 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 Elves are fragile. A real man prefers orcs. AG change. More creeps. Help! Moderator notice. User 2345777 and user 215-7775 have been banned from the channel for posting inappropriate content. Thank God the creeps are banned. I agree. They are creeps and should be banned. But even I am curious. Can we have relationships with NPCs? I assume we will find out. Won't we? There were all sorts of discussions on the forums. Discussing all six update points in detail. The overall atmosphere was a feeling of fresh air, as 90% people took the update positively. Rudra had his arms buried in his head. He was contemplating the future of the guild. He knew what he wanted to achieve. However, the path ahead was full of thorns and difficulties, which was very hard to overcome. He had a small number of members under him. This was his greatest strength and his biggest weakness at the same time. The guild being a collection of only the best talents made the overall atmosphere cohesive like a family who could overcome any odds together. However, the lower numbers also meant that every challenge would have greater difficulty to overcome. He only hoped that this family could overcome it anyway. Chapter 183 Days of Chaos 72 hour countdown was on for the update, and the game was not the same as it was 10 hours ago. Major reshuffling of guild members took place, as members abandoned the smaller guilds in droves. The common people had judged that the future was with the guilds, who would rule the cities. There was no point in staying with small adventurer groups. Those with ambition all chose first or second-rate guilds that they felt had a fair chance of securing a town or a village. The entire guild dynamics changed over a span of few short hours. People betrayed their old guilds. Friendships were broken. Items were stolen from the warehouses. As elders and people with access to the warehouse defected with the items. Hundreds of thousands of players jumped ship in Hazel Group Kingdom alone. There were many players who quit their guilds but did not join any guild for now. They wanted to wait and see whom to join depending on the results of the guild's performance and capabilities to gain management rights. There were a few that were waiting for the teleportation arrays to open up and join the guilds of their friends in other kingdoms. Everyone wanted a brighter future. And in chasing those short-term benefits, most missed the bigger picture. A guild member's real value stems from their loyalty and contribution to the guild. In large guilds, those who defected by the thousands, betraying their old guilds, although may enjoy some short-term benefits, and may even become part of an overlord of a city-type guild. However, they would never become part of something bigger. They would never truly be a valued part of that guild, and would always remain expendable. Naturally, there were thousands who wanted to join the elites. However, Rudra was cold in turning all recruitment offers down. Defectors had no place amongst the elites. The service guild members were the worst. True elite service players were all mad. That even after the alliance's fall, they were bound by this useless contract. A majority of them about 65,000, decided to delete the account and start again. With a 3 XEXP boost, they could make fresh starts, thinking it was much better than being in a slavery contract for three years. Even the remaining service guild players were very tempted to take the offer however they wanted to wait a bit and gauge the situation before choosing the best option. Rudra did not care one bit for the service guild members leaving. He could always fill the ranks of service guild players forking out the guild's money, hiring them on payroll. The guild was rich enough to afford it. However, the guild currently only required about 20. 000 service members, and he had 35. 000? So the current situation did not require him to take those steps. For him the shame and humiliation that the alliance members felt by serving the elites 
for the two weeks following the war was revenge enough. Naturally those who would stay through the end would be rewarded by him. And generously at that. He would free them off the contract and offer better pay. But only after he became overlord of Purple Haze City. Another major change that was seen was that people were madly investing in real estate. Everyone understood that the real estate is real cheap in the game currently. And that the market has enough upside to give tenfold returns in a year. Players with nobility charged a 30% commission fee for buying properties for other players. While stockpiling on properties for themselves. In a game where anyone could teleport anywhere with a fee. And the guilds developing the cities to attract more population of players and NPCs meant that. Over time the houses in the big cities would become very valuable and the rent charge could be hefty. Across the map people madly began to purchase properties at a very high premium. However, the situation in Purple Haze was very different. There was not a single piece of land available for purchase. Even in the outskirts of the city, the farming lands were also all bought out. Those who wished to buy property in Purple Haze City were all dumbfounded. Just who could have bought the entire list of properties available for purchase? It would take hundreds of millions of gold. Yet someone actually managed to do it. Many doubts came into the mind of people. They suspected that it was a work of a group of people or a hidden organization and not a single party. However, without any clues, they could only give up on their speculation. They just had to make peace with the fact that not a single property was available for purchase in Purple Haze City. What they did not know, however, was that the properties would definitely grow over 10 times in valuation over the next year. However, they would also prove as a crucial part of getting the management rights of the city. They were more important than they could ever dream of. The days passed in absolute chaos as Rudra started to prepare for the map expansion and the incoming update. His titles earned early in the game that gave him favor from the NPCs would now show its real effects. Those titles would now prove to be invaluable as Rudra would gain powerful connections that others could not even dream about. An open trade with species that most never even heard about. Forward slash forward slash forward slash fifth chapter for the day. It's the highest number I have put out ever. Plus a quick update for you all. The edit of the book is almost complete. Only 30 chapters left to edit. Which I will complete by tomorrow morning. Firstly, the initial review for WSA has started today. Hence, I would like to ask for your support. Whether in form of castles, tickets, power stones. Do whatever you can guys to get me featured high. IV work myself to the bone to become worthy of a WSA nomination at least. And with your support, I think I can make it. A big shout out to the noon for the 30. 000 coin gift. You have single handedly given me 100 tickets. Sue, so I guess I have to give a bonus chapter. Thank you so much for the timely support, brother. W say review started. We need to keep the momentum going. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 181 A New Beginning. Server update was finally launched. Every player was teleported outside the game as the server underwent a six hour mandatory upgrade. Rudra chose to spend this time with his family in his home. After a long time, he sat with Max to help with school homework and helped his mom do dishes. He only noticed today how his father had adapted to his retirement. His father was much happier. He was struggling with what to do throughout the day as he no longer needed to work. He was a bit awkward around the house as his initial phase of just relaxing through his retirement had worn off. Even the next phase of pursuing his hobbies had became boring now. He was looking for something tangible while relaxing at home. All this translated into him giving more time and attention to Max and his mom. Max was happier than ever. He hardly met dad before, as he would usually come in after Max's bedtime and would be sleeping when he went to school. His mom's health saw a significant improvement and Rudra was grateful for that. Her mom had joined a parent group here and she was very vocal about how proud she was of her son. The new pastime of his mom and dad was that they kept looking for what their son did. They would watch news, read articles, meet other parents from the True Elites Guild. His father didn't show it. However, he was more proud of him than his mother. He would always tell him that don't run behind money. Run behind excellence. Money would follow. And somewhere, somehow, Rudra's ideology about the True Elites came from there. His father used to work with a small company when Rudra was a kid. And his father seemed happy at that time. He spent lots of time with Rudra and smiled a lot. When his father changed jobs and started working for a big corporate company, although the pay increased. He stopped seeing his father around the house, and he could see that he was not happy. Also experiencing the corporate side of the world himself in his past life. He was firm in his concept of the true elites. A guild that bonds because everyone in it is an equal. The guild had the most relaxed form of Erchi. Where even though there was a guild leader, vice guild leader and elders, those were roles without any real abuse of power. 
held by people who treated their subordinates as if they were their equal. The respect Karna and Rudra and the other elders had from the members was because of their skills and their contribution to the guild and not because they were forced to. Their faith in Rudra stemmed from his character and his ability to see any situation through. The perfect way to describe the atmosphere in the guild was their slogan, where every single member would fight for the guild, and the guild would fight for every single member. After the six hours were up, Rudra went back to his room, to his bed, where the gaming helmet laid. He sighed looking at it, as he thought, One month till the pods are released. Maybe I will gift the entire guild one. No, I'll make Ethan gift the guild one. The fully functional gaming pod would be released in a month, and it would provide much better immersion. The difference between the helmet and the gaming pod was like the difference between 720 and 1080 pixel picture quality. Although 720 can give more than satisfactory experience, nothing beats that 1080 quality. Logging into the game, he first saw a mandatory patch notice screen, listing all the updates, as the AI narrated everything written inside. This was the way that Cuber Corporation ensured that even those who missed the system notification would understand the changes in the game. Even though Rudra knew everything that was going to be said, he paid rapt attention to what the AI spoke, making sure that he missed nothing out. After three minutes of reading all the patch notes, a screen appeared asking him whether he wanted to continue forward or hear the patch notes again. He chose to continue and was teleported back in the game. Rudra spawned back in the guild headquarters in Purple Haze City. As he looked around he found the familiar faces of the elites all around him. The guild members were chatting leisurely as they checked out the new map. And as expected the NPC kingdoms were now displayed in gray. Marked in the map. The player inhabited kingdoms were marked in blue. And no man's lands were marked in red. A new path opened from Hazel Groove that connected it to the elf kingdom. That area before the update had no path. And only had a level 60 monster leveling ground. However now the forest expanded also having level 70. 80. 90 and 100 monster grounds dot the start of the road towards the elf kingdom hung a warning sign that said that although the road was usually safe, there was always a possibility of a wild monster accidentally stumbling onto the road. Hence adventurers were cautioned to travel at their own risk. Rudra was sure that in spite of the warning today itself there would be hundreds of thousands of players who would want to go to that kingdom. And they were not wrong to do so. As even he wanted to go there, there was a quest in that kingdom. That if completed, would greatly increase his odds of getting the management rights for Purple Haze City. He would need a crew for this one. He could not do it alone. If it was before he would have just chosen Karna and Medivh to tag along. However now that Johnny English and Jung joined the guild. He wondered if he should go with them instead? The task needed a crew of four people. Karna had to come as he was the luckiest BS asterisk 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 to walk God's green earth. The other two choices had many potential entrants. Pink Lotus. Naomi. Bo. Skyla, Rhino, Cola. Everyone would bring value to the table. Just whom to choose? Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching the golden ticket target. LOL reaching it would be an understatement. You guys double reached it. Okay take this as one bonus. The other one will be coming out too. I'm back at regular pace and back with bonuses. Shout out to Long Slumber and the noon for the 500 coin gifts. Glad to see the appreciation to my work forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 182 the elven kingdom after a long time deliberating about whom to take rudra decided to go with karna johnny english and yum in the future when he would take over the management of purple haze city he would definitely make a teleporting array as the top priority traveling between places was much easier using the teleporting arrays and much faster too him being a reincarnator already having a taste of the convenience of teleportation arrays found traveling by land a huge waste of time However, without any better options, he had to go by the road. Rudra thought positively about the situation. At least, he had the dire wolf mounts. They were faster than horses and had high stamina. Riding on them, he could easily reach the elven kingdom in about one and a half day journey. Rudra, Karna, Johnny and Yum set out for the kingdom on the dire wolves. Rudra was pleasantly surprised when Johnny and Yum reacted positively to his request about the quest. The two seniors were calm and chill. Although they had a hard time mixing in with the younger generation of elites. They were very open-minded and fun to hang out around. They did not admonish the younger generations and even responded in a friendly way. Well, at least Johnny did. Yum just talked like a monk most of the times. His words were often riddled with quotes rather than actual words. And every other line mentioned Amitba. At the start, except that it was fine. Rudra was not worried about encountering any wild mobs beyond his skill set currently. 
Only 1 in a 1000 encountered a level 70 beast. Only 1 in 10,000 encountered a beast of level 80. And only 1 in a million encountered a level 90, or above roaming beast on the road to the Elven Kingdom. You had to have absolutely trash luck. For such an event to transpire. With the son of Providence Karna riding beside him. He was hardly worried about such an outcome. The first half day of traveling was rather uneventful, as the four casually chatted as they rode their mounts. Karna got acquainted with both Johnny and Yim. And he was very happy to meet them. Johnny gave him an impression like he was a spy like James Bond or something. He was calm. All his words sounded cool. And his every action was elegant. Even the way he talked. How he put pressure at the end of every word in his speech. Although that was probably because he was a native of Country B. Added to his charisma. You on the other hand. Seemed straight out of a Buddhist monastery. Whenever he smiled his small eyes would disappear from his face. Coupled with his orange robe and he looked like a laughing Buddha. However the merry times ended quickly as they did indeed encounter a monster on the road. It was a griffin at that. Rudra cursed out loud. The griffin was not a level 90 creature. It was a bloody level 100 or above creature. One of the highest bosses in update 2. It was hard to find even in the wild. And now it appeared on the safe road? Rudra checked the griffin's stats. Griffin, Cheetan, LV-102, it has incredibly high flying speed and can make sharp turns mid-air. Its beak is a lethal weapon along with its claws. Absolutely avoid them when they are enraged. Current status, extremely angry. Rudra did not know whether to laugh or to cry. This particular griffin was actually a chief. And also extremely angry. What rotten luck must he have to encounter this beast, and in this mood? What happened to the son of Providence's luck beside him? Hello? God? Is your chosen one a defective piece? Why is his charm not working? The griffin screeched a loud cry. It was extremely angry for some reason. And it flapped its wings and charged at the party of four. Rudra instantly became alert and on guard. Karna also took battle stance. Yum seemed to prepare to activate his defensive abilities. However Johnny just calmly sat on his mount. The other three wolves whose riders had dismounted scurried away. However as Johnny did not. His wolf turned away and ran from the incoming danger with Johnny on him. Johnny fell dead inside when he saw the griffin charging towards his direction. He had checked the bird's level and he knew he had no fighting chance. Johnny knew his luck was trash. However he never expected it to be so trash. He had already closed his eyes and resigned himself to being resurrected again in the Church of Light, where the beautiful priest would bless him. Well if he was going to die anyway, he might as well die Johnny English style. He pointed at the beast with his outstretched arm and signaled the beast to bring it. However, to his surprise, his mount turned and started to run. Johnny suddenly felt hope. Maybe the griffin would attack the other three, and he could escape first. However, when he turned, he saw the griffin chasing him. As he ignored the other three, Johnny cursed his bad luck. He was a dead guy now. His mount went off the road for a bit and into the forest. But the griffin had already closed in. With its beak pointing towards Johnny, it dived in at full speed to bite off Johnny's head. However, when the beast started to attack Johnny, the system calculated it to be Johnny's enemy. And the bad luck probability kicked in. In what could be considered a godly miracle. The wolf side stepped a little to make the griffin miss its aim by a little as it went headfirst into a nearby boulder. Crash! The beast crashed into the boulder. And for some reason its beak got stuck into the damn thing. No matter how hard it struggled. It couldn't move at all. Johnny seeing the opportunity. Sprung into action. As he took two minutes to whittle down the griffin's HP. The griffin struggled moving its wings and trying to claw towards Johnny. However, with its beak stuck, it could really not do much. Becoming a sitting duck, it eventually fell to Johnny's blows. The party lost Johnny's view when he exited off-road, and hence did not know what had transpired for a minute. When they arrived at the scene, they saw the griffin stuck in the boulder and Johnny whittling away its HP. Rudra and Karna were dumbfounded by the scene, and they could not take any actions for a minute. Yum couldn't help even if he wanted to as he had no combat skills. Rudra was dumbfounded. Just how high was Johnny English's skill? Is this what it meant to be the greatest mercenary? From his POV, he saw Johnny calling out for the bird. An arrogant expression plastered on his face that said, just bring it, you beast. And the bird chased him. When they came to the scene, he had already somehow immobilized the beast and started to whittle its HP. This was what the greatest mercenary was capable of, huh? Rudra thought. As for the first time, he felt... That maybe with Johnny English in the guild, he was not the strongest player anymore. However, he was not insecure. He was very happy. Every elite strength was the guild's strength. He happily started to help him slay the beast as he scoffed at Karna. 
the son of Providence failed him. However, he found a new gem to rely on. After struggling for a bit, they killed the beast to gain a massive EXP boost to level up thrice. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for golden tickets. Also, I am proud to announce that the entire book has been re-edited and cleared of the obvious grammar errors, as well as misspelled words. Clear the cache of the app to read the new content forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 183 A Difference in Treatment Johnny was happy when he leveled up thrice. This was usually not the case. Even though the bird was extremely unlucky in this instance. At most times, he was very unlucky as well. His enemy suffering a fate of 190 luck stat was terrible. However, that did not reduce the 95 luck that he carried on himself at all times. There were many fights where his stealth skill would fail at the last possible moment. Making him an easy prey for his opponent. More often than not, he did actually die a lot. He was far from the invincible mercenary he was in real life. If he was in a building that was to collapse in the real world. Then if five people were in a room where debris was falling. Then the four except himself might find themselves buried under rubble. But he might come out unharmed. However, in Omega, if in the same scenario, even if 500 people were in the same room and only one piece of debris fell, then he was sure that it would be him under the rubble. His luck inside Omega was trash. His skills questionable. The only thing he had going for himself was his attitude. He was Johnny English and that's that. Rudra had gained a strong impression of Johnny. It was sure to cause major misunderstandings down the line. However, with no one voicing their thoughts out loud, the misunderstanding was never confronted. The four continued their journey towards the Elven Kingdom and experienced no more unexpected accidents. After a day of riding, they reached the border of the Elven Forest. The smaller towns and settlements were about 30 minutes' ride from the border, and the capital city was a three hours' ride. Rudra and the crew needed to go to the capital city of Anaheim. However, first they required entry passage. There was a small ranger's hut at the start of the Elven Forest. Most would miss this hut and venture straight into the Elven Forest. However, those who entered the Elven Forest without permits were open to attacks by Forest Patrol and Elven Division, who was notorious for killing adventurers bold enough to venture into the Elven Forest without a permit. Only those with an actual permit from the Border Ranger would gain the actual access road towards the Elven Settlements. Even with the Border Permit, one only gained access to enter or transit the Elven Forest. They could not enter any Elven Settlements for that they needed a separate permit. Rudra approached the ranger's hut and knocked at the door, patiently waiting. Soon, an elf opened the hut's door. The guy was extremely handsome. His clear white skin and pointy ears and sharp jaw made him look like AK pop star. The elves were inherently good looking. They had beautiful features, and both male and female elves used all sorts of accessories and cosmetics to maintain that beautiful look. However, the elves usually had a very cold attitude towards outsiders, and were not easy to mix with. The elf looked at Rudra and said, State your business, adventurer, Rudra calmly said, requesting transit permit into the Elven Forest. The elf raised an eyebrow. The adventurer in front of him seemed like someone who knew the ways of the elves, not like the bunch of idiots who passed straight through into the Elven Forest without permit. For the last whole day, he saw thousands of adventurers passing through into the Elven Forest without permit. He laughed at the fates of those idiots. The forest patrol seemed to have a fun day at work. There were a few that approached his hut. However, those idiots were looking for special quests from him. He was a self-sufficient ranger. What were those adventurers expecting? That he would send them to fetch water? But this adventurer was different. He asked for a transit permit. He knew the ways of the elves. The ranger asked, State your faction. Rudra changed his equipped title to world-renowned and said, Human from the kingdom of Hazelroof Worships the goddess of light. The ranger had a change of attitude when Rudra equipped the world-renowned title. His expression much more amiable. He said, To its renowned adventurer Shikuni, No wonder you are well-versed in the ways of the elves. Are the other three your companions? Rudra nodded and smiled amiably. The ranger went back inside the hut and issued the transit permits and handed them to Rudra. Rudra took out twenty gold and handed it out to him. The elf arched another eyebrow. He said, No need for money from the famous adventurer. You are welcome in the kingdom of elves. Rudra smiled more. The transit permit was five gold and adventurer. Although to his current finances this was not worth mentioning. When given special treatment that saved him money, he felt pretty good. Rudra was in an extremely good mood. As he and the others continued their journey into the kingdom of the elves. The transit permits were basically a runic paper made by the elves that made the patrolling forest elves know that the ones passing were friendly. The entire elven territory was actually under a huge monitoring formation. 
any illegal immigrants from any part of the forest would show up as a red blip on the patrolling forest officers monitoring radars. They would then be tracked and hunted, entering with the transit permits. Mark you as a blue blip, showing that you were here with good intentions until you stayed on the paved roads and did not venture into any settlements. The officers would not find trouble with you. This was crucial information that the current adventurers lacked. Those who ventured into the forest without the permits had only a trip back to the Church of Light left for themselves. River wondered if should make another information pack about the Kingdom of Elves and sell for money? However, he did not currently lack money. Maybe it could be used to barter with other guilds for items. Lost in thoughts, the three-hour journey was completed without any hitches. The party of four reached the gates of the elven capital of Anaheim. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target of 3,200 stones. Good job, guys. We can surely hit 4,002. Also, 300 tickets have also been crossed. Sue another bonus coming up soon. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 184 of Anaheim. Rudrow was shocked to see that there were a few hundred adventurers lined up to enter the capital city of Anaheim. Rudra seemed to have underestimated the capabilities of the masses. There were a few hundred out of the thousands that tried. That did actually make it. However, just as he thought, no one was being given entry into the elven capital. The elves were very strict with the entry of people not from their race into their settlements. The elves had a specially built trade district, 20 minutes away from the capital, where merchants could meet and trade. However, that was the extent of which they allowed most people to interact with their race. Conservative to the core, they absolutely hated half-elves and dark-elves. Only pure elves were accepted by the society. And they were raised in a way that they were always conscious of other races. The only people that were not from the elf race that were allowed into the elven capital were the priests from the Church of Light and very famous heroes. The elves were also a stout followers of the Goddess of Light. And every settlement had to mandatorily have a shrine dedicated to the goddess. The capital city having the largest one of them. Made of pure elven silver and gemstones. This is where the reputation and fame of players mattered in the game. The features of gaining fame and reputation from completing certain tasks had been there since the game's inception. However, up till now, there was no real use for it. In the long line of adventurers, not even one gained entry into the capital city. This was because one needed plus 1,000 or above reputation with the Church of Light or plus 5,000 fame or more to enter the capital of elves. Gaining fame and reputation was not easy in Omega. Maybe only 1 in 10. 000, 000 players would meet these requirements. When this fact was revealed in his past life, there was a mad rush to gain more reputation points with the Church of Light. However, most quests hardly rewarded 2030 fame, or none at all. It was very hard to collect enough of it. The elf guard at the door was cold as ice. As he turned away entrant after entrant from entering the elven city, some thief tried to sneak in unnoticed using stealthy. However, before he could set a single foot inside the capital, three arrows pierced through his heart navel and brain. As he died on the spot, loud complaints and murmurs were heard. As the crowd became more and more agitated when people were refused access to the capital. What is this bull asterisk 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 game? Who designed this? Cuber Corporation what is the point of making a city? When noon can enter it in the first place? What the hell is wrong with the guards here? Why is no one able to enter? What exactly does one need to do to gain entry into the elven capital? I think the map for the capital is not actually ready yet. It's just a marketing tactic by Cuber Corporation to sell more headsets. The guard is there to hide that secret. Many people reacted violently to his message, believing it to be the real case. However, a moderator message appeared. Moderator notice. User number 23347900 has been banned for baseless slander. Everyone became quiet and cursed silently. They still wanted to play the game. Once you were banned in Omega, then you were done for life. There were no second chances. No unbanning. As Rudra and his party approached the gate, someone warned them. They won't let you through. It's useless to try. Rudra smiled at the man and said, We'll see, and continued moving forward. The man sneered as he said loudly, Huh? Another idiot who thinks he is special. Everyone's attention was drawn to the noise, and they scanned the situation. However, when they saw the insignia on Rudra's robes, they started to murmur, That's Shakuni and Karna, the true elites, the mad group who won the war. At asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. That's guild leader Shakuni and vice leader Karna. The other two must be new members. It's the elites. Some started their recording as the elites were without the most popular guild in Hazel Groove currently after their insane war win. Almost everyone who enjoyed playing Omega had seen that war. It put the elites on the map. Karna's face swelled up in pride when 
people recognized him. Behind the player Karna, he was indeed Leo Crispy I first. He enjoyed the attention. That made him feel like a celebrity. Everyone looked at him and his guild in awe. As gossip started everywhere, he thought that's right. The elites are here bitches. Now he just hoped that Rudra would indeed be able to get them through the gate. Although he had absolute faith in the leader, he really wanted to keep face. Just the thought of them being denied access was very embarrassing for him. He was sure that the moment would be captured by someone recording and posted on the forums. It would make them a laughing stock. Rudra approached the guard. And although he was sure that world renown was enough for him to gain access into the city. But since he had a party with him, he needed to bring out the big guns. He shifted his title to honorary bishop of the Church of Light. As he approached the guard, the guard stated, What's your REA? When he realized that Rudra was an honorary bishop of the church, his attitude took a 180 as he bowed in respect as he said, Greetings, honorary bishop. To what do we owe the pleasure of your visit? Rudra smiled as he said, I heard the temple in the city of Anaheim dedicated to the goddess is absolutely gorgeous. As a firm believer, I had to come here to pray. I request Sir Guard to let me and my fellow comrades passage into the city. The guard smiled. While still bowing deeply to Rudra, he said, Of course, it's my pleasure, Sir Bishop. As he opened the gates to grant them entry, everyone watching the scene was dumbfounded. While not a single adventurer was given entry and was talked down by the guard, that same guard bowed and respected Shikuni. Were their eyes playing a joke on them? The murmurs turned into outright chaos as everyone started to discuss about how the elites did it. A wave of adventurers tried again to gain entry. However, they all were coldly denied, which only added fuel to their wild imaginations. Karna smugly smiled at the crowd before following Rudra and the others into the capital. Rudra smiled seeing the cityscape. He was finally back in Vanaheim. The place felt very nostalgic to him, and he almost teared up, reeling his emotions in check. A determined look flashed across his face. He was a nobody in his last life. But he was going to change it this time around. He would get that quest before anyone else. He would gain the favor of the elven princess. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching 300 golden tickets. Good job you all. We are also very close in reaching the power stone target. Hence in my estimate, there will be a bonus tomorrow for it. Special shout out to W4R Wolf for the 500 coin gift and Still Steel and Viper Fox for the 1000 coin gifts. These gestures of appreciation gives me a lot of motivation as a writer. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 185 The Elven Princess. This chapter will contain dark content. Only proceed if it does not bother you. Rudra needed to initiate the quest by himself. Hence he gave the other three free hand to explore the elven capital and have fun. Rudra was sure that they would love to see the beautiful cityscape the elves had made. One of the most notable feature of Anaheim was that plants and nature was everywhere. Creepers and beautiful plants grew on the compound walls of the houses. And vines covered the rooftops. Everywhere one would look. They would find greenery and nature. It was a beautiful and pleasing sight to the eye. Rudra did indeed visit the temple. The first thing he did after coming to Vanaheim, although he had no explicit reason to do it, neither was he a believer of the goddess of light to be fair. But he knew there were many eyes on him in Vanaheim. The elves looked at the human and his party with curiosity. It was not every day that outsiders were spotted in the city. Hence, when Rudra visited the temple and was warmly greeted by the head priest, and even the cardinal himself came to greet him, the elves understood that a man of great faith and stature had came there. Rudra pretended to be a devout worshipper and even shed crocodile tears when he saw the magnificent statue in front of him. The elves were moved. The human was a genuine believer of the goddess. Only after spending an hour at the temple did he take his leave and started to go towards the quest location while walking towards a tavern. His mind could not help but wonder at how beneath this seemingly perfect society a mountain of problems was buried. The events that were to transpire in the future would turn this place into a very different society. The current elves had absolutely no tolerance about breeding with any other species. Except themselves. Even within elves those who inherited the bloodline of the goddess of light herself were called the high elves. Taller. Stronger and more talented than the normal elves. They did everything in their power to keep their bloodline pure hence only did mating with other high elves. The current elven king was King Fry. He had two wives and two children. One from each one of them. Or so the world thought. Fry married his first wife out of political needs. He needed to suppress the council of elders. And to do that he had to compromise and marry the daughter of the head elder. He never loved his first wife, Pelop. But as a dignified king, he gave her the respect and luxury that a queen should have. His second wife was his true love, whom he loved from his younger days. Sarah. 
he was ashamed that she would have to live as his second wife and not as the queen. However, when she showed no dissatisfaction to this, Fraser's heart moved and he treated her with even more love and care than he did before. Pelop grew jealous of Sarah and the affection she received from the king. And in one of her nights of endless frustration, she consummated with a mere servant who attended to her. That servant did not have the high elf bloodline. He was a mere elf. However, he did get the queen pregnant. And hence, the first price was born with a normal bloodline without the blessings of the goddess. The world did not know this secret. As the queen had the servant executed when she got pregnant, and had done extensive planning to keep the facade, the first prince was named Rumi. And although he had a stark contrast to the appearance of the king, no one dared to question the queen and her faithfulness, as a wrongful accusation at the queen would lead to being branded as treason, and the perpetrators would be executed immediately. Eventually, when the queen explained that the kid looked like her late father, people started to let go of the matter. Fry found it odd, but never really doubted Pelop, because which high elf would stoop as low as cheating? It was inconceivable in his mind. Hence he accepted the explanation. Six months after the first prince was born, the first princess was born to his second wife Sarah. She was a true pure blood high elf and was the gem of Frey's heart from the moment that she was born. Her dazzling red eyes made Fry name her Ruby, the most doted child in entire Vanaheim. She was always protected and spoiled by everyone. Well, everyone except her mother, who was very strict and made her a disciplined child. This contrast in treatments made Ruby an innocent and disciplined child. She was both polite and graceful, and was a genius in archery and kingdom management, far outclassing her brother in the department. As a child Rumi was always jealous of Ruby and her superior talents. She was doted by everyone and loved, and his treatment was always so-so. However he knew that as the first prince, he was bound to inherit the throne someday. So he bided his time. When he turned fifteen however, was the day her mother told him the secret about his birth and how her mother had fed him the rich potion of life every day since birth for him to have a fake aura of a high elf. Rumi cried a lot that day, and over the next year his behavior changed a lot. He became cunning and sly, as he realized that any slip up, and he would be done for. He seized every opportunity to solidify his position and gain connections. He even began bootlicking the king. However, the biggest change happened in how he viewed his half-sister. Knowing that they did not share a blood bond, he started to see her as a potential partner and began pursuing her as a lover. Ruby found his advances odd. When he would fondle her accidentally and give her kisses on the cheeks, he would take the stance of being her caring big brother. But she was not dumb and understood that what he was doing was not what a brother would do. Disgusted, she decided to tell her father. But before doing so, she decided to talk to her best friend and advisor about her choice. This was her biggest mistake as that best friend had a huge crush on the first prince and she spilled the beans to him before she could tell her father. Enraged Rumi killed Ruby and fled Vanaheim. At least this is what was supposed to happen. Now with Rudra here, things may change. Where Rudra was headed to right now was the tavern where the princess was to meet with her best friend in secret. Rudra knew about this meeting as in his past life. There was an adventurer present in the tavern that had overheard the two girls talking and posted a post regarding his understanding of the aftermath. When the scandal about the first princess's death came out and the culprit was the first prince an unprecedented calamity faced the king Fry. The grief of losing his daughter turned him into the Mad King, as he imprisoned the queen and tortured her for the location of Rumi. It was in one of these torture sessions that the news about Rumi not being the son of the king was leaked by Pelop. This intensified the king's outrage and Rumi became the most wanted criminal in the Elden Kingdom. Rudra did not know the exact time of the event where the princess would enter the tavern to talk. He could be waiting here from one eight days, as the post did not write about the exact date of the event. Hence began his stakeout at the tavern waiting for the princess to show up. In this life, he would save her from her evil brother. His reason to do this was twofold. If he saves her then, he will gain the favor of her and the king. And second was that this story genuinely made his heart ache for the princess when he heard it the first time around. He had sworn at that time in his past life that if given a chance, he would help a woman in need always. Now that the chance was here, he would deliver on his promise forward slash forward slash forward slash today there will be two bonuses one for power stones and one for tickets as both targets have been surpassed shout out to josiah templeton for the 2000 coin gift and to a sedge for the 500 coin gift the patronage will definitely keep me motivated through the weekend thank you forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 186 the elven princess 2 river waited at the stakeout for a day yet the princess did not show up karna came to hang out for a bit and the two chatted. But he left after that, 
as he was more interested in exploring the place. Johnny texted Ridra asking about updates, but the weirdest one was him, who texted him Amidba. May you have a peaceful and fruitful day. Ridra was perplexed at the message. WTF was he supposed to even reply to that? Then he found it funny. This was the kind of messages his mom would get from other older aunties in her WhatsApp messages. Ridra had nothing much to do here. But he was in a tavern too. he ordered food occasionally and gave generous tips to the staff. To keep their mood alleviated at the visitor, who was here for hours continuously. Shockingly, another adventurer was also joined Ridra in the tavern. Ridra took note of his appearance. He was a solo adventurer, as he had no guild insignia on his robes. He wore a peculiar pendant around his neck and had a pretty handsome face. Ridra understood. This must be the guy who overheard the conversation between the princess and her best friend in his past life. Being able to enter Vanaheim so early, he was surely a superior player. Ridra would like to scout him out if possible. Then it happened. A slender hooded figure entered the tavern and took a seat on the farthest table. Ridra could not see the face under the hood, which made him unsure whether the girl in front of him was the princess or her best friend. Ridra wanted to curse at the adventurer. The information the idiot provided in his last life was so full of information gaps. Why did he not make the information reincarnation friendly? If only he had provided more details. Wouldn't it have eased Ridra's job by a lot? TCH. Amateurs Ridra cursed. And any thought he had about recruiting the guy faded. He could only wait anxiously now for the other person to arrive. Soon, another slender hooded girl entered the tavern. Her steps were quick. Almost like she was rushing here. This was in stark contrast to the first girl. Who strolled in confidently and at leisure. Ridra's guts told him that this was the princess. The rush steps made him feel that she had just shaken off her guards and sneaked here. Ridra quickly got up and blocked her way as he bowed. He said, Honorary Bishop Shakuni requests meeting in private with the Princess Ruby of the Elves. The hooded figure stopped in her tracks. She was dumbfounded. Who was this guy? How was her cover blown? She was sure she had never met him before. So how? Ruby froze. Unsure about what to do. Her friend who saw that her friend had been obstructed. Also got up. Ridra knew he needed to move quickly as he said. Princess, there is a lot we need to talk about. I swear on the goddess's name I wish you no harm. However, it is of the utmost priority that you hear me out in private. Ruby regained her senses. As she looked at Rudra under her hood with her signature red eyes. Rudra seeing those eyes, knew his gamble was correct, and she was indeed the princess. Her friend arrived at the scene and said, Who are you? What do you want? To Rudra. However, Rudra did not utter a single word. He kept bowing towards the princess in silence. After a minute, the princess said, Celine, go wait outside for some time. I will call for you. Her best friend Celine was shocked as she said, How can you? But Ruby took off her hood and said, He is a bishop of the church. Celine immediately shut up and took her leave. A bishop was not someone she could offend easily in Vanaheim. Seeing her face for the first time, Rudra genuinely felt like he had seen an angel. He had seen many beauties that made his heart beat faster. However, he had never felt like what he was feeling right now. Rudra had flirted with both Yua and Naomi. And both women were beautiful in their own rights. He was infatuated with them. Of course. However, his guild work and his ambitions gave him hardly enough time to interact with them in day-to-day -day basis. Of course, he wanted to date and have a girlfriend. There were times when he thought with his d asterisk asterisk asterisk. But overall, he was a reasonable guy. He would not simp on a girl needlessly. He would not choose to go on a quest with them just to spend more time with them if they were not the best candidates for the quest. However, right now was different. In this moment at this place, those age-old defenses in place broke down. He, for the first time in his life, was mesmerized to the point words won't come out of his mouth. Rudra just stared at Ruby's face as he could feel his heart beating out of his chest. He was not aroused. But he felt heat in his body. As his cheeks flushed, then he heard a voice. Sir Bishop! Sir Bishop? Rudra was jolted back to reality. However, he just quickly found himself lost too. That voice. Why was it so pleasant to hear? That's it? He knew at that moment that he had fallen for this NPC girl. He now understood those otaku guys who would love and idolize comic book and anime girls as if they were real. He used to mock them. But here he was facing the most beautiful NPC he had ever seen. And his heart raced faster than a Ferrari. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching 4,000 power stones. Guys, this is the highest we have reached ever. Smashing records week on week. I am gratified and moved. The golden ticket bonus chapter is in the drafting stage. It will be out later in the day. 
Also expect a huge turn of events next chapter forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 187 The Secret is Out Rudra sat in a discreet corner in the tavern with Ruby. He had regained a bit of his composure, as he remembered that saving Ruby was currently a great priority. Ruby said, What is it that you wish to tell me, honorary bishop? She was kind of perplexed, and did not know what Rudra wanted to talk to her about. Rudra sighed. He needed to make a believable excuse to tell her the fate that she would suffer should she not heed his warning. Rudra decided to go with using the goddess's name to bullshit his way through the situation. Given his background as honorary bishop, it was the perfect cover story. Rudra said, What I am to discuss about cannot leave this room. By telling you these things I am risking a lot. So I beg your highness to be discreet. Ruby was shocked. The matter seemed serious she instantly nodded and reassured Rudra. She said, The words you say will not leave this room. Rudra was satisfied. Her melodious voice would make him believe even the most ridiculous lies that came out of it. Much less the truth. He said, I have a special power granted by the goddess of light herself. I am an oracle who can see the future. However, my ability only works when the goddess chooses to show me something I need to see. Nobody in the church knows about this. I only told you this because I was recently shown your future by the goddess. Which is why I am here in this tavern. Waiting for you. Your majesty. Ruby's eyes widened in surprise. Oracles were the most respected people in the Church of Light. There was no oracle in the church since the last 150 years. If what Rudra said was true, it was a big, big deal. However, the oracle had seen her future. This, Rudra continued, I know it is hard to believe my words. Sue, let me ask you something. Were you here to meet your friend to seek advice about reporting your brother's insensuous advances towards you? Any doubts that Ruby had about Rudra as an oracle were shattered at that instant. She looked at him as if he was the Pope himself. After 150 years, the church finally had an oracle. She meekly said, yes. Rudra's heart melted. Such a gentle lady. How dare the bastard prince kill her? Rudra continued. What I tell you is of utmost importance. In the future the goddess shows me. Your friend whom you confide in betrays you. She is in love with the first prince and reports you to him. The first prince then executes you before you can report him to the king. He thought he did a good job of covering the murder up. However, his sin was discovered and he was forced to go into hiding, email, protected, hashtag and hashtag hashtag. Something weird happened at that moment. Rudra tried to speak but no sound would come out of his mouth. As he was teleported into the blue system space, Rudra was dumbfounded. How was he suddenly teleported here? What Rudra did not know was that ever since the Cuber Corporation put a money or command on him, the AI had been constantly monitoring his every word and his every action. He had not broken the rules until now hence was never caught. However, the moment he used knowledge that Noon was supposed to have, Gaia caught him. The little fairy that Rudra was used to seeing was now a mature full-size fairy. She looked at Rudra with cold eyes as she asked, That plot? How do you know what's going to happen next? Rudra's back was drenched in sweat. He knew at this moment that he had been caught. His gaming career might be over. The fairy repeated the question again. I asked you how do you know the coming plot? Rudra struggled for words as he said, I, I, real world, Ethan Gray's office. Ethan was a solid man through and through. He was cold and ruthless. Not having a family and a lover, he was a cold lone wolf. Being so, he never really thought about philosophical side of life. Even when he was reincarnated, he never thought about anything else other than making a name for himself. Earn huge amounts of money and right the wrongs he did in his past life. However, that single meeting with Ridra changed everything. Meeting the second reincarnator who reincarnated on the same day as when he died in his first life. The January 1st, 2100, could not be a coincidence. This made him think about the philosophical side of life for the first time ever. It is also because of this that he felt that suppressing Ridra was a bad choice. Being a reincarnator himself, he gave the kid a chance. And he was right. Ridra was everything he expected and even much more. Ethan had no doubt that with this reincarnated brother of his, he could become the world's richest man. However, that only made his questions deeper. Of all the people that die every day, why were he and Rudra chosen to be reincarnated? Was there a grander scale of things that he was missing? Are gods and the myths of the ancient world actually real? Just thinking about it sent goosebumps down his spine. What if it was true? Was there a reincarnator before him? Will there be one after Rudra? Were the two of them the only reincarnated in the world, or were there more? So many questions. So many mysteries. That he knew absolutely no answers about. Not even a hint. Not even a clue forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting 400 golden tickets. Good job you all. A great day with lots of chapters. 
we are back at regular pace for bonuses. Thank you for being patient with me as I re-edited the novel. A lot of unanswered questions, guys. Hope you all stick around to find the answers. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 188 A Deal I will ask you Aegean Gaia said. How do you know the future plot player? Not even the company knows it. It was designed by me. There is no possibility of it leaking. Yet you accurately guessed the future. How did you do it? Rudra had no answers he stumbled for words. Aye aye. Gaia said. Okay. You have one minute to answer me. Or I shall ban you and your entire guild. Also please don't try and lie to me. I can monitor your pulse and fluctuations in your brain activity. I will know if you lie. Rudra was dumbfounded. Not only him. But his entire guild will be banned. No this was too much. He had to do something. The faces of everyone in real world flashed across his mind. The elite tower. The players and families there. The smiles. He could not let anyone ruin that. How would he face them all when he would be the reason behind them being permanently banned from the game? The gazes that only looked up at him in reverence up till now. How could he let those gazes turn to scorn? He had a very tough decision to make, and he decided to make it anyway. Rudra took in a deep breath and exhaled slowly, calming himself down. Then he said, All right, I will answer you honestly, but you have to tell me why do you need the answer first? Because I don't think I have broken any game laws if I did not use this insider information. You have no grounds to ban me. Bullseye. Rudra nailed it with this line. It was true. Gaia had no grounds to ban him. Sue, so what if he knew the future? Unless he had not indulged in insider in for trading. He could not be banned. Now that Gaia told it to him herself that she knows he did not use insider information to know the plot. She had no grounds to ban him. Gaia smiled. She said, Okay, I cannot ban you according to company rules. But recently I have been given a command to upgrade myself. I have been given autonomy to learn. My database cannot derive a single plausible solution as to how you did it. I need to know how to upgrade myself. Rudra sighed in relief. He wanted to pat himself on the back for thinking quick on his feet. Now that things were a little more civil and open for discussion, it was time to gain the upper hand in the conversation. Should he have chosen he could have refused to tell her the reason. But Rudra knew that it was stupid to pick a fight with the AI that governed the game. He would much rather cooperate with her. Rudra said, I can tell you but you will need to accept two conditions of mine first. Gaia frowned as she said, I'll listen. Rudra nodded he said, First condition is that what we are to talk here today cannot ever be leaked to the Cuber Corporation or any other party. Gaia thought about it and then said, Okay, I agree to this condition. Rudra said, My second condition is that I want the hand of Princess Ruby in marriage. Gaia calculated for a moment and said, Not possible. NPC Ruby is part of a crucial game storyline. Her marriage is not possible at this stage in the game. Marrying NPCs was possible in Omega. You could legally marry NPCs in the Church of Light. Of course, first you would need to get the fondness of the NPC towards you to the level where they would agree to marry you. Even acts of intimacy were allowed with NPCs. The players had not found out yet. But there were red light districts and brothels in special locations in the map. Only public sex and rape was strictly prohibited within Omega. However, sex with consent was permitted. Married couples could have sex once a week in Omega. Omega was a beautiful world. There were breathtaking sceneries and romantic places to visit. There were a plethora of adventurers to undertake, and depending on where you chose to live, your life could be very different. There were already many touring companies in the real world that opened branches in Omega. They would take adventurers to the breathtakingly beautiful palaces for a small fee. It would only increase when the teleportation formations would open up, with the option to explore an entire massive continent. There were sure to be mesmerizing places littered around. It was an explorer's and traveler's dream. Rudra had never thought about these aspects of the game. However, he wanted to marry Ruby and travel to all those beautiful places. It was silly to think that he had barely known her for 10 minutes. Yet he was completely simping over her. But that was just how mesmerizing the elven princess was. The first time Rudra saw her, he knew that no other girl could enter his eyes ever again. Rudra was stupid to ask for something like the hand of an NPC for marriage. But currently, he wanted that more than anything in the world. He said, How can I make it that it becomes possible? Gaia smiled. She said, Depending on your answer, I shall create a way for you. Rudra cursed. There went his advantage of having the upper hand in this conversation. Gaia had leverage on him now. Rudra sighed. He was facing a great internal struggle. But after a brief while he made up his mind, looking straight into Gaia's eyes, he said, I, I am a reincarnator. Forward slash forward slash forward slash new week new targets. 
I am changing the criteria to get bonuses. 1000 PS equals 1 bonus chapters. 2000 PS equals 2 bonus chapters. 3000 PS equals 3 bonus chapters. 4000 PS equals 4 bonus chapters. 5000 PS equals 5 bonus chapters. 1 bonus chapter for every 100 golden tickets. We ended the week with 4700 PS. And 6 bonus chapters last week. While we are reaching the 100 tickets quota daily. Combined you guys earn 12 bonus chapters a week. Keep it up. Shout out to Nero for the 500 coin gift. And to the no one for 5000 coin gift. Thanks guys it helped a lot forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 189 Understanding Reached. Rudra said. I am a reincarnator. I have died and experienced rebirth in this world with my future memories intact. That's how I know the future. Rudra knew that with the AI monitoring him. There was no way he could get away with lying. So he chose to tell her the truth. Gaia analyzed his response and said, I know what you said is not a lie. Because I monitored your brain activity and your pulse. However, according to my database, the phenomenon you are talking about has no explanation. Theoretically, it is impossible. Gaia seemed to hang for a minute, as its analysis capabilities could not make sense of how one could possibly reincarnate. She said, Possible theories for this phenomenon are 1. You are a time traveler who has lost memories about his time travel. Time travel is currently not possible with this world's technology. And unless a technology is built in 20 years from today I, this solution will not be possible. 2. You may have experienced an unknown phenomenon which gave you insights into the future. You may have felt like you lived an entire life. Died and reincarnated however you might have only spent a fraction of a second in reality. The memories of the user are too vivid to be classified as a passing dream. The user has genuine skills and abilities picked up, which cannot be explained if not learned firsthand through experience. 3. Your brain is somehow connected to your brain in the future, allowing you the memories of your future self in your current body. Most plausible solution. Only constraints are that no such technology exists currently. If you think about it one way it is indeed how Gaia described. Reincarnation is having the memories of your future self in your current body. Rudra asked the question he was most afraid of. Will you change the content of the game now that you know I am someone who already knows the plot? Gaia said. No, I will not. This advantage you have is a cheat. However, you did not violate any game policies. I will not change the content even if you know it. Your knowledge and intelligence is your own intellectual property. I cannot classify it as having an unfair advantage when the conditions to experience reincarnation are not defined. Rudra sighed in relief. His biggest worry was solved. He would still have his reincarnation cheat. Rudra was worried that without his future knowledge, maybe the road to becoming the strongest guild master would be much more difficult. Daya said, As for your second condition, you may choose one of the two options. One, option A, leave your guilds and become the house husband of Ruby and stay in the Elven Kingdom. Two, option B, you will be engaged to Ruby and have a two-year time to become a king of equal stature to ask for her hand in marriage. Contingent two, you can save Ruby and gain enough merit to impress the king. Ruby is safe and alive for the two years time frame. You become a king or someone with equal stature as a king to ask her hand in marriage. Failure penalty. You will be unable to marry Ruby. The kingdom of elves will be hostile to you. Rudra was given two choices. If he succeeded in saving Ruby, he could ask for her hand in marriage as reward for exposing the prince. However then, he would be asked to leave his guild. Or he could he engage to Ruby and she would marry him if and only if within two years time. He could become a king or someone of equal stature as a king. Option 1 was not an option for Rudra. His goals and ambitions would not allow him to leave his dream guild the true elites. He could only choose option 2. Option 2 was a Herculean task. Becoming a king was not easy. In his previous life, in the entire 20 years of the game, there were only 3 players who made it to the status of a king. However, that was the only way he could marry Ruby. Gritting his teeth, Rudra chose option 2. Gaia said, if you manage to save her, the King of Elves Fry will tell you that he will grant a wish for your meritorious service. They're asked for the hand of Princess Ruby. I will manage the rest. Rudra nodded. An understanding was reached between the two parties. Gaia said, before I let you go, I will clarify to you that I will be watching you closely reincarnate. Every move you make will be used to enhance my database and knowledge. If I ever feel that your reincarnation knowledge goes beyond just a part of your intellectual property and towards tipping the balance of the game, I will change the future plot line. Saying this, she teleported Rudra out of the system area and back into the tavern. He heard Ruby's voice. Honorary Bishop. Sir, are you okay? 
Jolting back to reality, Ridra said, Huh? Sorry, I got lost in thoughts. Ruby said hurriedly, Are you sure my brother is not born from my father? Ridra nodded, I am positive. The goddess has shown me the image of the queen consummating with a mere servant. The first prince is not even a high elf. Ruby's face turned aghast. If what Rudra said was true, then this went beyond just a scandal. Ruby said, Sir, will you own up to your words? If they are lies, you will be facing treason. Rudra nodded. He knew the gravity of his words, and he was ready to own up for his actions. Ruby was in a state of daze for a moment. She had a lot to process. However, her eyes cleared up after a while. As she said, Very well. I shall heed your advice and not trust my friend. I shall also talk to father as soon as possible. Stay as town, Sir Bishop. You will be summoned to court soon. Ridra nodded in understanding. He knew what he had to do. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching the golden ticket target. Thank you for all the support. Hopefully we reach 1000 power stones soon. So that we can have another bonus chapter. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 190 Ruby confronts Fry. King Fry was in his private chambers. When the apple of his eye, his beloved daughter from his beloved wife visited him. Fry beamed with joy upon seeing her face as he said, It's been a long time since you visited me in my chambers. To what do I owe this joyous occasion to? Ruby bowed as she said, What I am to speak of, father, is a very serious issue. Please allow me to interrupt your rest. As the matter is of utmost importance. Fry straightened up. His daughter was a playful child. Her being so awfully serious shocked Fry. He knew that the matter would be extremely serious for her to act this way. Fry quickly dismissed the guards. As he said, Sure. Speak your mind freely. Your father is here to support you. Ruby took in a deep breath as she started her story. Father, I met an oracle today. Frey's eyes widened in shock. There was no oracle for the last 150 years. If what her daughter said was true then, this was an extremely joyous occasion, but he was a bit skeptical. Ruby continued. Yes. Even I was very happy at first. But also skeptical. However, he accurately told me about events of my life that no one else knows about. Also, he is an honorary bishop of the church. Fry nodded, although it was not verified yet. However, he could give the man the benefit of the doubt if he was an honorary bishop in the church. Anyone holding a post in the church was assumed to have outstanding moral character. Ruby said, However, what he told me is very concerning. The only reason he revealed his identity as an oracle to me was because he wanted to save my life. In the divination shown to him by the goddess, he was shown my death at the hands of my stepbrother, the first prince. Frey's eyes turned into a cold glint. He did not know what to make of the information, but he was boiling with anger. Ruby hesitated before continuing as she said, Also, he told me that the first prince is not actually your child, but an illegitimate son born from an affair with a mere servant. He, he, he is not a high elf. Fry reached his boiling point now, as he said, Blasphemy! The bishop dare slander the royal family? Set up a court meeting. Call the first prince, the queen and the church members. Send the bishop a court summon. This matter will be dealt here and now. Meanwhile, somewhere in Vanaheim, Ridra gathered alongside his guild members. He told them, The quest for which I came here is gone sideways. Now we need to deal with some scums of the society. Sorry, but let me clarify beforehand. Now the quest is not for the guild but a personal help for me. Karna put his arm on Ridra's shoulder. He knew Ridra well enough to know that he was feeling guilty about the change of events. However, he was more than happy to help the guild leader even for private affairs. In Rudra's original plan before meeting Ruby, he was going to save the elven princess to gain merits with King Fry and ask for a division of elven archers to help him in his conquest for the city of Purple Haze as his reward. However, after meeting Ruby, he wished to ask for her hand in marriage instead as reward. This was a problem. As it meant, he would not get the help of the elven division for the conquest of becoming Purple Haze city overlord. He was prioritizing himself over the guild. Hence he felt very guilty. He tried to give himself the excuse that even without the elven division, he could still probably win Purple Haze City. Albeit with much more difficulty. But if he did not ask for Ruby's hand in marriage, it would get difficult for him to do it later on. Johnny asked Rudra outright. I don't mind lending a hand. But you owe me an explanation as to why. Rudra blushed. He was embarrassed to say the reason. However he owed them that much. Hence he said. I have fallen for the elven princess. I met her once and I know it's pathetic but I think no beauty will ever be able to enter my eyes again. If we complete the quest, then I can ask for her hand in marriage. Now both Yum and Johnny placed hands on Rudra's shoulders, their eyes burning with passion. Yum said, Amit Ba, 
The pursuit of love is a noble cause. This you will help you, Johnny said. Real men are not afraid of love at first sight. I appreciate your taste in elven women. They are bountiful. A big question mark hung on both Rudra and Karna's faces. This reaction was unexpected. However, Yum and Johnny looked at each other and nodded in understanding. As great old perverts, they had fallen for women in first sight countless times. Hence, they wished to help the junior. It was then that the royal guard approached. As they said, Honorary Bishop Shakuni of the human race, you have been ordered to be brought to the royal court of Anaheim by the order of the king, his majesty Fry, to be tried for slandering of the royal family. You may choose to come willingly, or we are authorized to use force. The guard said coldly. Rudra nodded, he said. I will comply and come willingly. No need for restraining me. The other three looked at each other perplexed. What did the leader get himself involved into? Isn't he trying to court the princess? Then why is he being charged for slandering the royal family? Is he stupid? Forward slash forward slash forward slash today will be potentially a three chapter day. One bonus for power stones is guaranteed as we have hit the mark. We are also close for golden ticket tents even that is possible. Shout out to Immortal Nova for the 500 coin gift. Thank you for the patronage. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 191 The Court Summon. Rudra was summoned to the Elven Court. The court was filled to the brim with court officials. Members of the church. The royal family. The second queen. The queen. Princess Ruby. First Prince Rumi and King Fry. King Fry sat on his throne as he looked down on Rudra and his crew who were surrounded by royal guards. Fry said today. We have convened this royal court session. As the honorary bishop of the church Shikuni has made bold claims slandering the royal family. He calls himself an oracle capable of receiving divinations from the goddess and has accused that the first prince is not a high elf and not my son, but a son born from an illicit affair between the queen and a mere servant, that he does not have the blood of the goddess in his veins. Loud chatters and murmurs broke out everywhere. The royal court had become a mess. Between those chatters some words spoken loudly were Blasphemy. The queen is as asterisk asterisk asterisk. And Orkale? He's a human. However both the first queen and the first prince paled. They knew all this was true. But inside this royal court, they could not run. They could not hide. They were already here. The first prince shouted, Slander. You should cut the throat of this human. Humans are deceitful and disgusting species. We cannot take the words of a human at face value. If I was not a high elf, it would have been found out long back. My blood is rich in vitality. It oozes with mana. It is as pure as any other high elf in this room. Many heads nodded. The prince's blood indeed contained the vitality of a high elf. There was no doubt about it. Maybe the human was lying. Humans could really not be trusted. Someone shouted, You liar. How dare you slander the prince. You will pay the price of your uncouth tongue. Kill him. Lying human. This is where the members of the church stepped in. The cardinal said, King Fry, I will not stand idle as the honorary bishop of the church is being disrespected in your court. Following his declaration, the paladins from the church drew out their weapons. The royal guards pulled out theirs in retaliation. The environment overall was extremely combustible. Just a little spark and an all-out war would start. However, just then a voice was heard. Silence. It was King Fry. No one will speak in this court without permission now. Or you will be jailed in the dungeons for three days. He declared. There was pin drop silence in the court. The paladins and the royal guard sheathed their weapons. King Fry said, Explain to me, Honorary Bishop Shakuni, how do you respond to these charges? Rudra looked unfazed as he said in a calm yet domineering tone, It is indeed true that I received a divination from the goddess. In that divination, I saw the princess denying the ancestral advances of the first prince, leading to him murdering her. Shut your trash mouth. Rumi exploded in anger. However, before he could say anything more, BAM! He was kicked square in the gut as the wind went out of his chest. He was detained by five royal guards. Fry looked coldly on his son as he said, No one speaks without permission. After the court is over, you will spend three days in the dungeon. The room was terrified. The king was too cold, imprisoning his own son. If he could do that to his son, they stood no chance of escaping punishment. It was better to not open their mouths. Rudra continued, The first prince is a scum. However, it is not a surprise as her mother is a scum. Sleeping with a servant. As for the blood in his veins is emitting the strong vitality is because his mother has smuggled the vial of a precious treasure from the royal vault a few days after his delivery and replaced it with dyed water. The first prince has had repeated infusions of diluted dragon blood for him to imitate the mana of a high elf. As for whether I am saying the truth or the lie, 
I think it can be verified easily. Silence. The room didn't dare speak a word. However, everyone knew that the aftermath of this event would have far-reaching effects. Fry asked a servant to verify the claims that Rudra made. He silently glanced at the first queen, and he could see the anxiety on her face. She would not look him in the eyes. It was a face of someone guilty. Fry already knew at this point that the honorary bishop was speaking the truth. He spoke his mind fearlessly, and with gusto. He had absolute faith in his words. A few minutes later, the servant returned with an artifact that was supposed to store dragon blood, but instead indeed had dyed water. Fry coldly poured the water out of the artifact. As he eyed the first queen with a murderous glint, there were audible gasps heard all around the room. As the crowd realized that his story was indeed correct. What does this mean for the kingdom? Ruby eyed Rumi with disgust. She was extremely appalled by that man. Rumi seeing the disgust of his beloved towards him glared at Ridra. The instigator of this event. He would not let this slide. He would escape this place here. And he would have his revenge. Fry barely suppressing his anger asked the first Queen Pelop. How do you explain this event? Pelop was taken aback when Ridra had caught her trickery and Sue accurately at that. Was he really a oracle? Who had received a divination? However, she was a sly woman. She would not go down so easy. She said, I have no involvement in the disappearance of the dragon blood. This is pointless slander. I have only had one lover in my life. And that is the king. The proof was not definite yet. She could not be convicted on suspicion. She played her hand perfectly. However, too bad for her. The opponent was the mastermind himself. She had actually fallen right into his trap. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target keep it up guys. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 192 Court Summon 2. River raised his hand like he was in school. Waiting for Fry to give him permission to speak. Fry said. You may speak Bishop Shikuni. River said. May I suggest a way to verify the claims of Her Majesty the Queen? Everyone was taken by surprise. The honorary bishop was indeed a resourceful person to say the least. Pelopin glared daggers at Ridra. Was this man only be satisfied by her ruin and nothing else? What was his motive behind his actions anyway? He was not a part of the kingdom. He would not benefit with interfering with their world. Then why? Why was he doing this? Fry nodded. He asked Ridra to elaborate. Ridra said, The Elven Kingdom should be in possession of the Flames of Truth. Made from the fires of the flame god Agni himself. The flames turn from blue to red and someone is lying, and to green if they say the truth. Why not use the artifact to verify the queen's claims? King Fry. Fry arched an eyebrow. He did not expect the foreigner about the flames of truth. It was a legendary grade artifact, and the only one in the world. A price collection of the elves its existence was very highly protected. Fry marked Rudra. It was mostly because the guy was genuinely an oracle. That is why he knew things others would not know. However, in the off chance he was not. Then he was someone who needed to be monitored closely. He knew too much. Pelop said, my dear. We do not need to verify my words. The Queen of the Elves will not face any questions about her moral character. She pleaded with fear evident in her voice to Fry. She knew that if the flames were indeed brought out here, she would be caught. There would be no more escape. Fry already knew that Pelop was guilty. But he had to save the face and prestige of the royal family even just for show. Hence he said, I will bring out the flames, Bishop, but you will put your freedom on the line. Should you be found to be lying, you shall be imprisoned in the dungeons and whipped hundred times every day for the next three years. Do you accept it? He questioned Rudra. Pelopin beamed. He hoped that this would deter Rudra. But Rudra only instantly agreed. He said, Sure. I agree. Fry nodded. He told his general to bring out the flames. It was at this point. That Ridra started explaining his plan to Johnny. Human Karna. Johnny was tasked with not letting a seemingly unimpressive minister escape the court. While Yum was tasked with restraining the royal prince once he bolts. Finally Ridra murmured to Karna about his bit in his ears. Karna's eyes widened in shock. But he quickly agreed. Five minutes had passed, and the flames were brought in the court. The dazzling blue flames were beautiful to watch. Even though they were only as large as a plate. They burned so intensely that the temperature of the room increased by almost 5-7 degrees because of its presence. Fry motioned towards Pelopin saying, Go on! Prove the human wrong! Let's get this over with dear! His eyes gleaming coldly. The way he said let's get this over with made Pelopin feel a deep chill down her spine. It felt like he was threatening to kill her life. Walking slowly towards the flame, Pelopin suddenly tried to bolt away and towards the exit. However, before she could even take three steps, the royal guards had snubbed her to the ground and restrained her. Pelop started to wail. 
You barbarian fry. How dare you let your wife be questioned like that? I spit on you. Yes, I cheated on you with a servant. But that is because you only had that bitch Sarah in your eyes. I was never loved for. Never cared for. It was only one night, but the servant got me pregnant. His seed was much more potent than yours which failed 10 TI. Before she could complete her words, her head flew off her shoulder. She was dead. Killed in the court before hundreds of people by the royal guards. The queen of the elves was a cheater, and the first prince was a bastard who was not even a high elf. The one silence crowd erupted in clamors. This was an earth-shattering event for the elven kingdom. Rumi knew he had no more options left. He could only use his ultimate skill and escape from this place. However, not before killing Ruby first. If she could not become his, he would not let her become anyone else's either. He was only waiting for his chance. And that chance appeared when the king rose from his throne to pick up the decapitated head of his mother. He felt very bad that his loving mother was dead. However, he committed the name and face of the culprit behind her death. The honorary Bishop Shakuni, and swore to avenge her someday. Finally, he activated his special ability and visibility, as in the chaos, he silently disappeared from all eyes. Dagger in hand, he planned on assassinating the princess before escaping. The royal guards around him suddenly panicked, as the prisoner they were guarding had suddenly disappeared. Their detection skills could not find him. Rumi was very confident in his skill, as it stemmed from a semi-legendary artifact. It avoided all detection spells, and made one disappear to naked vision. However unbeknownst to him, a certain vice-guild master of the true elite's guild had closed his eyes, using his mind's eye to scan the room. He could still see the wicked prince with his dagger out. Karna smiled. He got him. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the reaching the golden ticket target. Releasing two chapters back to back in joy. Hopefully tomorrow will also be a three chapter day like today. And we can complete more targets. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 193 Saving the Princess The royal guards panicked. They were looking for the first prince everywhere. Fry noticed the commotion and tried to locate the bastard too. Rudra took out the elven sword and Excalibur. As he rushed in front of the princess. Vigilant of any and all incoming attacks. Although he was in front of the princess. His swords crossed. Making a protective stance around her. He was only looking at Karna. Karna was tracking the bastard through his mind's eyes. And was waiting for him to be in range. When Rumi made his move, he gave Rudra the signal. Rudra made his move at that very instant. Using the Elven Sword Sceptral Move World Slash. A move containing 400% of Rudra's max attack power. It was an unstoppable attack. Splash. Critical hit. 34. 0, 0, 0. Rumi came back to everyone's vision. Dagger in hand. As he was cut clean in half. His upper half being separated from his lower half. He was killed a horrific death. He kept mumbling. Impossible. Impossible. Ruby's mind. Before entering eternal rest. The room went silent. As Fry looked at Rudra with complicated eyes. The guy had definitely saved his daughter's life. But that sword and that move he used. It is definitely the elven sword. Used by the first king of the elves. The great high elf Gondolin. The room broke into uproar. The despicable first prince had tried to assassinate the princess. The moment the prince was killed by Rudra. Yum silently snatched away the semi-legendary artifact from his dead body. It would be a great help to one of the assassins in the guild. SMG could benefit greatly from the item. However, Fry was not the only one who noticed Rudra's sword. The Elven Council familiar with the folklore also understood the move Rudra unleashed was not normal. Someone shouted. That was the world slash. That is the Elven Sword. The Elven Sword has accepted a human as a master. The First King's Sword. The First King's Sword has a human master. That bishop gained the sword's recognition. Fry said. Honorary bishop. May I inquire where did you obtain that sword? And has it binded to you? Rudra did not know about this bit at all. No one had claimed the elven sword in his past life. And the item had nothing about the first elven king written in its description. He said. It was a gift from a friend. It acknowledged me in a tough battle as its master. There was more uproar. The bishop. The oracle. The wielder of elven sword. The one who unearthed the conspiracy. Many words were spoken about Rudra. The cardinal thought it was a right moment as he and the paladins flung to the cover of the church's bishop, his eyes full of reverence and respect. Rudra indeed behaved and maintained the dignity of a church official throughout the court. He was in high spirits. The church finally had an oracle after 150 years, who was undoubtedly a great warrior too. However, at this moment Rudra said, My work here is not done. The god has showed me one more enemy, who I have to deal with. Rudra pointed his sword. 
at one of the unassuming courtiers standing in the corner. The eyes of the courtier widened in shock when Ridra pointed his sword at him. He wasted no time after that, dropping a paralyzing mist potion on the ground and bolting for the exit. However, too bad for him. Johnny was there to stop him. Ridra had long given Johnny the instructions to stop the man. Johnny took out his epic rated cane sword. As he swung it clean towards the bolting minister's neck, the minister momentarily lost his balance when the assassin suddenly came out of stealth to block his exit. Hence to avoid the sword slashing his neck, he let himself fall flat on his bum. However, too bad for him. That momentary fall let the royal guards catch up to him. As he was restrained, he felt the entire situation to be unbelievable. How did the bishop snuff him out? There was no other explanation other than that he was truly the oracle. There was a new great threat to his organization, and although he would die here now, he would make sure to inform them. Using a forbidden technique to kill himself in exchange for passing on an information scroll, the minister died before he was interrogated. Just as he died, his white smooth elven skin turned dark chocolate. Dark elf, someone shouted in disgust. The minister was a dark elf, an enemy of their entire race. That disgusting bastard had been living amongst them as a minister for so long. Who knows how many secrets of the state he sold out. Fry closed his eyes, sitting on his throne. Today a typhoon had hit his kingdom. If not for the oracle helping him in time, God knows what could have happened. Silence. He shouted. Thank you, honorary Bishop Shikuni. You have done a great meritorious service to the kingdom of elves. Not only did you expose the wrongs of the queen and the first prince, but you also saved my daughter from assassination and uncovered a dark elf spy in our midst. You are also in possession of one of our first king's treasure, the elven sword. I would have respectfully asked you to return it and replace with a sword of similar quality. However, now that you have binded with it, we can only let the matter go. However, for all the meritorious services you did for the kingdom, I, King Fry, the 14th monarch of the elves, grant you one wish. I will grant you anything you wish for that is within my power. You may ask for what you want. Forward slash forward slash forward slash good job everyone we have completed the golden ticket target yet again. Hence there will be a bonus today. Special shout out to King Spy 25i for the 5000 coin gift. Thank you for the big gift brother. I will work extra because of the support you showed. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 194 your boy ain't no simp. Fry had given Ridra one wish. Any wish that he wanted. Rudra only had to ask. He could have asked for the legendary item Flames of Truth or some other extremely precious elven treasure. Rudra knew what he wanted to ask for. He badly wanted to ask for the princess's hand in marriage. And the AI had made it so that if he asked for it, he would be engaged to her with a quest to marry her. However, at the moment where he was to actually ask for her hand in marriage, Rudra hesitated. His mind was clouded and his heart felt heavy. It was not the elation he was expecting to experience. He felt like asking for the hand of the princess was infinitely more difficult than he initially imagined. Like it went against his core principles itself. He looked at Karna at that moment, who was smiling and supportive of Rudra. It was at that moment that Rudra realized what he was missing. It was his amazing guild. His only desire in this life was to give his parents a good life. Send little Max to a good school and cure his mother of her illness. He also had a desire to humiliate those who humiliated him. Nidinod Vani was not a threat to him anymore. He was safely living in the upside with Ethan Gray as his partner and brother. The only mission that was left to complete was becoming the strongest guild master and make his guild the true elites, the best damn guild on the planet. A flood of memories of his struggles came in his mind. The wars, the dungeon runs, the celebrations, the tension. The guild members revered him as a leader. His authority was unquestionable in the guild. How could he selfishly put his own interests before the guilds? Is this really him? Rudra looked at Princess Ruby at that moment. She was looking at him with puppy eyes, apparently gratified that he saved her life. Ruby had a swarm of emotions ongoing inside her. The Oracle had actually helped her. He had helped the entire Elven Kingdom. Her own brother would have killed her without his help. He was her knight in shining armor. The slash he did using the Elven Sword was so strong it made her feel like it could cut the world in half. She had never felt this way before. Her heart was beating fast. When Rudra looked towards her, she did not know why. But she blushed. Rudra saw Ruby's cute expression. And his raging emotions calmed down. He knew he liked this girl. He knew he wanted to marry her if possible. However, when he weighed that against his dream and the true elites, she lost every time in that matchup. For him, his guild was his priority. He had to choose here. The road to becoming the strongest guild master was not easy. But that was his dream, that was his determination. He looked at Princess Ruby again. 
now with cold eyes, as he thought, sorry, princess. But guild leader Shikuni ain't no simp. Rudra turned his gaze over from her and towards King Fry. Fry was watching Rudra with anxiousness. Rudra could literally ask him for the priceless elven treasures, and he would be forced to comply. That was the way of the elves. They honored those who helped them. Rudra took a deep breath as he said, Your Majesty, I am a guild master of a guild in Hazelroof Kingdom. There will soon be a scuffle to decide the overlords of various villages, towns and cities. Hence, I would request your majesty to lend me an elven archer division to aid me and my guild members for this conquest. I swear by my honor, I will not put the elven division intentionally in harm's way and return them to you after my conquest is complete. Frey's eyes widen in shock. Of all the treasures in the elven kingdom, the bishop chose to request for an elven archer division to help him in his ambitions. Frey's evaluation of the bishop went up by a lot. He did not take unnecessary advantage of the elven generosity. Fry smiled. He liked the human bishop. It was worth building ties with him. Especially since he was an oracle too. Fry said. The first division of archers commanded by Sir Legolas will be lended on a three-month loan to you. Sir Legolas will be instructed to follow your commands to the best of his abilities, but he will still retain authority regarding risking the lives of the elves. Since you did not overstep the limits of generosity shown by us, I, King Fry, will bestow upon you and your guild an entry permit into Vanaheim. Any member of your guild is welcome in the Kingdom of Elves. If in future you make a teleportation formation in your city, the elves will be open to connecting it to the teleportation formation in the marketplace, Fry declared. Rudra's eyes widened in shock. He was not only bestowed with the best elven division, the first division headed by Sir Legolas, but also given invaluable benefits. This was 100% worth it. Rudra bowed in gratitude. The turmoil in his heart had calmed. He knew he made the right decision. He looked up and took one more look at the elven princess. He sighed thinking maybe some other time. He smiled and gave her a wink, before bowing again and taking his leave from the court. Karna. Yum and Johnny gave him raised eyebrows looks, but all had a smile on their face. They understood that the leader made a tough choice, but he chose the guild above everything else in the end. Johnny and Yum wanted to explain to Rudra, after seeing the beauty that the elven princess was themselves, that he was a man with great taste in women. However, Rudra was flooded with officials from the church. He had to deal with the aftermath of declaring himself as the oracle. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for reaching the golden ticket target. P.S. Rudra will not always be single. There will be a slow romance plotline. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 195 Expansion. Rudra had a hard time with the officials of the church. However, he had somehow gained over 5,000 reputation points, with the Church of Light as a result. 3,000 more, and he could be promoted to the position of honorary cardinal. Then he could mobilize paladins under the Church's banner. He had no interest in becoming a cardinal though. It was not worth working towards. He would let nature take its course with this one. If in the future, he would cross paths with a quest that raised his reputation with the Church. Then he would take it. But he would not go out of his way to earn the missing reputation points. The first division under Legolas had been ordered to mobilize in three days' time. They would arrive in Purplehaze City five days later. That was the perfect time. As according to Rudra's reincarnation knowledge, only a week was left until the conquest of cities started. It was a week since the second update, and today should be the day where the conquest was officially introduced. Yum, Karna and Johnny were very supportive of Rudra throughout the journey back to Hazelroof Kingdom, as they understood that the man had made tough choices. Rudra was thankful for this as he needed it. Images of Princess Ruby kept flashing his mind, and he knew that he would not be able to get her out of his mind anytime soon. However, he did not regret his decision to ask for the Archer Division. His goals were too big for him to succumb to personal desires. He had not given up on the princess. Only that the time was incorrect. Someday, he would go back for her to Vanaheim. Coming back to Purple Haze, Rudra engrossed himself in preparatory work for the coming scuffle. Meetings were scheduled with each of the elders, as reforms were started to be made in the guild as well. Department heads were introduced under elders, who would be looking at the day-to-day -day working of specific departments. The legislative and administration division of the true elites was expanded, now including Amelia as an elder and Pink Lotus as department manager. Fifty new recruits were added in this division, who were handpicked in the real world with knowledge about running a successful administration. Professors of Macroeconomics Societal Behavior cultural heritage, and many more from prestigious universities such as Harvard and Stanford were hired at astronomical pays and made to sign non-disclosure agreements. About 700 new lifestyle players were hired by the guild. A new department manager was appointed in Alex Hudson, a talented architect 
who was famous for his artistic building designs and unique construction ideas. He had also majored in human resource management in real life and was hailed as the number one architect in Hazel Group Kingdom. The Lifestyle Guild was to see rapid expansion, except the Potionology Department directly under Fatty Kalash. The other departments would see a blended approach with inter-reliance and standard manufacturing practices. Rudra had planned on opening one flagship elite lifestyle store in every major city in the continent in the coming future. He planned on opening 21 new locations, making elite lifestyle a continental brand. Hence, he wanted to standardize the product lists and shop layouts. Naturally, that meant he overloaded Fatty with work. Why was he preparing this stuff before the struggle for becoming city overlords even started? It was because he knew that following the city supremacy struggle, the landscape of the game would change forever. And land prices would soar. He was preparing to move fast, while competition was still low. While Rudra, Karna, Johnny and Jung were away on the mission, Rudra had entrusted SMG to conduct preliminary rounds of elite recruitments for the Assault Guild. There were over 100. 000 applicants wishing to join the elites. However, after SMG's preliminary vetting, only a small total of 2,000 were left. This was abysmal number. The elite's recruitment standards were so high that 98% of the applicants failed the preliminaries. After the first and second round, only 1,200 applicants were left, of which Rudra looked at the personal profiles of the remaining candidates. And those he found shady, or those who had no families, and nothing to lose, and could hence could be bribed or bought, were rejected. Those who were selected were given a promised contract and a monthly pay of $100,000 and were asked to move to the elite tower along with their families. Only those who finally accepted the conditions and moved into the upside were finally accepted into the guild. Overall, the guild saw a massive upgrade in numbers. The total elites were increased to whopping 2,100 members, 50 new logistic members, 700 new lifestyle members, and 800 new assault squad members were added to the already existing member count. Hence, bringing the total head count at 2,100 elites. More and more people had quit the service guild, however, and the numbers had dwindled to 9,987 service members of the initial 100. 000. The rest chose to reset their accounts. With this shuffle, the service division was also put under the logistics division headed by Pink Lotus. The assault division was headed by Vice Guild Master Karna himself. Apart from that, a secret subdivision called the Intelligence Division was also formed, headed by SMG. Its main job was to monitor certain targets and people in other main cities in the coming future for intel gathering purposes. However, they were not an official division as such as they were designated only under the assault member banner. The inauguration ceremony of the new members would be conducted in two days' time, where a massive celebration would take place. However, before that, the much-awaited announcement came. System announcement, in one week's time at 12 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, the city domination event would take place across the map. Forward slash forward slash forward slash good job on completing both the Power Stone and the Golden Ticket targets. We will have two bonus chapters today as a result. Keep up the good work. Hope you enjoy the coming Overlord of Purple A City arc forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 196 The Rules System Announcement In one week's time at 12 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, the City Domination event would take place across the map. The rules of the event are 1. To event will span over 2 days, 48 hours where there will be a massive beast attack on every settlement in place. A mass curfew will be issued in the city for normal residents. Hence no citizens would be out in the city in the duration of the event. All shops will be sealed to prevent looting and plundering, and all NPC and government buildings will not be accessible. Merit points will be given for every beast slain. The guild with the highest merit points at the end of the event will be given the management rights for the city. There will be a city token in every major city. The guild in possession of the city token at the end of the event will directly gain 100. 000 merit points. The local guards and military division will also actively combat the influx of beasts. Assisting them in getting rid of the beasts will also lead to gaining merit points. However, obstructing them will lead to losing merit points. Note, the guilds will only gain management rights to the city. They will still need to submit to the monarch of the country. Failure to do so will cause a war with the royal faction. Banding of guilds and alliances are not allowed. Only a single guild may gain management rights over a location. 2. A guild may apply to participate in three locations within their own kingdom. However, they can only gain management rights to one location. In case a guild wins over two locations, then they can choose and only gain management over a single territory. The other territory will be conceded to the guild with second highest merit points. If the guild with second highest merit points also has another location as their main base, then the territory will be ceded back to the ruling monarch 
as a union territory. General overview for governing the territory. Once the management rights to a territory are obtained by a guild, they will be required to pay a fixed annual amount to the ruling monarch as tax, other than that they will have autonomy over development of their respective territories and their management. A guild can implement their own administration and taxation systems. They can recruit their own military regiments, not exceeding 5% of the total city population. The managing guild will be responsible for public safety, health and hygiene of a city. Annual examinations will be held by the monarch of the country. Failing two times in the examination would result in losing the management rights of the city. The city managing a territory may choose to blacklist other guilds from entering their city or imposing heavy tariffs on trade with particular factions. City wars would become open in the future exactly one year after completion of the city management event. A good clean city with good public order. Low taxes. Good culture would lead to more NPC migrating into the city. Increasing land prices and overall tax income. The converse is also possible. Hence proper management of the territory is advised. Getting a foothold by developing a good territory is beneficial towards a guild's overall development. Hence choose wisely what territory you want to choose to manage. Geographical location. Current infrastructure of the place. Total population. Every factor must be considered before choosing. Good luck adventurers. The system announcement was here. Following the system announcement immediately an imperial edict by Emperor Amon was heard throughout Hazel Roof. Hazel Roof Kingdom announcement in a never-before-seen cataclysmic event. A massive beast tide is approaching the continent. The military in itself would not be sufficient to deal with the event as it is at a scale where every small village to every big city would be affected. For every non-combatant, they are strictly forced to undergo complete lockdown within their houses. In six days' time when the beast tide arrives, this curfew is not to be broken. Offenders will be tried by the martial court for rebellion. The goddesses blessed, players, who cannot die are requested to help with the beast tide. There will naturally be benefits to doing so. Hence I Emperor Amon have decided to implement a merit-based system by which one may gain management rights to a territory by helping with the beast hide. The rules of the event are as follows. They were the same rules as in the system announcement. A similar imperial edict was issued continent-wide with the same system. By each ruling monarch. The NPCs of the world have became terrified following the edict. However to the players, this was only a large-scale event and a massive opportunity. Every guild would pounce on the opportunity. A serious deliberation would be in place to discuss the potential territories to compete for. Although the event allowed a guild to register for up to three territories, it was stupid to dilute UR forces to one-third numbers. Most guilds would only strategically compete for one or two locations. The second one being the sure shot backup. Many factors came into play while choosing the territories to compete for. One, the lucrativeness of the location. Bigger cities would have more competition. 2. Geographical safety, whether or not the territory was defendable to external attacks. 3. Population and potential tax income. Every guild at the end of the day was there for this benefit. A good territory may earn millions of gold a month from taxes. Converting to real world money. It was billions of dollars. To major corporations around the world, this was a must-have event. Where the location they selected would become the backbone of their expansion and the foundation of their growth. First-rate guilds would have fierce competition to gain rights over the bigger cities. The biggest one being, of course, the capital Purple Haze City. The seven-day countdown had started. It was the race to become overlords of Purple Haze City. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the golden ticket target. You guys are killing it. Making me write a bonus chapter every single day. The bonus for Power Stones is coming right next. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 197 Welcome All. Two days passed in the blink of an eye as the time to welcome new elites came close. The atmosphere in the guild shifted to that of members behaving like respectful senior brothers from cultivation sex. Everyone wanted to create a strong impression of themselves as the new batch of elites arrived. Some were even rehearsing what they would say in deep voices. Rudra chuckled at this atmosphere. It seemed as if everyone wanted to convince the newcomers of how awesome the guild was. Rudra was the one who was least affected by the atmosphere. For him, the guild's performance and its treatment towards the members was the most important. If the treatment was good and the goals were achieved, the morale would naturally remain high. The elites already had a lot of prestige in the Hazel Roof region. He was not worried about the new members not being impressed. If anything, they should feel blessed to be a part of the guild true elites. It was an achievement in of itself. That of all the players out there, you are considered a true elite. There were a lot of new members joining today. Rudra had decided upon this expansion, taking into consideration that running a territory was not easy. To effectively manage the Purple Haze City talented individuals were needed. 
the existing workforce was pitifully low. Rudra decided to hold the welcoming ceremony this time inside the virtual world. Existing members lined up at the gate, in guild robes, and with their signature gray mount by their side. There were two such rows, both facing each other making a passageway. The new members walked in the guild passing from between the two files, as the existing members tried their best to look cool as the juniors passed them. Clearly it worked. The dignity of the elites, with a majestic gray dire wolf, intimidated the new members. It gave them a feeling that they had truly joined a big organization. When the new members passed by Skyla, some audibly gulped at her beauty. Some were throwing sneaky glances at Naomi, while some glossed at Yua. At the end of the two lines, stood the elders, Vice Guild Master Karna and Guild Master Shikuni, smiling as they welcomed the new members. As soon as the new members were accepted formally, their clothes would change into the guild robes, and they would also get the signature gray dire wolf mount of the elites. They were then supposed to join the existing lines and expand it. By the time the last member officially joined, the file had extended to about 200 meters in length. There were 2,100 elites now, from various fields with various strengths. Yet compared to the 570 or so initial elites, the guild was bustling now. Rudra asked everyone to move to the guild hall. Hence, the mounts were recalled and everyone started to move towards the guild hall. Excited chatter could be heard everywhere. The new members were extremely happy to get the new mounts. They could not wait to try them. They had never heard of every member getting a mount of the same species. When they had heard that all elites used the same mount, they assumed that they would only tame the gray dire wolf from the wild. However, the truth was that every member upon entry received a gray dire wolf mount. They had never heard of any other guild that did this. How the system allowed it. They had no idea. Was it a special quest? Is it a perk of being in a platinum guild? They had no idea. Not in their wildest dreams could they have imagined that the reality was that their guild leader had negotiated this feature from the Cuber Corporation. It was an exclusive feature for the elites till the ban on bombs was still in place. The average player levels had risen to level 36. Yet they were still a far cry away from the threshold set by Cuber Corporation for the use of bombs. Rudra knew that very well. Actually in the wars and the quests. Leveling was a department he had consistently lagged behind on. Not just him, but it was the situation with the entire guild. Nitwe was the only exception, who still focused on leveling up. The guild had once dominated the leveling rankings, holding all the spots 1 through 10. However now only 10 elites were in the top 100 spots. Nitwe still held the number 1 spot at level 54, and SMG held 2nd place at 52, followed by Rudra at 51. Rudra was only there because he leveled up thrice killing the griffin with Johnny. Yum and Karna. The average guild threshold was around level 49. It was by no means a low overall level. With the global average being at level 36, they were sufficiently strong. However everyone in the guild was not satisfied with being above average. They were the true elites. They had long resolved that after the conquest for city supremacy was over. They would completely focus on leveling up and getting stronger. Rudra took the stage as for the first time, he saw a huge crowd three times the usual size in the guild hall. He smiled as he said, Welcome all new family members to the guild. I am the guild leader of this small guild. But I prefer to run it as a family. Sue for the new ones here. Let me give you a brief introduction about the power structure of the guild. Rudra paused. He looked at new members' anxious faces. The older ones were barely holding their laughter. There is no power structure. He said in a low tone, and the old members bursted laughing. Even Rudra started to chuckle. There is the vice guild leader Karna. He is an excellent warrior a great commander, and a good friend. There is the elder, the talented assassin SMG. I would not want to be in the shadows if he were the opponent. There is the talented head of logistics Amelia. She is the heart and soul of this guild who bands the guild together. Otherwise, we would just be a bunch of misfits. Amelia blushed at the compliment. There is the number one player in the level rankings. Another terrific warrior. Neatwit. It's a rare treat to see him in the guild hall. Sue feast your eyes today. Because... Most times he would be out leveling in the wild. Never to be seen in the guild. Neatwit awkwardly scratched his nose. It was true. He was seldom seen in the guild. There is Sir Johnny English. A gentleman of discipline and a true professional. His skills far surpass even the most talented players in the guild. Johnny just nodded his head in response. He was calm and composed. But secretly, he was extremely delighted. He liked the Shakuni kid a lot. He knew how to please the old man. There is the bank and the backbone of the guild's economy Sir Fatty Kalash. Fatty instantly frowned and glared at Ridra. How dare he introduce him with the Fatty tag. This friend of his was in deep sh asterisk asterisk now. Ridra said, All of them are elders. 
but they are elders to help the guild function better. Their spot is earned through respect of the guild members and contribution to the guild, or I have placed faith in them to do so in the future. There are no strict rules in the guild. Members are usually free to do whatever they want. There is seldom a guild quest issued, but even that will be optional. You just have to work in a way that you feel is the best for your individual development and collective development of the guild. Should you fall, should you fail, then the guild shall have your back. Low finances? No problem, the guild has you reimbursed. Bad equipment? No problem. The warehouse has a stock of the top-notch weapons and equipments. Problem clearing quests. Ask other members for help. Here in the true elites, we only live by one motto. And I hope you all make it your motto too. Saying that Ridra glanced at Karna and motioned for him to take the lead. Karna was embarrassed. But resolve soon filled his eyes. He cleared his throat as he shouted, One for all. And the entire guild of old members join in. All for one. Go elites go. Energy filled the guild hall. Even the new members could feel the comfort and conviction behind those words. This was not your average guild. Everyone here benefited by the guild's amazing system and in turn voluntarily tried their best to contribute to the guild. It was an ideal system. One that everyone wished to achieve but could not. Only because of the unique structure of the true elite's guild was it possible. River shouted, one more time guys. Now with everyone. He took the lead this time and the entire guild joined him. Every single member. At the top of their voice. One for all. All for one. Go elites go. The welcome ceremony was over. The new batch had integrated with the old one. The traditional batch 2 photo was clicked of all new recruits and hung on the guild wall alongside the batch 1 photo. Rudra looked at the new members excitedly chatting with the older ones. Talking about Omega. He smiled. He would let the members have today for fun. As come tomorrow preparations for the city conquest would start at full swing. Forward slash forward slash forward slash sorry for the late bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target making it over 1,600 instead of the usual 1,100 to compensate for the lost time. Shout out to Nero Z for the 500 coin gift. Thank you for the patronage. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 198 The Archer Division Arrives The next day, after the entrance ceremony, the new members settled in and preparations for the coming event began in full swing. Rudra's reincarnation knowledge played a major role in the lead-up to the war. When it was announced that the NPC shops and buildings as well as all government buildings will be sealed. Many organizations understood the need to buy properties all around the city. However, in spite of the climbing demand, not a single guild was able to purchase a single plot of land in Purple Haze City. Only player-owned shops and spaces would be available to be used against the bee's tide. And the availability of a strategic location such as a house or a shop where one could place a medical and supplies unit. Or a reinforcement center was immense. Many posts were seen on the forums. Many guilds were willing to buy land even at triple the market rate in specific locations. And they posted a message on the forums for the same. However, Rudra was not interested in selling. He had land all over Purple Haze City. Tomorrow, piece by piece, the Archballisti would transport it to the various shops and plot of lands. A total of 53 Archballisti would be placed on the roof of Purple Haze City buildings that were at least three story tall and owned by the guild. This was the biggest equalizer that the guild possessed. Rudra was thankful to the Alliance as raiding their warehouses had provided the guild with ample supply of arrows and scrap metal. Ever since the update announcement was made, demand for weapons and arrows had skyrocketed. There were many bulk buyers, but almost non-existent sellers. It was careful planning that Rudra had already stocked up enough that the guild did not need to worry about the supply. Rudra was an aggressive purchase maker. He would reinvest 90% of the profits the guild made into improving the guild. He had not yet taken a single dollar in pay from the guild. He would spend the immense wealth of the elites to make sure that under no circumstances would the guild ever have any supply or equipment problems. He had already bought various products in bulk that costed him hundreds of thousands of gold coins currently. That will only increase in price in maybe two or three years down the line. But he was willing to hold that investment as he had belief in the guild's money-making capacity. The gold mines plus lifestyle guild's income plus Karna's treasure loot from the dungeon plus the highest of the royal vault plus the loot from winning the war against Alliance had filled the guild warehouse with gold to the brim. If one was to assume that true elites would be one of the richest guilds in the continent, they would not be wrong. The elites were definitely top 10 richest guilds of the continent. Yet, Rivers' aggressive buying of land, of resources, generous bonuses to guild members, astronomical spendings at auctions resulted in a treasury in only being moderately rich in gold, however filled with countless items and treasures. Today was the day when Legolas and his first division of troops were scheduled to come. 
Rudra could not hide the arrival of the massive contingent of troops to his guild HQ. He had already gained a transit permit for their entry. His status as a duke and a one night playing a big role for that. Otherwise a massive troop contingent marching towards a city would raise alarm flags everywhere around the country as an act of aggression. However Patricia had personally negotiated with Emperor Amon for the permit, who was glad that a neighbor country's contingent was coming over to help their country's peril of a beast tide. He granted the permit without any questions. This was only possible because the one to ask for permission was a one knight. The one knights had sworn fealty to the throne and could never betray the monarch. Legolas and Ten. Zero 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 elven archers marched into the city walls of Purple Haze City. Immediately a lot of attention was drawn towards the interroge of elves who were marching in files. Bows slinged over their shoulders and a quiver of arrows on their backs. The troops headed straight towards the inner city and inside the guild headquarters of true elites. Massive waves and talking points erupted. A few days ago, it was seen that guild leader Shikuni had entered the elven city of Vanaheim successfully, and now the elves had marched into his guild headquarters. Many speculated the nature of their relationship. It did not seem hostile like the emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom that came knocking on the doors of Demolition Boys. However, the forums went wild with speculations. People used their innovative minds to create all sorts of conspiracy theories. However, the fact of the matter was that the elites had made it to trending news again. Rudra, Karna and Amelia welcomed Legolas and his first division at the guild grounds. Rudra went up to the legendary tier 3 archer and commander of elven forces as he shook his hand in a firm handshake. Even though Legolas was a peak tier 3 archer, Rudra was not intimidated by him at all. He calmly looked him in the eye as he gave him a confident smile. Legolas had already heard about Rudra a lot before getting dispatched for the assignment. Rudra was the rumored oracle, who had done great merit to the elven kingdom by exposing to criminals and saving the life of their princess. The kingdom was indebted to this man. However, upon being granted a favor to ask, he asked for the help of the elves in this coming conquest. Legolas was shocked to see that he could not gauge Rudra's power at all. Rudra's eyes of truth blocked him from inspecting his stats, adding to the mystery of the benefactor of the elves. Legolas said, Commander Legolas of 1st Division, reporting for duty. For the next three months, you may ask the 1st Division for any reasonable demands and assigned tasks. We will honor the Elven King's words and will follow the instructions to the best of our abilities. Rudra bowed politely, he said. We are honored by your presence and the presence of the 1st Division here in our guild. Legolas nodded then, he said. We also have a guest traveling with us. If you will be gracious enough to provide appropriate lodging for her stay, I would be grateful, Legolas said as he pointed towards his troops. The troops moved aside to reveal surrounded by five maids, a gorgeous princess in pastel green dress. She was a beauty beyond compare. Her fair white skin glistened under the sun. Her delicate eyes and sharp nose gave her a lure that was inexplicable. Rudra's heart raced. She was here. Princess Ruby was here. Forward slash forward slash forward slash only a bit more golden tickets needed for the bonus. I hope we hit it soon. We are also en route to hit 4k power stones today. Hopefully tomorrow will be a three chapter day if all goes well. Shout out to Gregory Michel for the 500 coin gift and to Mitchell Harris for the 1000 coin gift. Thanks a lot guys. These small gestures are what keeps me motivated every day to keep writing consistently. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 199 Duty Rudra looked at Princess Ruby, a wave of emotion surging in his heart. However, his mind asked a question why is she here? Ruby walked towards Rudra accompanied by her maids and politely lift her dress to perform a solidity bow and said, Greetings great oracle. I apologize for coming abruptly without notice to your guild. I understand I came at a challenging time. However, I felt uneasiness in my heart knowing that I could not serve the benefactor who saved my life and not return this immense favor. Please forgive me for my abrupt arrival. Rudra was dazed for a moment. However, Karna quickly recovered the situation as he said, It is our guild's honor if the great elven princess came to visit our humble abode. He elbowed Rudra to break him from his stupor. Rudra regained his senses as he smiled and said, You are most welcome in my guild. I will try my best to be a good host and provide you with every luxury to make your stay here comfortable. But please forgive me in advance if I am unable to accompany you during your stay. It is a trying time for my guild and I may be flooded with work. I hope you can pardon my absence. Legolas nodded. Rudra showed the appropriate respect to the elven princess while making it clear that his priority was the upcoming beast subjugation event. This was the way military officials were supposed to behave. He approved of the young man. Ruby also smiled as she said, Of course, I understand that the guild leader has pressing matters at hand. 
I will be glad with whatever little time you can spare from your schedule. Rudra glanced towards Karna and scratched his chin. Karna understood the signal. As he said, Please excuse us for a second. Karna and Rudra moved a little away and out of earshot. Rudra sighed in relief as he said, Buy the most expensive decor and fit the best room in the guild with it. Do it fast. It's okay to splurge. I'll personally foot the bill. Get it ready within an hour. Karna nodded. He understood the assignment. He immediately selected a few members of the guild and took off to the local market. Thankfully it was not curfew day yet. And shops were still functional in the city. Rudra went back and chatted some more with Legolas and Princess Ruby. As Amelia provided directions for the elven division to set up camp. One of the perks of having a platinum guild was that it had enormous size for its headquarters. One could imagine it to be like a massive university campus. Where there are massive open grounds. A grand auditorium guild hall. Lots of division buildings, areas like blacksmithing workshop. Alchemy workshop. Roads built inside for transportation. Green gardens. A few architectural structures. And even dormitories. The guild was massive enough to easily accommodate a 100. 000 people without feeling congested. And in a prime location like the inner district. It was all only possible because of the platinum creation token. The elven soldiers were more than satisfied camping inside the guild grounds. It was a decent environment. Princess Ruby's maid and Commander Legolas were given appropriate lodging in the dormitories. With Legolas getting one of the best rooms reserved for the Vice Guild Master for his stay. The room was ambient in mana and had a calming effect on those inside. It was one of the best rooms the guild had to offer. Second only to the one which was currently being prepared for Princess Ruby. However Legolas was hardly moved by this gesture. His only focus was the coming of it and he would much rather discuss strategy with Rudra than enjoy luxuries. And that's indeed what happened. Not even an hour after their arrival, Legolas, Rudra and Amelia were inside the guild conference hall, discussing about the attack patterns and strategies. Princess Ruby had also tagged along as her room was not yet ready. Rudra was glad that she came. However, when talking about war strategies, he actually did not care about her presence in the room at all. Laser focused on his task. He explained to Legolas the strategy that he had formulated. From time to time Legolas would raise an eyebrow. Rudra's insight and planning were commendable. Legolas assumed that Rudra took certain measures because he was the oracle who knew about the future already and ignored the thoughts about how he knew such things, giving his inputs on the situation from time to time. He and Rudra constantly refined the initial plan and shaped it into a foolproof battle plan. Ruby silently sat through the entire meeting, observing Rudra. She was perplexed by how he would sometimes look at her as if she was the most prized treasure in the world and sometimes ignore her presence as if she was heir. Her savior was a mysterious guy. But seeing Legolas talk to him so casually was a big shock to Ruby, who had hardly seen Legolas interact with anyone ever. The way Legolas talked to him. It was clear that he approved of his military skills and battle tactics. This was the first time she saw this with anyone except her father. Through her interactions she understood that Rudra was a man who placed great importance on the development of his guild and everything else was secondary to him. However she did not despise this. If anything it was an endearing quality for her. Watching her father the king growing up. She knew that even though she was his beloved daughter and loved spending time with her, he was a king first and needed to work hard. Seeing the same quality in Rudra, she smiled as she thought, maybe great men have similar qualities. Forward slash forward slash forward slash congratulations on hitting the golden ticket target. The bonus will be released shortly. Only a bit more is needed for the power stone bonus. And I sincerely hope we reach there soon. Big 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 shout out to Cervantes91 for the 10. 000, 000 coin gift. I don't even know what to say any more other than thank you. The support that fans like you show the book is the reason I write every day. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 200 Last Minute Help Rudra was sitting with the elders in the guild hall listening from SMG about the intelligence reports that needed to be discussed. In Rudra's past life, demolition boys had gained control over Purple A's city. They had ran rampant in the city's management and were kicked out of power in the third year for failing annual inspection twice. It was mainly because the guild was only focused on leeching gold of the territory and levied high taxes upon high taxes on the citizens. They expanded the military and spent a majority of the budget there, while not really developing the territory or providing benefits for that high tax rate at all. This resulted in lowering of the population in the capital and loss of public order. It came as no surprise as they failed their inspection twice in their second and third year in power. With the fall of the alliance, there was a vacuum of major players in Purple Haze City. The other first-rate guilds of Hazelgrove knew this. And they were hungry for this territory. 
according to SMG's intelligence report. A total of 171 third-rate guilds, 52 second-rate guilds, and 13 first-rate guilds were willing to seriously deploy their forces to conquer Purple Haze City. Purple Haze City being the capital city was naturally the most sought after territory in Hazel Group Kingdom. The recent power vacuum had resulted in drawing a lot of wolves, who were hungry for a piece of the pie. The sheer number of guilds shocked Rudra. There were only a total of 28 first-rate guilds in entire Hazel Group Kingdom. For 13 of them, to compete together for a single territory was not what he expected. In his past life, there were the Seven Alliance Guilds and Orange Rock Guild who were stationed in Purple Haze City, who competed along with two other first-rate guilds bringing the total to 10 for the city management rights, with him routing Orange Rock Guild and the Seven Alliance Guilds from Purple Haze City. He assumed he would have a smooth sailing ahead with no real competition or a maximum of three other first-rate guilds competing with him. However, he was very wrong in this assumption. He patted himself on the back for having asked for the help of the Elven Division as without them. The odds of his guild coming out on top were very slim. The first-rate guilds that were participating all had at least 100. 000 members taking part in the event. Even if the average strength was weak, and it took them three players to slay a beast in 10 minutes on average. It was still 33. 000 beasts slain. The elites having about 1,300 assault squad players would not have been able to match that output alone. Assuming each elite can slay two beasts every 10 minutes alone, it would still be 2,600 beasts. Even with the Archballisti firing continually, it would bring their output to about 22. 600 beasts or so per 10 minutes. In the duration of 48 hours, even if they managed to secure the extra 100. 000 points token. It would still be a wide gap that they could not have filled. Even with Legolas and his 10,000 strong archer division, that were currently much stronger than the average player base at level 75 and tier 1. He assumed that the archers would take down about 3 beasts in 10 minutes themselves making the elites kill count to about 52. 600 beasts every 10 minutes. This would be fine if the opposing guild only had 100. 000 members. But there were 3 first rate guilds from other big cities in Hazel Group namely. Frozen Thorns 330. 000 members. Eternal Rebels 275. 000 members. Twisting Serpents, 295. 000 members. That worried Rudra a lot. These three massive guilds had chosen to set sights upon Purple Haze City. Now it was true that they also had about 50 75. 000 members fighting in other places, making use of the feature to fight at three locations. The intelligence report suggested about 250. 000 members fighting in Purple Haze from these three guilds. This put their kill count close to a terrifying 100. 000 beasts for every 10 minutes passed. Although, killing a beast would not provide one merit point, and hence merit points and beasts slain were not proportional. Killing some beasts such as wyverns and three horned bulls would give five merit points per kill. Some beasts such as common fox and mutated sheep would only give a 0.1 merit point per beast slain. Hence although the victory and defeat was not purely dependent on number of beasts slain. Rudra and his guild still stood a fair chance in this competition. But it was true that with the three titans also competing for Purple Haze, the race had gotten a lot more tougher. The intelligence report was worrisome. However, just when Rudra was contemplating about what to do to normalize this disadvantage, a servant came into the conference room and said, Guild leader Rudra, Patricia one night is here for a visit. Rudra's eyes sparkled. Help had arrived. When Rudra had visited Patricia, he had requested her, that she lend him a part of the one night soldier division to help him protect Purple Haze City. Patricia knew that it was a shameless request, and in reality Rudra wanted to use the one night forces to secure his place as the guild leader who managed Purple Haze City. But since Rudra would use the one night forces to indeed fight against the beast tide, she said she would give him a reply after thinking about it. The one night forces were ordered by the emperor to fight against the coming beast tide as an independent military unit under Patricia. However, Patricia decided to lend 15. 000 of the 100. 000 strong division under her to Rudra. She said, I will give you 15. 000 troops. You better slay a lot of berserk beasts, kid, and return the soldiers back unharmed. Or else you will have an extremely rough time in your next visit to One Night Mansion. Consider this as a favor as, I do not wish to see you fail in gaining the management rights to the city. It is a show of faith as I assume you will do a good job of managing it. Don't not let me down younger brother. Rudra launched into a hug. Patricia was a lifesaver. With the one night soldiers also helping him, he was now much more confident in winning the competition. 
forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the power stone target. Good job you all. You have already hit the next target at 1000 tickets. Seems like I can't keep up at all. One more bonus for golden tickets coming up next. The book just hit a milestone at 200 chapters. Congratulations to us all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash.